I have to answer a question here about the OE tracker. Okay, and I think we are live. So, hey, everybody, welcome to the, <laughs> what is this, the third C Wire 2020 live stream. Um, Adam Farkas uh, here with you today, along with a, a bevy of folks that you know and love. So, uh, on the line with me today, we have Paul Farkas, Gretchen Bailey, and Steve huh? Silberberg. Hey, guys, how's it all going? Good morning. Hey. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everyone. Oh, my gosh. So um, welcome back, everyone. I can't believe we're doing this a third time. We're going to be doing this a fourth time, actually, in June. Um, so it's uh, it's been kind of a, a, a fun and rather long uh, couple weeks here. So I'm hearing myself, so somebody's not muted. <laughs> Absolutely. Somebody's got their audio oh, on. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess it is Paul. Paul. <laughs> Shut off What's your computer. Um, Turn off your computer audio, I'm, Paul. I'm, I want to go go on mute. <laughs> no, 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 your computer audio. Don't yeah. mute yourself. <laughs> the lower right hand corner. There's a little, um, usually a little um, microphone that just slided to the left. I just muted caller one, so I'm guessing that was Paul who uh, who has the problem. So <laughs> turn off your, all of your computer audio, Paul. <laughs> Adam, you've got the dog again. I see it. I got it. Just a minute. Let me go. Uh, okay. Oh, man, this is the music audio. Okay. Are you Better off? Now? Okay. Perfect. Yes. And the dog is here. This is actually Bailey. <laughs> <laughs> Bailey the dog. Bailey the dog. Actually, he he's taken to calling it the manager now. So this dog regulates Reed's behavior throughout the day. So. <laughs> Wait. You know what would be really creepy? is if we rigged some sort of speaker inside of it and I could talk to him and be like, Reed, Reed, it's time to do your homework or it's past your bedtime, Reed. Honestly, you'd probably do a better job than I'm doing. So yes, I agree. Let's rig it up. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, we actually have people listening and watching us. Right yeah, now. there are people listening and watching. Yeah. It's it's true. Yeah. And so Richard it, Amos here, Greg uh, Luce. Yeah, so we got Maurice Wilson. Hi, Richard. Hi, Greg. Richard Holm. So we got everybody. So the, the, if you're actually watching this and you see it on your screen, if you scroll down, you'll see there's a chat window. So feel free to start typing, as yeah. I will. Um, and so you can you know, give us feedback throughout the day. So before we get started here, let me, uh, let me get the announcements out of the way. So um, I will pull up on the screen. Whoop, there we go. So I wanted to just say thank you to everybody for attending this morning. Um, and by the way, if you're watching this, that means you're not sitting in a class. So uh, if you registered for the conference, please you know, get into the classes. You just go to cwire2020.com, click login, and it'll get you to the lobby. And that's where you really want to be right now. The lobby is where you go in to take classes, and I'll put it up on the screen so people can see. Um, once you log in, this is what you're going to see, and you won't have to hear us yapping. Um, you want to go into the session lobby and it'll show you all the classes that are starting uh, in a few minutes. So definitely head on in if you want to uh, get to the classes. Um, I think it's also important to, to realize that there's a downloadable schedule um, and I'll, I'll show everyone where that is right now. If you go to cewire2020.com and you go to courses, you can click on a printable course schedule and this is what I've been using here uh, to show you what what's happening when and you can see that it's up on the screen right now so so go to cwire2020.com click on courses um, and you will uh, see that as well so anyway so for anybody who wants to get to classes that's what we're going to be doing um, but back to my little slideshow um, i just wanted to say thanks to everyone for attending for the third time <laughs> uh, we couldn't do it without you and we we've hit a milestone i think um, or we're getting close to it. So as far as I can tell, and Gretchen, you know, you know everything. So you know, you can tell me if I'm being legit or not. You can fact check me as you usually love to do. Um, right, right. So I think at this point, with everyone that's registered, the conference is now the largest one in optometry um, because there are about 5,000 ODs so far that have signed up for it. Um, the the numbers that I saw for Expo West was 3,200 last year. So I think um, you are if you're not there already, you are darn close. Yeah, it's um, it's actually incredible that 
the number of people you are having to come and take these classes. I mean, obviously, we have the deck stacked with uh, what's going on with the pandemic. But even before that, at the beginning of 2020, when we were doing this the first time around, when I was there live, you still had a bunch of people. And I think that's that's sending a message to the profession of what optometrists want, how they want their CE. I, I don't think that they're saying they don't want to go to meetings. I think they're saying that they want choice. Absolutely. And you're right, Gretchen. From 2015, we have been constantly increasing the um, amount of people. So really, it's been going back uh, six, seven years now. And every year we get more and more. And this is uh, the special circumstances this year. But um, it certainly is the biggest by far. Yeah. And I think, I think, Gretchen, you're right. I think choice is important because, as you know, Gretchen, we love going to in-person conferences. Um, it's, it's fun, right? Because you actually get to interact with people face to face. And it's a, it's a different kind of I experience. I thought you were being sarcastic there. You actually love going? Oh, come on. I, you know, OK, so I love going to certain ones. Let me put it to you that way. There are certain conferences <laughs> I wouldn't miss. I love going to Vision Expo West. I think it's so much fun every year to go to Las Vegas and see everyone. Um, you know, it's, it's one of my favorites and I, I, competition or not, I think they're great. I love going and I'm actually kind of sad this year I'm probably not going to go. Um, and many right. people are, are like me, you're just a little bit scared this year, a little bit gun shy uh, to go. Um, and it, I think it's sad, but I think you're right. You know, choice is really an important thing. And especially like when you go to a conference like Expo, the question is, do people really want to be cooped up in classes all day? And I think the answer is no. Right. I think the interactivity there is, is the even more important part. Classes are great and it's kind of fun to, to go to a few. But I think just the, the interaction is even more important experience. So I, I almost wonder in the future if it's not going to be a blend of conferences like this where you can, you know, watch your CE in, in sort of a concentrated form without distraction and also going to things like Expo West where you can interact with people and go to the equipment petting zoo, as you call it, um, <laughs> without being burdened by worrying about, oh, my gosh, am I missing any classes? So anyway, uh, I, think, I think that's going to be a blend going forward. Um, I agree. Yeah, I think, um, and I think there's also precedent now that um, COPE has relaxed, Arbo slash COPE has relaxed the rules a little bit. And I guess a way to look at this would be, let's take a look in the next 18 to 24 months. Are people filing cases more than they did before? Are doctors, I mean, what, what's, what's the fallout? Is there fallout from doctors getting online CE? And if they're isn't any fallout then why are we keeping it the way it is so i'm i'm hoping that there will be a little bit of a change and i actually do like going to meetings i don't like the nonsense of travel let's put it that way um but i'm i this sounds so trite and lame but i am a people person i i build relationships and i do so much better when i'm talking with people in person and that's why I have the job that I do. I like to talk to people. And so I won't ever not go to meetings, but people want a choice. And I, I, I do think that something needs to change. And I, I hope that we will see something coming in the future, but it's, it's going to take a big effort. And then we've got state by state. It isn't just a national decision. I mean, each state has to decide, do, does it want to accept more online CE. And so that means all of you guys out there listening need to communicate to your state folks and tell them what you want. Because if there's no grassroots movement, if people aren't saying this is what we want to do, then there really is no reason for the status quo to change. Right. So the power is well, in your hand. You know, and then California really listened this year. Right. They really made an effort and they had testimony and Steve was a star there. Steve can talk about your experience in California. So, uh, I'll do it really, listen, really, really, the state board, surprisingly enough, it's not a, a knock against California. They really didn't even know what Arbo and Copa were ruling about live CE. And, and when we educated them, they um, they loved it. They they even loved the fact that there was interaction live with the speaker. They were under the impression that the speaker would come back at the end and do just Q and A, and it would be a uh, uh, a poor pro a program. When they saw that what we were doing and what everybody else was doing, uh, they um, agreed that this is a viable option. Um, there's two things you have to consider, though: the the monies that the AOA and the local societies and state societies make in CE, and they might have to forego that. Uh, people are going to still go to take um, uh, lectures to kick the tires on equipment and things like that. So there is a, a 
a, a reason to go to live events. As you said, mine is to uh, drink wine with Craig Steinberg mainly, but that's, that's, uh, that's my interest. <laughs> and that's a good reason to go, let's be real. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, here's an emergency. Uh, some, someone just wrote in, uh, one of you can answer, how do multiple doctors log in uh, under the same login? Our practice paid for five docs to attend. We are not able to log in, as it says, you can only log in with your account on one computer at a time. This is a great so, question. Ed, you want to this explain? A, yes, this is a great question. You can see I did explain below. When you see a thing in the chat that says ODYR, that's me. Um, so let me let me explain to you how this works. So I, I can maybe even pull up a window to show people. Um, when you registered for the conference, you should have um, gotten a link when you registered that showed you um, how to register each individual doctor. And you have to do it individually because um, if you don't, then it can't. It doesn't know where to actually transmit your credits to, right? It doesn't know who took what and which doctor actually sat through it. So you should have signed up each one individually. If it does, didn't work, you just click on Help Center. And then you can see Need Technical Help right here, and you can contact people. Also, if you go to, so you see see that? So this is this pop-up window right here will start a chat with someone in support. And I also mentioned right there, if really nothing uh, if nothing happens, and again, I'm seeing in chat here, if nothing happens and you can't actually get to support, send an email to support at cewire2020.com. And I'll type in the email address again for everyone to see here in the chat. So yeah, so the issue that's happening here to this particular person is that when they registered, the person who registered them should have gotten a confirmation email that showed them the place where they can enter in all, all five or whatever users. And for whatever reason, they didn't get it. And so that's why they didn't know. And they came today and they're like, oh gosh, I want to log in all five people and I can't. Um, so we'll take care of it though. And again, if you just go to the help center and click on this chat, you can start chatting with one of the support people who's there, whether it's Kat or somebody else, and they can help you. So again, help center. I'll do it again to show everyone one more time. Help Center. Need technical help? Pops up a chat window. And go from there. And make sure when you're talking to the support folks, put in the email address that you used when you registered so they'll be able to quickly bring your account up. Um, and that's how you do it. So, hey, Adam, it's 11 o'clock, so we might want to remind everybody to go jump in the room. So in room one, We've got Richard Hom with claims, denials, and rejections. In room two, we've got Rich Madonna with the impact of landmark clinical trials on glaucoma patient care. In room three, with the great Irish accent, John Nolan, talking about targeted nutritional supplementation for 2020 and beyond. And then in room four, Maurice Wilson talking about ultra wide field retinal imaging and optometry. So go forth and be educated. Yep. Yeah, so that's all starting. Richard just said he had trouble getting into his classroom. I'm hope, hopefully he, he got in now. Uh, and Richard, you know yeah, the drill. I'm, if you have problems... I'm in all the classrooms, yeah. and I don't see him in his classroom now, but I'll, um, I'm sure he'll get in very shortly. Yeah, so um, he's, he's just getting in. So, um, And Greg just mentioned we have 151 people now in room two. That's pretty good. Mm-hmm. Uh, my suspicion is for this conference, by the way, the last time we did this in April, the crowds were absolutely massive. Uh, and I think you know that was sort of at the beginning of the... The, uh, the, the pandemic where people were trying to figure out how can I get these, these credits in and we were able to go live. So I have a feeling that's going to be a much bigger crush. Today's going to be a little bit calmer, I hope. And then I have a feeling the next big crush is going to be when we do this again in June, when people are realizing, whoa, this is the end. <laughs> this right. is my last chance to get live credits. TikTok. Yep. So hopefully it'll be a little calmer today. In room four, there's 210 people now, so it's there's about a thousand people in the in the four rooms combined. So yeah. people showed up early. Yep, yeah, they did. Um, so that's that's good to see, and everyone's getting in okay. I know that last time too, some people had a little bit of technical trouble um, as the day wore on, just because the the sheer crush of people that were coming in was just so great. Uh, what we know though is that the back end now has been fortified. <laughs> 
<laughs> with more machines. In fact, probably more than we need based on the, the number of people who are here right now. But you know, you have to scale the systems to you know the maximum number of people that you have. Um, Adam, are you are you trying to say that CE Wire broke the internet? <laughs> we broke our little corner of the internet. That's for sure. <laughs> Um, so sorry about that, but yeah, now everything's working and hopefully people will go in and get their credits. There are a number of people who contacted me who are trying to get as many live credits as they can. So they're doing all the hours today, all the hours tomorrow, and then coming back in June and doing all the hours on those two days as well. So, you know, I commend their stam stamina <laughs> to be able to sit through all of it. But to remind them also that they can take it uh, on demand between this weekend and the, the next one in June, but they will have to take a quiz. Correct. So in the on-demand so period, can... yeah, so it goes back to the good old COPE rules of an on-demand, you have to take a quiz, 10-question quiz after every hour. So, uh, But let's just get back to the little slides here just to show everyone. So reminder again, you saw the course schedule. You can download it at cwire2020.com. Um, you can't be in two places at once. So again, if you want live credit, pick a course and stick with it. Uh, then when that's over, you can move to any other room. Um, so to and, and for sure, stay on, stay on for the full fifty minutes. Don't, yeah, don't, don't leave. wander away. And in fact, this is another important point. So because we had to change the rules of the system, there's no real quiz at the end right now. But the software is expecting something, right? So even if you don't have a ten-question quiz, what you need to do is watch the entire lecture. Enter your Arbo tracker number, your OE tracker number at the end. There's a link, and Steve actually will go into each of the rooms and remind people uh, where to put it. Yeah. Um, I'm doing it now, Adam, just to interrupt. And the, uh, the tab says attendance check. When you click on it now, it has quiz with no ability to enter the number. But as the lecture ends, you can then enter your OE tracker number. But I'm entering each room and explaining it at the beginning and at the end. Yep, and so in fact, I had a little live video or a video that I shot uh, last time that, that Kat apparently put up again, reminding people about how to do it. Um, you just have to enter your tracker number and then a little a little radio button that just says, yeah, that was me. I was here. It wasn't an imposter. Um, and that's all you need to do to, to get the live C. And then it gets counted in the system. And then because you have your OE tracker number there, we can send it on to Arbo. So that's how that works. Next year, by the way, it'll be a little bit simpler. Obviously, we don't know what the rules are going to be next year when we do see wire in 2021. Uh, I, I don't know if we're going to be getting live credits again. If there's no live, if it's just what they call online interactive credits, we'll go back to the old system of a quiz after each uh, lecture. But again, we don't really know what's going to be. And frankly, we don't even know what's going to be into the fall. Arbo says that at, on June 30th, this whole live CE exception thing with no tests is going to come to an end. Uh, and they say they're serious about it, and this is really it. But I almost wonder... You know, as the summer goes on and we get into fall, and I'm going to guess that Expo West is going to be canceled. I mean, I have no insider knowledge, but Las Vegas, I mean, really? Well, the Boston <laughs> Marathon has now been canceled Yeah. for September. Yeah. So we're, up in, we're into September already with cancellations. So Adam, you make a good much point. Longer. Adam, you make a good point that um, hopefully within the next month we'll know for sure about Expo West and potentially Academy. And if those two big meetings are not available for doctors to take their CE, um, Arbo and Cope may need to change their, to push this back a bit. And also too, um, I'm wondering about smaller state meetings, that if states have fall or early winter meetings, if they would be canceled. So that would mean that there's nothing available. So I would think that they would have to relax the rules for maybe till the end of 2020, just because there's nothing available. Right. I'm, I'm thinking the same thing, Gretchen. And also a lot of states, their um, credits are per calendar year. So they have to go to December 31st and either one or two things, either say you don't need as many credits or like you say, make the uh, online portion be live. Right, right. And that's the other thing. I mean, going back to a state by state thing that some states are a 12 month, some states are 24 month, and a lot of states are, they end their calendar year ends 1231, but not all of them. So because there isn't a standard um, accreditation window for every state, it's all over the map that Arbo needs to make sure that it has stuff accredited and available for everybody, regardless of when your window ends. And not everybody is able to front load. 
I mean, maybe what this is teaching us that if you need have a certification, if you have something like this that you need to get within a certain time frame, shoot, do whatever you can to to get it at the front of your um, of your window because we don't know what's going to happen toward the end. Yep. Yeah. Right. And and the and the rule of thumb is always always check with your state board because whatever we say has it may not be valid according to the rules of your particular state. And and they vary tremendously from state to state. Yep. Okay. Well, the lectures seem to be going on smoothly now, and there are people who are showing up even more. There's more than a thousand. So, pretty good. Excellent. Yeah, and on the East Coast, it's only eight o'clock. And I'm and I'm the answering East Coast, people. And I'm, early and I'm not ignoring you guys. I'm actually answering people's questions. Me too. <laughs> yeah, we've got some folks here who are having trouble getting in, and somebody's uh, wanting to know about how to sign in. So, yep, yep. Well, so Steve, is uh, are are the crowds still? Uh, have have the numbers increased? I get um, brought so now where you you don't want to really jump into the eleven o'clock class anymore, just because you might not get credit for the full hour. Uh, you'll probably if going right about now you get it because you have to stay fifty minutes, and that'll be just about fifty minutes. But after that, you can't. You're correct, and. We try to do everything by the book of Arbo, and I've been to other online conferences where uh, I looked at the course, I took the quiz on demand and passed without ever even seeing the lecture. I, didn't, I don't need the credit, so it's not anything that was a, a legal issue, but it shows how we try to total line completely. So the software for everybody, the software is measuring how long you're in the uh, lecture, and if you're not there for the proper amount of time, which is 50 minutes, then you'll not get credit. Uh, now it, you just don't get credit. When it's on demand, you just can't take the quiz. It won't allow you to take the quiz. Yeah. Well, you know what? It is better to be more strict than not because you don't want doctors to sit through classes and then find out that their credits aren't accepted. And that would be really bad because then uh, doctors would be angry at you guys and it's it's tough. So it's better to make sure to play by the rules and make sure that everybody's credits are going to be accepted because that's important. Licensure is at stake. Yep. So for the most part, though, we've got so now, about, we have about just two or three people who are having problems who are contacting me by by email or, or on, in the text chat. So for the the number of people that we have actually attending now, I think that's pretty good in terms of a rate, which is, you know, always good to see. I always worry, you know, when people contact us, is the software falling apart, of course? And the answer is no. Uh, people just, you know, if they've never taken the course before, they might not know the procedure to get in. Um, so that's just the little teething pains that some people have. But for the most part, things are going smoothly. Excellent. Okay, so what was I saying? Oh, and I want to thank our sponsors just really briefly. Um, so if you haven't, please go to the exhibit hall. Uh, we couldn't actually do this without them. Um, they give us the, the runway that we need to actually set the conference up each year and get it running. And you see this year we have sort of a record-breaking number of sponsors at <laughs> this year's show. Uh, and in fact, there's one that's not even listed there. We actually had another company come on, uh, and we'll talk about them later today. They're not really going to be here for the May show. It was a little bit late, but you'll see them in June as well. They have a new pharmaceutical product coming out uh, that is unlike anything in the market before. Um, so it hasn't actually uh, uh, made it to market yet, but we'll talk all about that later. Um, so definitely check them out. Uh, I'd like to, of course, thank Marco for sponsoring this live stream today, as they've done since the beginning, since 2015. Um, so you want to check out Marco's booth. We're going to be talking to several people at Marco, I think, over the next couple of days, uh, so we can hear what's going on with them. As everybody knows, Marco has come together in sort of a combination with Lombard and EMS and a bunch of other companies into one gigantic uh, eye care group called Advancing Eye Care. And we're going to talk to them about what's, what's going on with the company and what they've been doing in sort of the era of COVID, right? Because Marco makes all the tools that you guys use every day. Um, and we're going to talk about just how you're able to, to socially distance using a lot of their tools. So we'll have several people from Marco to speak with. Uh, Optos, again, you know, we everybody has seen their wide field cameras. They're really kind of incredible. You should go check them out as well. Uh, go to their booth. And I think we have a lecture about, a couple of lectures about wide field. In fact, I think one's going on right now. Um, using ultra-wide field retinal imaging. 
Uh, so, you know, hopefully if you're taking that lecture, you're in there already, or if not, you can catch it on demand. Pretty cool stuff, lots of really neat pictures. Conan Medical, uh, again, you know, they've been with us, I think, you know, for the past several years. Uh, and we've done a few really cool webinars with Craig Thomas, uh, all about their products as well and what they do. Uh, so if you check out their booth, I'm not sure if they have any excerpts of Craig's stuff, uh, but I know that we do have the lectures still up on ODWire if you want to check those out. Obviously, no Coke credit, <laughs> um, but it's always fun to hear him talk about how to build your practices using some of their technology. So pretty neat stuff. Uh, Mackey Health, the supplement company. Steve, I believe you are intimately familiar with them uh, since you use them in your practice. If, if I recall correctly, I think Steve's actually in the class, so we can't really talk about them right now, but um, check out their booth as well. <laughs> Steve left us, but I, I know, I, as I recall, we were at a trade show. I don't even remember where we were. It might have been Expo West or East when he went up to their booth uh, and he, he restocked his office with their supplies. So I know he uses them, but we'll talk about them later. Um, yep, I'm on. Oh, you're back. Great, great company. Yes. Yep. I'm, yes. Ba I'm back. I'm all over the place. I just uh, <laughs> leaving you for a second to deal with. Uh, there are some issues, um, you know, typical things that people don't know what to do. But uh, right. once you get through the first half hour of the first day, then uh, my hair doesn't turn gray anymore. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's you know, a little, a little bit of a learning curve for some people who've never done this before, but then it becomes like second nature. Um, so anyway, we were just talking about Mackey Health, and I remember that time that we were at one of the expos, I think, I don't even remember, where you went in and restocked your office for the year. Uh, with yep. their product, so great product, and and that's actually what John Nolan's talking about at, at the moment. Uh, he, he he doesn't highlight Mac Health because Arbor won't let us do that, but he highlights the pigments and what he uh, he does a tremendous amount of research. His uh, laboratory in Ireland is devoted to exclusively for that, and he knows the subject I think better than anybody on earth. Yep. Okay, let me go back here. So one little thing here. Okay. And I'm just helping somebody, you know, just to remind them that this little sandwich board on the left in the lobby that gets you to the classrooms, that sounds really kind of opaque, doesn't it? <laughs> Let me show people what I'm talking about. Um, to get to the classrooms from the lobby, you click where it says Session Lobby and that, that sandwich board on the left there, and that gets you into all the different classrooms. See? And so that's uh, how you do it. So easy peasy. Um, yep. and, and that's where all the classes live. One little tip um, I'd like to give everybody. If you're in the class and you can't get video or something, just uh, reboot the, the lecture, go in and out, and, and it comes back in. Some people are having trouble with their computers, but it, it, it works a second yeah, time. Just re and, yeah, refresh the page. All you have to do is hit F5 or refresh. Yeah. Um, you know, reload the page, and then it'll come up. So this is the bane of the existence of technical people, the, the idea that the information on the page gets cached and it happens everywhere. In fact, even on this live stream, if you join this late, sometimes it starts right back from the beginning and you know, people don't want that. So if you refresh, it'll catch you up to you know, the current part. So caching is unfortunately a necessary evil on the internet, right? It helps the server smooth out demand, but uh, it can sometimes leave you with stale data on your screen. And one little tip, it's just a small little tip, Adam, to give everybody, I'm doing it in all the rooms. When you click on that attendance check, there's about a five to seven second delay before the OE tracker box appears and you, you attest that you attended it. Some people are, um, you know, not, um, they don't know to wait that seven seconds. They just see the quiz, nothing pops up, and they go out. So just wait a few seconds for it to load in, and you'll be able to enter your tracker number and attest that you were at the lecture. Yep. So it, it's working in all rooms. Yeah, great. So, yeah, you just have to be patient. And, you know, and if you miss, this is the other important thing to know. If you something happens and for whatever reason you miss the, the, the quiz, you can always, or I call it a quiz, but it's not really. It's just a, a form. If you miss it, you can come back later after all this, everything is done at your own, you know, leisure you can come back go to the help center and then down here you see where it says live like let's say you attended OCT2 that's not until tomorrow but let's say you attended it and you forgot to fill out that form all you have to do is click right there where it says live OCT2 and then the form will pop up again and you can just enter your tracker number and say yeah that was me that actually attended not my assistant and you'll get credit for it so <laughs> um, so you can always come you can always loop back later and do it it's very easy you just go to the help center and then you'll see if you scroll down the list of all the courses. Uh, and by the way, if you didn't attend the lecture, you can't really take these quizzes and get credit or fill out that little form that says, yeah, it was me. The system remembers when you watched, right? And it does that so it can figure out, were you here live? Were you here on demand? What actually happened here? Um, so it knows. 
and again, this is an Arbo requirement. Steve, you alluded to it er earlier. We try our level best to comply with their rules always. Um, some companies don't. Some companies just you know make it up as they go along and hope that they won't be caught by Arbo. I think um, we're different. We're constantly you know talking to the regulators there to make sure that we're doing an okay job. So that's that's why we have the requirements that we do. We want to make sure that we're doing things accurately. And we actually have a lot of people from Marble that take our lectures not to order them because they actually like them. I won't mention any names, but they're very supportive of us because they think uh, the program is pretty comprehensive and uh, enjoyable. Yep. Yeah. So we're trying to do our best because the idea, you know, about COPE in general was that there was a common standard that all the states could then use as part of their CE requirements. And, you know, we, we believe that it's a great idea, right, because having 50 plus different standards is ridiculous. And what they tried to do at ARBA was standardize everything. Unfortunately, some of the states haven't really gotten on board, as you can tell by the laws being very different across the country. Uh, but we're hoping over time that more and more states, very much like in medicine, right? If you take category 1C in medicine, it's good everywhere. Um, and we're hoping that's kind of the thing uh, with, with ARBO and COPE as well, that it catches on to the point where a state just says, you know what, if COPE says a lecture's approved, it's approved and it's fine. Uh, we're not gonna you know, hold people to certain arcane rules. Like last night, actually, I got a, I got a call from somebody from Illinois asking about their CE requirements. And you know, I have no idea, right? I'm out here in Oregon. But I went to Illinois' website and I started looking at their laws and oh my God, <laughs> I had no idea what I was looking at. Some of the CE you have to take from universities, you have to take them from a, an accredited college, other CE you don't have to, it was just a mess. And, and I'm looking at this like, why are they doing this? Why don't they just say, you know what, if electroscope approved, it's good for us, take X number of hours a year, you know, done. But they don't do that. Um, so anyway, hopefully in the future, the uh, companies or the states will actually follow these rules a little better um, so we don't have to deal with that kind of stuff because it just seems like a waste of you know I, I'm, I'm back from the olden days uh, for many many years uh, the national board wasn't necessarily recognized by the state boards that many uh, optometrists took the national board past them but then they still had to take the exam from the state so that's where we are pretty much uh, with uh, with online CE now, we're, we're back in the 1950s and 60s, and hopefully, we'll, we'll, we'll get we'll kind of catch up. Yeah, but people would think how absurd that that a state could do that to uh, to force you to take a, a separate quiz. But states wanted their independence in those years, and that's the issue right now. Are you listening, Florida? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, it's a challenge, but, you know, hopefully this, this will, uh, you know, as, as a society, as we've become more mobile, these rules look increasingly ridiculous, don't they? Um, because why should Iowa be so different from Illinois, right? Be so different from Wisconsin. It's ridiculous. Uh, because they can. Because they can, of course, right? There's a historical reason for it. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, it's increasingly, I don't know. It's just creating a lot of red tape that's unnecessary when you can have a single organization that can create red tape, right, Arbo. And if you put your trust in them that they're doing a good job, really people should be you know, falling in line with them, I think, personally. And I know they're doing a good job because they harass us all the time, so in a good way, right? <laughs> they, they, they make sure that the quality control is high. Without them, we wouldn't have any quality control, right? It would be a, a free for all. And if, God forbid, we had to follow every state's individual rules about quality, it would just be a mess. So, you know, thank, thanks to Arbo for keeping us, you know, on the straight and narrow. It's really, really quite helpful. So anyway, let me just get back to the sponsors and talk a little bit about it. Luna Technology is a sponsor that came on with us last month, and we're going to be talking about them as well. We're going to be talking to a bunch of people from the company. Again, they make a bunch of the technology that you use in your office and a bunch of different equipment. They have a, uh, many products that also, again, help with sort of this idea of remote refraction, right? It's keeping your distance from patients. And we're going to be talking to them all about it and what they're doing. Um, and oh, by the way, one other thing that's sort of funny, a lot of the sponsors when the whole pandemic broke out, they were very afraid to actually try to sell things to doctors um, because obviously in the beginning doctors weren't buying. But at this point, we're moving to a phase where a lot of doctors are reopening their offices and they're thinking about um, you know, expanding or changing the way their offices run. 
Um, so as we go for these next two days, I know that a bunch of the companies do have specials running. You may have gotten an email that I sent uh, on behalf of Lunar Technology talking about their deals. And again, we're going to talk to them on the air as well. Uh, Hugs, right? Again, you know, more equipment that you use in your, in your office um, on a daily basis. And, and again, hopefully if you enter their booth, you can see a little bit about what they're doing around remote refraction as well and trying to keep you safe. Neurovisual Medicine Institute, then this is all about PRISM and, and adding PRISM to help with a, a variety of conditions. Um, and I personally, you know, obviously I, I don't get the science perhaps as much as Steve does around this product um, and the Institute, but they do have a place where you can go if you want to learn all about this and integrate their techniques into your practice, you can physically go visit them uh, in Michigan and they'll give you an intensive clinic over a couple of days. So again, this is an example of where live interaction, probably quite useful. Um, where they're, they're giving you this sort of up, up close and personal uh, experience to try to learn these techniques and integrate them into your practice over a period of one or two intense days. Tear care, we're going to be talking to somebody from tear care very soon actually, or actually one of the doctors. Um, and we're going to be talking to Bobby Signs actually coming up in about five minutes, I think. Um, and so uh, they just came out with a study called Olympia. Gretchen, have you heard of this, or, or am, I, am I breaking some news to you? It sounds vaguely familiar, um, but keep talking. Okay, so this was a study that, they, that uh, Tear Care uh, undertook, an actual clinical study, to try to show the efficacy of their device on my bone oh, right, gland right. dysfunction. Yeah. Uh, and so the results just came out recently. I was completely unaware of this until a couple of days ago. Uh, and Bobby, I think, worked on the study, so he's going to tell us a little bit about the results and, and what's going on with that, which is pretty neat stuff. Um, so he will be here momentarily, and we can talk to him about it, which will be cool. Um, so VTI Natural View, so this is a specialty contact lens company, and they make soft multifocals. And Steve, I know you've used their product before. Yep, the product. Yep. So, so check them out as well. Go into their booth and, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they are one of the ones. So, Steve, when you use them, and I, I know I shouldn't bring up the idea of myopia management, um, you know, they, or actually they can't bring up the idea of myopia management, but we can. <laughs> Oops. Um, it's definitely uh, part of our armamentarium. We um, have the three-pronged approach, and it's, what, it's the first thing we go to in the, in the contact lens realm, in the soft contact lens realm, because it, the optics, I don't want to get into a lecture here, but the optics are supposedly the best for the um, relieving of the peripheral hyperopic defocusing. Yep, and so it's a proven material as well, so pretty easy to work with, right? So definitely go, go check them out. Uh, Zeiss, so our good old friends at Zeiss are back again sponsoring the conference, and thank you to them. Now, Zeiss has got a lot of stuff going on, especially around reopening um, and social distancing, and they're actually giving away shields uh, as well for the slit lamp. And uh, later today, I'll show you their site and where they're doing it. Well, I did a conference for them, a virtual conference last month, where I have some footage from it that I'll show later today too, about a practice that actually <laughs> set up most of their, um, their pretest equipment outside in the parking lot, right? So <laughs> it's kind of an amazing, it's an amazing thing to watch, right? You have maybe $100,000 worth of equipment out on carts out in the parking lot um, with where people basically drive up and do their pretesting and then, you know, drive away so they don't have to be around other patients. It's kind of a crazy thing, but this is what people are doing now. Uh, and with their equipment, it's so portable, you actually can get away with doing it. So I'll show you a video of that later. Pretty neat stuff. Uh, AB Max, so everybody... No, nobody drives... At one point, nobody drives away with the equipment? Well, no, there are people That's standing there, obviously. <laughs> 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 I mean, the thing that made me yeah. nervous, actually, <laughs> just looking at it, I mean, they, they had, you know, this, this incredible wide-field camera sitting there, and I just got nervous looking at this thing on top of a cart. I'm like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> I'd handle it like it was a bomb or something. Can you imagine rolling that thing out into a parking lot? Um, so it's, it's kind of expensive equipment to do that with. So AB Max, uh, you, you know and love them um, to get all that cruft off people's lids uh, for anterior blepharitis. And check out their booth. They're running specials as well uh, for folks here today. I think their trade-in deal is still good if you have the, one of these so-called first-generation devices. I won't name brand names. Um, you can trade them in and also get a deal there. So check them out. Uh, Neurolens, this is another company that, that makes us a, a system with this uh, prism built into the lenses. And I know, Gretchen, you have a pair that they made up for you and you've been using. 
Um, I do. I'm wearing them right now, and I've been wearing them. I wear them when I sit at my uh, at my monitor all day long. So yes, they. I have found them very helpful. Yep. So, and they have an entire system in place. So they have a device that helps you measure how much prism to put into the lens. They, you know, the thing spits out the the correct amount, and then they also manufacture the lenses too. So it's basically an entire system if you want to get involved with that. And we'll have more on that later as well. Uh, Oculus, you know, makers of the the Pentacam, among other devices, as I like to say, the Swiss Army knife uh, of devices. It can do a whole lot of stuff, especially if you're getting involved with specialty lenses. Uh, definitely something to check out. Again, go to their booth; they have deals going. Science-based health, again, makers of supplements um, for a variety of things, including dry eye. Uh, great thing about them is that, as their name implies, they're science-based. When you speak with them. Uh, you're not going to sort of get a bunch of hand wavy explanations. They actually delve into the science and they use it to formulate each one of their products. Um, so they're very big. You know, if, if you're into footnotes, this is a company you'd be into because they have many of them <laughs> around their products. If you if you look at their white papers, um, so they very much believe that the science has to lead the product that they're making. So definitely check them out. Covalent Career. So this is actually the largest site online. If you're looking to hire an OD or if you're looking for a job, go to their website. Um, you know, they have a bunch of information too about COVID and, and reopening. So they've done a lot of the research uh, about what's going on with the different government programs and there's really useful information there um, as you're just starting to reopen. So definitely check that out as well. iCare Live, we're going to be speaking with the folks from iCare Live, uh, I guess tomorrow. Um, so they make a telehealth platform. So obviously over the last couple of months, they've absolutely exploded because this allows you to reach your patients without having them come into your office uh, and do it in a very structured way so you can actually be reimbursed for it. Um, so we're going to talk more to, with them tomorrow. iCare Pro. So again, if you're doing a lot more stuff online and everybody is, you might want iCare Pro to handle not just your website, but your social media presence as well. They also have some telehealth stuff that they're working on and we'll show that off tomorrow too. Lac Rivera, maker of punctal plugs, they have a list of deals that is literally like, it's like a mile long. It reminded me of like a Chinese restaurant menu of just like this huge list of discounts that are just at the conference. So if you run over there, uh, check out their booth and download the PDF and I'll show the PDF later as well when we have a little more time. And Optometry Times, practical chair side advice. Gretchen, what would you like to say about Optometry Times? What would I like to say? Uh, well, first, read it if you aren't already. We will. You can subscribe to our print publication that's monthly. We also have email newsletters that we send out three times a week, so you can subscribe to that in addition. And then we also have a digital edition, which is essentially a fancy PDF of the print edition that you can page through and look at it electronically. So. The idea behind Optometry Times is we have easily digested, easily consumable content. So you can read it between patients and apply that advice to the next patient in your chair. And don't hang on to it the way everybody's got these journals stacked up on their desks. And you should read these journals, but we've got you covered. Everything's on our website. So flip through it, read it, and then get rid of it. Don't, don't hang out with it. All the content lives elsewhere. I'll send you another one next month. But just read it. That's all I'm asking. And I'm also always interested in feedback. If we aren't covering what you think we should, let me know. If you'd like to write for us, let me know. Um, I'm very accessible. I'd love to talk to people about what they'd like to see. Uh, constructive criticism, always welcome. And as well as for our chief optometric editor, Ben Casella, we'd love to hear from people. So read it and let us know what you think. And in fact, we're going to be speaking with Ben later today, aren't we? So we'll see how he's doing. You had a, a series with him, you know, looking increasingly bedraggled uh, as the uh, as the pandemic went on. But I bet he's looking better now as things are kind of you know changing down there. So I'm really curious to hear what he's been up to. So that'll be a lot of fun. He won't look too much better. I don't know if he's had a haircut yet. <laughs> Love you, Ben. <laughs> Okay, and finally, Vision Equipment Inc. So this is Leo Hadley's company. Again, uh, you know, they have a full line of um, refurbished equipment for you. If you're looking to get in, you know, uh, get a deal. Leo constantly has a rotating uh, set of equipment. You know, I never know what he's going to have day to day. Um, sadly, of course, now he's got a bunch of sort of pre-loved equipment, shall we say. You know, a lot of practices aren't going to reopen at all ever, and he's gotten, you know, new equipment coming in all the time. Um, so you might want to check him out. And I think that's it for our sponsors. And 
yeah so that that is that we do we have we let me see we have bobby signs coming up let me uh see if he is there bobby are you on the line hello hey how's it going good morning good, how are you we are good we are good so you know bobby the last time we spoke i think we we had you on the air talking about oct right <laughs> Yeah, that we're talking about anterior segment OCT and kind of its role in the anterior segment. Yep. So I think this is a little bit different this time. We want to talk to you about this Olympia thing that, that just came out. So you want to enlighten us all about what the Olympia study was or is? and Because uh, I know that, you know, this was the first time w that we really were hearing about it. So I'd love to get some background about what it all is. Yeah, yeah, not a problem. I think I think it's, it's probably best just to start off with, uh, you know, kind of what the Olympia study was and what it was looking at. And, and I'll kind of just share some of my background experiences about, you know, we were involved in the study and even why we wanted to be involved in the study. And, and really what it was looking at is, you know, most people are familiar with LipaFlow. And one of the newest devices to come to the market is the Tear Care system, which is a personalized open eye experience. And so Tear Care, for if anybody doesn't know what Tear Care is, it's basically, you know, it's kind of like three parts to it. It has a hockey puck. Um, kind of like a smart hub that then delivers the heat to the smart lids that go on the eyelids. And the smart lids provides heat from the outside, but it heats the eyelids enough um, to where you're actually getting to the meibomian glands and able to heat the meibom. And then you, after the treatment's over, some people even do it during, um, you're able to clear uh, the meibom. You're actually able to like see the meibom coming out. Um, and so tear care is, you know, when it first came out, I knew it was very affordable. Um, you, it's portable, um, but really the biggest question was, you know, can, how does this stack up to lipoflow and, and does it actually work? You know, there had been some studies in clinical ophthalmology that had showed um, that it had worked, but, you know, my biggest question was, you know, how does it compare to lipoflow? And um, so we, we talked with, with site scientists and we were actually involved in the study and the study is called the Olympia study. And that's, that's what we're, we're going to talk about today. And I loved the study design because the study design, it was a multi-center randomized controlled trial. Trial. So there were 10 centers, you know, um, and, and really, I, you know, I think we sent you over the, the picture there, the study overview, if you want to pull that up, if that's not up. But the first part there, it's like math. And basically what that means is I love the study because even though I was a principal investigator in the study, I didn't know how, what, like how these patients were doing. So Adam, if you were, if, like if we were together on a team, I would basically be the one doing the treatment and you would be looking at them before and after. So you wouldn't know what treatment they had. You would just be looking at the signs and symptoms. So you'd be looking at like tear breakup time. You would be looking at the meibomian gland secretion score um, and all of these questionnaires and looking at corneal and conjunctival staining. And so I really love the study design in that, you know, really nobody, it was, it was a great study design in that you didn't know like, oh, maybe they had lipoflow or tear care, and maybe you judged the tear breakup time a little longer. Not saying that anybody would do that, but it just didn't let that biasness come in. And so really the whole goal of, of the study was to basically do a really well-designed study and look at tear care versus lipoflow. So looking at the signs and symptoms, you know, the, the inclusion and exclusion criteria and really was you were looking at this, you know, and you basically took out the restasis and the zyder. And if, if anybody had lipoflow recently or IPL, it was really on patients who were coming to the eye doctor and they were like, I have dry eye, what can we do about it? Um, and so basically they had to have dry eye. So they looked at OSDI and tear breakup time. And if you had a, you know, an OSDI of 23 to 79, a T by 11 seven, if you actually had dry eye, you could be enrolled in the study. And so then you were randomized either to get lipoflow or to get uh, tear care. And so the primary endpoint, and I think you, we sent this over as, as in a slide too as well, you saw that the, um, if, you're, if you pull that up, the primary import point of tear film breakup time, you showed that there was a statistically significant increase in the mean, mean tear breakup time in both groups, right? That's kind of what we expected there. Um, and so that kind of helped to show that tear care, the tear care system was non inferior to lipoflow. Um, same thing happened with the meibomian gland secretion scores. Um, so in looking at the, the signs there, it looks good. So going over to the symptoms, if you go to the secondary endpoint, which one of, there was multiple secondary endpoints, but the one we sent over here that you have a slide up here, just so you can show the picture there, is that the ocular surface disease index, right? The OSDI, there was a statistically significant improvement in mean OSDI score compared to baseline. 
you can see that going down, you know, if patients are starting off on average about 51, 52, they're going down to 27, 24. And you can actually see there was a, you know, the, the symptoms improved the mean uh, more in the tier care group, but it was statistically significant in both groups. Um, and so that is kind of what we thought. Um, and, and, and if you look, if you further break that down, 82% of tier care system, um, of the tier care system patients showed clinically meaningful improvements on OSCI. So that was, uh, it was really exciting and really encouraging to get those results. And, you know, actually the, the Olympia study was first produced or, you know, first, uh, kind of shown at ASCRS. And I had just been like waiting because I wanted to know, you know, I knew that both of these treatments were safe. But getting um, the results and showing that, you know, tear care system was not inferior to lipid flow, a single treatment of the tear care um, was statistically significant and clini clinically meaningful in the signs and symptoms of dry eye within two weeks, which I think is really exciting for a lot of us because, you know, a lot of these treatments, you kind of have to, to wait for them to work. And in our practice, you know, and working in a referral center, you know, we have a lot of patients coming over wanting to get surgery. And so getting them better, quicker, and in these patients who have cataracts or maybe who are looking to get LASIK um, is, is really beneficial. And uh, I think, you know, the biggest thing is, you know, there's a, there, it's tough, right? And these patients who are maybe tried multiple things and are not getting any relief, it was great to show that a large majority of patients are getting improvement from just one single, you know, 10 to 15 minute treatment. Um, so we're really excited to show those, um, the results at the Olympia study. And I think we'll continue to show paper, uh, you know, kind of provide more of the background um, to those first papers that came out in clinical ophthalmology. Right. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the interesting things to me, you know, showing, uh, you know, as you saw in the results there, um, and actually I can put it up again so people can see, um, you know, the fact that it was non-inferior, right? Uh, and I know that the, the price of the, the ticker units itself is, is quite low uh, relative to what has existed before. Right. Right. I mean, if you're, you know, traditionally, you know, getting into this, like, you know, I mean, there's like what 40 million people who have dry eye and, you know, 86% of them have my only gland dysfunction. And if you say like, you know, I want to get into the procedure, you know, space here, I want to be able to provide my patients with some kind of procedure, you know, historically in the past, you're, you know, you're getting in and you're like, well, how much does it cost to enter the market? And, you know, it might be, you know, 25 to $30,000. And, you know, this is like, you know, one fifth of that. So it's great to have, um, you know, I think it's going to be beneficial for more doctors to have technology that is accessible, is non-inferior, um, and actually works really well because um, these patients need treatment because it's not, you know, dry eye is a chronic progressive disease. Um, and the last thing we want is for these patients to get to a point to where we can't help them. Right. And let me actually put it up on the screen again so people can see if, if they can see this at all. Let me put it up there again just to show them the tear care device. So how does this actually work? You know, I can see that you're, you're putting it on the lids. Is this something that you do or your techs do? How does, how does it work? Yeah, so I think in the beginning, you know, probably doctors like want to do it just so they know how to do it so then they can teach the system. But in our office, you know, we have our technicians do that this now. So our technicians put it, because there's some ways that you want to put it on there to make sure that it stays well there. They We're on the second version of the smart lid. So it's just like, it's so much better because it's curved and it's more flexible. Um, and so you, you put that on and basically you start the treatment. Um, and once you start the treatment, the heat kind of slowly gets up to the point to where you want it to. Um, and then once you, you just leave it on and you just set a timer. So typically we, you know, if we, our techs are starting this, they'll come and tell me like, hey, you know, I'm gonna need you in about 10 to 15 minutes. And so I think different clinics do it differently, but we know that once the treatment is done, then I'll go in there, remove the smart lids and express the glands. Um, so it makes it nice that, you know, you're not spending a ton of pa patient time. Um, you know, the techs are doing most of this. You're just going there and actually expressing the lids. And, and that's kind of been one interesting point is like, you know, I thought that, you know, maybe all the glands would be equal. And what we found out is like, not all glands are created equal. Like, you know, some glands are just really stubborn. And so after you heat up the glands, you're going to go with the, the clearance assistant and you're going to go in there and you're going to basically try to get that mible mount. In some areas, you just have to, like, you know, when you're expressing, you know, you want to push and squeeze like, and hold it there. You don't have to squeeze really hard. You just need to hold that pressure there. And in some areas of just holding it there for seven, eight, nine, ten seconds, it, like, it breaks through and then you just see, like, the volcano erupt. <laughs> right. 
And so I'm looking at the device right now on the screen. It looks like a little hockey puck, right? And the user interface looks pretty simple. Yeah. It looks like there's an on-off button uh, right in the middle. And, right. and so what's the rest of this? I don't, I don't want to click around here too much just to show people, but you can actually see it's telling you how hot the device is on the left, it looks like. Yeah, yeah. So if you look at the hockey puck, if you have a picture of that up, yep. um, essentially you have the power button in the middle. And what you can do is you're just going to hold down that power you know, button once you have the smart lid plugged in. So you click, hold that down just for a few seconds. And on the left, that temperature is going to go all the way up. There's one, two, three, four, five buttons there. That goes all the way up. So you can adjust the temperature. Like if a patient's like, oh, this is just too uncomfortable, you can lower it. If it, you know, it, it has the ability to do that. We haven't had to do that in our clinic, but you do have that ability. And then on the right hand side, you see how it goes from zero to 15. That that kind of will give you a timer. That will that will essentially will tell you. So you know, if you wanted to look in the room, you could see how much time is left. Or your tech could tell you, hey, look, you got six minutes left or three minutes left. So I'm going to need you to come in here with the clearance assistant. So. I mean, it's it's very portable. I mean, all of this you could have it, you know, in a, a cabinet. You could have tons of these. It's it's really portable. You can take it between rooms. You don't have to take patients to a specific room to get treated. Um, so, it, or if you have satellite clinics, you can take it from satellite clinic to satellite clinic. So it's it's quite nice. Right. And so let's talk about the consumables here for a second. So on the left side of the screen here, I'm showing people what the smart lids look like. How does that work? So do you you buy these as like five packs or ten packs or something? Yeah, I think um, I, I think it's different. You know, sometimes you can buy them in, in ten packs or five packs. You know, our first purchase, we bought ten of them. Um, so we bought, you know, the the hub, the ten pack, and it comes with a clearance assistant. Um, and they'll get. So for example, if you buy, you know, uh, let's say twenty smart lids for ten patients, you would get ten of these clearance assistants um, as well. So you could just use those, and you they tell you to dispose of those after every use. Um, so. That's typically, I would say, what most patients, what most practices do is they, they buy 10 patients worth. Right. And so these are all disposable, so patients don't have to worry about, you know, uh, if they're clean or not. And then cleaning the device itself is, I'm assuming, pretty straightforward. It, it looks like there aren't too many nooks and crannies to get into. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the other cool thing we haven't even talked about is this is an open, uh, and you, you know, have the ability to have make this an open eye experience, right? So patients, when they're getting this treatment now with the second version, it's much more comfortable. So patients, you know, they can, when they have these smart lids on, I don't know if you have a picture of, of them with this on, but you, you know, basically patients can have their eye open. So, you know, they can, we actually have them like look at their phone and blink, right? Because every time they're blinking and we're getting some oil coming out, you know, at first we told them, well, maybe just close your eyes. But now if we have them open their eyes and blink throughout the treatment. If somebody wants to close their eyes and take a little nap, they can. Uh, but we try to encourage them to keep their eyes open and look at their phone. And, and I think it's been, re been really nice. The reason why I was interested in this in the very, very beginning was because we just had some patients, you know, we, we primarily used Lipoflow in the beginning. And there were just some patients who had, you know, smaller eyes. And even if you like, I feel like I'm pretty good at opening people's eyes who are really small. But it just, there are some people where you couldn't do this in. Um, and so now having tear care, like there, there's not, re there's nobody, um, really, we can do this on all patients. You know, you don't have to worry about like, oh, gosh, am I going to be able to do this? Um, so, so we use this in our clinic. We even combine it in our clinic with IPL, um, intense pulse light as well. So you have the ability to combine this with other treatments. And I think that's really, you know, the benefit of the study, the Olympia study, it showed us basically how does tear care work in a patient's eye that really has had no treatment, right? Um, or, you know, they're not on the stasis, they're not undergoing any other treatment at the same time. And really now it's going to be, okay, well, let's see how we can now use this because, you know, most of the time when we're doing these treatments, we have them on anti-inflammatory drop as well. Uh, maybe you have them on some kind of, uh, you know, hydro eye or whatever your favorite kind of uh, oral vitamin is. Uh, I think there's just, a, it's, it's really exciting to now see, like, now that we have this data, you know, how, when we get these results, how long can we keep these results? How long can we keep these patients happy? Right. Um, and I really think that's the next step. Right. And one question I had was just about training. When you actually purchase this thing, how did that work? You know, how did you f figure out how to actually do it? Do they have, does somebody come on site or do you go somewhere? How does, how does that work? Yeah. So for example, our, 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 so we're in San Antonio and uh, our rep's in Houston. And so she came, um, she, she helped to set this up. So basically she came, she brought some smart lids. We had like, basically one, like we have, if we have like maybe four, you know, technicians who really focus on um, dry eyes she came down and what we had them do was basically get a treatment done and then set it up on the next technician so all of the technicians got to see like what does it feel like what am i going to tell the patient um how do i use this 
Um, and so it was, it was, it was, it was good, you know, so they come out here, make sure you're comfortable using it. And it's pretty straightforward. I, you know, we had a lunch and we even had some of the other navigators watching it and it was, it was pretty straightforward. So, um, you know, versus lipoflow flow where you have to like, you know, you have to be careful because you don't want to cause any kind of corneal abrasion. Um, like this is just way easier to teach. And so now, now we have like all of our technicians who can do this and it's not, you know, for example, we have maybe three technicians in our clinic, three out of the 15 technicians we have who can do the lipoflow. flow. All of them can do the tear care device. So it's pretty straightforward. They'll, they'll work with you. Um, they'll work with you. She's even offered to come back multiple times, but it, it's really straightforward once you, once you, once you do it. Right. And I know that right before the pandemic hit, I know that they were starting to do these little user group meetings around the country. I'm not sure where that's at right now, uh, but I have a feeling that'll yeah. we'll come back to. <laughs> right. Yes. They're doing it virtually right now too. So as well, I mean, that's the, that's the biggest thing that, you know, the, you know, site sciences and the tier care team is really, they, they've, they're coming to practices ready, ready to partner together and not just, you know, sell you it and say peace. Um, you know, they want to talk about like, you know, what, what's the best thing for the patient in your practice? You know, what, what is somebody in Indiana doing that might be beneficial that I'm not doing? You know, what are you, are you screening every patient? You know, what are you sending the patient home with? Are you giving them literature? How much do you, like, you know, just like di different things like that, that, you know, what's your verbiage and your examination? and videos all of that is just really important because i mean i'm a big fan of systems and processes and and getting that down and learning from other people who have had this for a year or who have you know their conversion rate is really high it's really great to learn from other practices so it's not like you're reinventing the wheel on your own yep yeah i know that when i spoke with the folks there they were very concerned that this does not become a paperweight right i mean they want people to buy it but more importantly they want them to use it so, you know, they'll do whatever they can to really help people integrate them, the device into their practice. Right, right. And I think and I think now with the Olympia study, right, I mean, anytime anything new comes out, it's like, great, but does it work? Yep. So I think that was, the, that, that was the, the biggest thing for me is I'm, I'm just a skeptic. And so I think this was a really well done study, obviously, by the fact of like, I didn't even know what the results were until it came out. Uh, and now it's basically we we have proof that it works and that it works really well, so we can we can be confident in offering this this to our patients. All right, well, very cool stuff. So, Bobby, thanks for coming here today. And uh, you know, I think throughout this this whole weekend, we're going to be talking a little bit more about the device. And uh, I'm sure if if we have any questions, I'll fire off an email. Okay, sounds good. Thanks so much. Thanks. All right, have a good weekend. See ya. Bye. All right. So was, was that informative, guys? Always. <laughs> yes. People who got Lipofo um, a few years back for, I won't mention prices, are probably very upset now. Well, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting. You know, I just put up the data again so you can take a, take a look at it. So it's interesting that they went for a non-inferiority study, right, because they just wanted to go head-to-head -to, -head to see what it was like. Um, and certainly the ease of use of this device is, is quite high. Um, it was a true double-blind study. Uh, you don't like to use those words in optometry, but yes. <laughs> All right. Double mask. Double mask. <laughs> double mask. Um, but yeah, you know, so pretty, pretty neat stuff, right? Because this is always the question, is it working or not? Um, and now we know. So, yep. Excellent. Steve, does, the, does this health insurance pay for the treatments? Um, I don't believe so, treatments no. Uh, the they do not. They'll pay for the workup. They'll pay for maybe the office visit, but they're not going to pay for the treatment. It's not approved either Lipoflow or or the tear lip. So um, it's a pretty big profit mar profit margin, just like um, some other things um, like IPL. But it's charged to the patient and it's private pay. Right, and I mean the the both the the initial acquisition cost of the little hockey puck itself and the consumables is very cheap. So you do have some more wiggle room in there than than you you might not with other devices. You know, if people that are listening in, if you have any questions, you could write them down. Yep. We may be able to answer them. Well, see, so it's, it's interesting. On here, I have actually streamed this to two places today, and I don't know, you know, obviously I'm trapped here, so I'm not really looking at what's going on. You know, it's going to our usual place, but we also put it on Facebook today just to see if it would work. And you guys can tell me if it's even working because I have no idea. Um, and certainly I'm not looking, up, and I'm not looking over there. So <laughs> if people have questions or they're watching, I have no idea. All right, let me go look and see. 
Did you put it under OD Wire? Uh, it's on. It should be cross posted to the OD Wire page and the C Wire twenty twenty page. If it, if it worked, I mean. I'm talking about Facebook. Yeah, on on Facebook. Yep. So okay. C Wire has its own. C Wire twenty twenty has its own page. Oh, I didn't know that. It does. Okay, I'm looking. I'm looking. Let's see. Happening now. Well, there are two watchers there. <laughs> there we go. So nobody even knows it's there. So what we might want to do is just cross post it if you want. Feel free. I think you can. Um, oh, somebody wants to know if tear care is available in the UK. I have no idea, but I do know who can answer that question. So I will fire them an email and find out. We have a good UK person. She's great. So yeah, let me. Uh, let me find out. This is a good question. Cool, cool, cool. I'm going to email them right now. Hey, I'm curious. Well, those, are, those that are watching from overseas, why don't you check in? Be curious to see where, what countries are, are watching. Yeah, I can tell worldwide. you. I can tell you. I can tell you already. You know, Australia is probably the biggest, uh, the, the biggest one that we get. Um, and I don't know if that's because of its time zone thing or what, but um, we we do have a, a a pretty good contingent of people who've even you know signed up for the conference. All right, so let's see here. And by the way, as I'm looking right now, I haven't actually been able to check my email or see anything else going on here. But a lot of people are still signing up for the conference as we speak. Um, yep, that's awesome. So. Hopefully everyone's getting in okay. I'm not seeing too many support problems, which is good. The software is not imploding, which is even better. Um, so, so far, so good. People had questions about, um, uh, you know, getting in and taking the quizzes. Again, there's no real quiz. There's just that little form. And Steve, you mentioned it before where people have to click as they're watching to say that, yeah, this was me. This was not my office assistant or my stuffed animal here, mm -hmm. Bailey the dog watching his lectures. This was actually me. Um, there's one issue, but Kat's on it. Um, it was one patient, one person, but she did it very early, like 43 minutes into the lecture. Uh, she looked at a certificate for the lecture, and it said live interactive rather than live. Kat's on it. She'll correct it. So uh, no worries, I don't think. But I haven't gotten her um, text message back. Excellent. Okay, yeah. We just want to, you know, if there, are, if there are little, you know, cock-ups like that where it, they, we need to fix things, we'll do it. You don't have to worry about that. Obviously, with so many lectures going on, 63 of them occasionally, uh, there are errors in the transcript, but we'll fix them. Um, so you don't have to worry sure. about, you know, oh my gosh, it's never going to get fixed and I just wasted an hour of my life. No, that's not the case here. We're on top of it all. And as I mentioned before, we're in constant contact with our regulator, right, with Arbo. And if they see something that looks weird, they come back to us and say, hey, this doesn't look right. Can you fix it? And of course, then we'll just resubmit to them. So, you know, we're, we're always here. Oh, there's, you know, there's not much bureaucracy here. <laughs> you know, with, with almost 5,000 registrants, it's incredible that the amount of problems are so low. Don't jinx us. Yeah, I mean, seriously, knock on some wood here. Um, <laughs> yeah, because it's, it's hard. You know, we, as, as, as I think many people will appreciate, but of course some don't because they don't know us because so many people are new to the conference. We run the conference with a skeleton crew, as you can tell. That's why it's so cheap, right? We were able to knock the price down as low as we can because we we run it with very few people you know it's basically the people you're listening to right now in this room so and then there's cat who handles <laughs> tech support um and you might interact with her if you're having a problem and then a couple of other people who do support as well but for the most part you know it's just us and you know we we do whatever we can but you know it's it's challenging for us but on the flip side it's great because we're all very close to what's going on so if there are problems you know you know who you're going to get i like to tell people and it's true when you look at your certificates, when you see the phone number on there, that's my cell phone number. Um, so we do have people calling me if they have a problem and they call me directly and I pick it up and we just work it out. Um, and it's, it's scaled quite well. I'm kind of surprised actually with 5,000 people that you know my phone's not ringing constantly, but it's not, uh, we have very few problems. Well, that's just my cue to tell everybody to call you. Oh, there you go. You can start giving me prank calls, right? So, uh, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's funny when people do call me, they legit do have issues and they wanna just work it out quickly. And, I'm of the generation now, and certainly the younger people too, where, where the, the, the thought of actually jumping on the phone is ridiculous, right? People won't do it. They'd much rather just send an email or a text or whatever to, to solve their problem. But there are still people who like to talk on the phone, and that's why I give my number out, um, so we can get things settled quickly.
And also, just as you should know, there's, there's not the same amount of people at the last uh, seminar, but uh, there's a lot of interaction between the speakers and the uh, audience, which we usually never had before. So it's great. People right. are enjoying it. Yep. Well, that's I'd, good. Like to be a, I'd like to be a fly on the wall when, when the competition starts doing online, as, as we've been doing, to see what sort of problems they're going to have with their first go around. It should be very interesting. Yeah, I mean, nope, they don't have. Well, the thing is, everybody has you know sim similar tech issues, but what they're not doing, and, and again, you've seen these companies jump on, and even Seiko is doing some stuff now. But what they're not doing is, they're not doing it the way we're doing it with having such an overwhelming number of credits all at once. So I think their problems are going to be a little bit different. <laughs> it won't break the internet. Yeah. So I mean, our our problem has more to do just with the sheer number of credits that we're giving out each time and the number of people that are showing up. It's really a volume issue for us. By the way, uh, Valerie just posted uh, our contact in the UK, and she is aware of uh, Taylor, but I think she's going to try to get some information in. If you I, look at the bottom just, of the chat. Yeah, I just contacted the folks at Tier, okay. Tier Care. So I just contacted the folks at Tier Care, and they'll, they'll let me know quickly. I mean, they're watching, so um, so we'll see. Yeah, it's always it's always hard to know whether stuff is available in different in different markets. Sometimes you'd be surprised it is, and sometimes it's not. So even sometimes, actually, some people from Canada ask me, you know, is such and such available? And I'm surprised when I have to say no. Um, so we'll see. Okay, I'm gonna hop in the um, twelve o'clock rooms. Great. See you guys later. Well, you've got. Uh, I guess that's my cue to tell everybody that um, there are classes starting now. So noon. Um, first, we've got a break in room one, so make sure you take a look at the exhibit hall to see what deals are available. Uh, in room two, we've got the ever entertaining Clark Chang and Brandon Ayers talking about artificial iris implant surgery. And then in room three, Ben Casella starts a two hour class on narcotics. In room four, Crystal Brimer talks about dry eye in the real world. So go get your CE on. Yes, and they're all there as they should be. Um, just to interject, I took um, uh, Ben's course on narcotics, and I do believe it it has everything in it that all the states require. Although you have to check with your state board, as Paul always says, um, it's an excellent lecture. I mean, Ben uh, talks uh, uh, to people, not down to them, and not up in, in a way that you understand everything. So, a great two-hour lecture if you if you want to attend. And I'm actually answering a question right now for someone about the Iowa State Board. Do I know anything about them? And the answer is 100%. I do not. Well, um, the Iowa, we have an Iowa rep for um, another conference we're running, and she did clarify that she thinks the um, lecture might fly for narcotics. I think that's what she, they were asking about one person. Um, is that a requirement there? Yes, it is a requirement in Iowa. It just so happens that we're running uh, another conference for another group, a, a smaller one, uh, and my contact is an Iowa OD, a very bright girl that, that seems to know everything. And Steve, are you actually in the chat telling people, reminding people each hour about the, the, the form that they need to fill out? Because every single time I think people need to hear that over and over again. I uh, guess some people are just I'm doing, doing every single, now. that's Great. what I'm doing right now. Just want to make sure that uh, Crystal's here and she is. Okay, I'll, I'll be posting it in this room. I did the first two, this is easy. Um, but now I'm telling them to wait that uh, I actually made the mistake also. When you just click on the attendance, it looks like you have to put a quiz in. And then it's kind of churning just like um, when a, you know, a, a tab is turning in your browser. Mm -hmm. And if you wait five seconds, boom, it pops up and you're good. Okay, cool. Yeah, so oh, definitely, yeah, definitely let everyone know. I mean, these are the, the yep. tech pitfalls that we're having just because of the COVID rules that happened after CE Wire was first done. So. Uh, I think everyone, you may or may not appreciate it, right? We did this conference in February for the first time using the old rules, right, where every, every uh, lecture needed a test. Then all of a sudden the rules changed on us, where now all of a sudden you don't need a test to do stuff live. Unfortunately, our software is like, hey, I'm programmed here to give a test at the end of each lecture. What do we do? And so the workaround we came up with was just this form where you click, yeah, I was here and put in your OE tracker number instead of a full-on test. Uh, and we do that for the benefit, not only of, you know, so you can attest the fact that you were there without a test, but also so that the software has something to mark down as part of your attendance. It's definitely a hack, but we were caught sort of flat-footed by this, right? It's easy to make changes in software when the system's not live. Uh, you have, you know, all the time in the world and you can experiment as much as you want. 
But when you have a system that has several thousand users in it already and is constantly running, making big changes to a running system, it's really hard. It's like making changes to a car engine while it's running. Um, and so that's why we came up with this little hack of just typing in that, that little form um, for this year. Obviously next year, if we know that this live thing could happen again, it's gonna be much more streamlined, but this is the best we could do. And I think once people figure out how to do it, it's pretty straightforward uh, for them. So it's just a matter of doing it once for the first time. And there's a little bit of a, not a glitch, but just they might say, what happened? Yeah. When they do uh, put their OE tracker number in and attest that they're there, they click a button, they say, yes, you passed the quiz, you get credit for the course. There's no quiz, but that's what the software just reads. So uh, yeah. don't, don't get that. Yeah. And that's why I made that little movie as well, explaining it to people again. It's, it's one of those things where we had very little control over this. And in fact, we didn't even think that we were going to be able to go back live. Uh, and do this again and again and again, right? It was something that once this all happened, we made the decision, let's try to get our speakers back again because people really do need these credits. Let's see what we can do um, to, to make it happen. And there was a period of about two or three weeks where it was just sort of intense, where we tried to figure out, could we actually do this again? Uh, and fortunately, the answer was yes. And it just has these little minor hacks that we have to put in this year. So that's what's going on. Well, we have to say a, a special thank you to our speakers who have been willing to come back each, <laughs> yeah. for each of these, or, you know, that it's a big deal for some. Yep. So thank you, speakers. Yes, we, we couldn't do this without them coming back. It's been really, <laughs> and in fact, not only they're coming back, they were so accommodating. If you'll notice, like for April, May, and June, we tried to line up the same classes against each other in the same time slots each and every time. And we did that on purpose, not just because it was easier to do, but so that if you take one class that's competing against another, then the next time you come live, you can then take the competing class. That's why we set it up that way. So it was just nice that the speakers were, so were agreeable. So we, it was nice that the speakers were agreeable to do it, though. We had very few exceptions where people had to move their lectures. They all sort of agreed to the same time slot. So yeah, we were, we were very grateful for that. Well, we have to hope by next year it's back to business as usual. Yeah, everybody, uh, there are conventions and people can go if they wish to go and come online if they wish to come online. Uh, and I'm, I'm a great believer in these quizzes, although many optometrists don't like to take a quiz after the course. But uh, I think it really helps quality control. So yeah, it's, uh, right. I agree. That's a good thing. Yeah, no, I, I, think, I think it definitely helps. You know, obviously, if, if we didn't have, the, people are asking us, you know, do I have to take a quiz? Like that's become the main thing. The reason that you don't is because that's, you know, sort of what Arbo specified, that quizzes aren't necessary. And again, like we said, we follow the rules. If they're saying that quizzes aren't necessary, quizzes aren't necessary. And so that's why we dropped it. And we're gonna keep following their guidance, you know, throughout. So that's, that's why we made the changes. Any change that you see in the system we're doing to meet their requirements. Um, and in fact, I have the Arbo letter here. In case people haven't seen it yet, I can sort of show you, you know, wh why this all happened. And even to begin with, I can put it up on the screen so people can see. Um, you know, this this was the, the, the great letter that changed our lives back in, I guess it was you know, February or March, where they modified their rules. Um, and so, you know, the idea is, we drop the interactive distance learning COPE ID and replace it with a live COPE ID. And by the way, to actually do that, we had to run all of our lectures through COPE again uh, to make sure that they were good for live credits. So that, that was a little bit of work. Um, and so the ID that you should have next to all of those classes that you're taking today is a live CE ID. And as Steve mentioned, there was a glitch with one of them where it's, we're still showing the interactive one and we're gonna fix that so everybody gets live credit. Um, again, when you have, you know, 63 <laughs> lecture hours, occasionally you miss one as you're going through the system, so. You know, and the good part is the speakers love it too. Not only are we getting kudos from uh, the participants, you know, what do we have, about a 99% approval rating of the courses that we were offering? Yep. But the, the speakers themselves love the idea that they can interact with the uh, attendees, it doesn't interrupt the lecture, and uh, they they can do it in their pajamas, which is the best part of all. <laughs> yeah, our speakers really do like doing it just because, and you know what it also is, it's a very controlled environment. 
uh, because a lot, you know, they're recording a lot of the PowerPoint before and everything. And so they can really control what it is that they're presenting versus doing a live where they might stammer through the thing or make errors. Uh, and they also like it because they can answer questions while the lectures are going on, which is very different from you know a live lecture where you can't really talk to the speaker till the end. Um, so the feedback that we've gotten from the speakers is that they like being able to interact while the lecture is going on, which is sort of unique. Yep. As a former speaker, I can tell you it was most discouraging when you were giving a presentation. In those days, people still read the New York Times paper version and you'd see a big New York Times open wide in front of you as you were giving a, a presentation. Did people really uh, do that? I guess now we'll... <laughs> Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well th those that didn't fall asleep. <laughs> yeah. But but now where well, they sneak they they sneak their, their smartphone while while the lectures are going on. Right. You know, in a, in a brick and mortar meeting. So <laughs> Yeah, things have changed, sort of, but not exactly. Yeah. So, so anyway, just taking a look, by the way, at the schedule. So I guess we also had Ben Casella's narcotics lecture, which is right here. And for those who don't know, that lecture is approved for the narcotics requirement, requirement in several states. Um, so I know New Jersey, Texas, probably good for Iowa as well, as Steve mentioned. There are a lot of states that have these narcotics requirements, but they don't have um, explicit courses that you can take for them. You just submit it and, uh, you know, it counts because you say it counts, <laughs> which is interesting. I think states like Texas, you actually have to submit, we have to submit, you know, for approval for a narcotics course, and we did. But there are other states where it's much looser, where you can just tell them, yeah, this is a narcotics course, and they'll believe you. Uh, and I think that's the case for Iowa. I saw nowhere in their laws where you actually had to submit a formal course for narcotics. You can just state this is a nar narcotics course. Um, and Ben's uh, lecture obviously applies. I wonder in the CE of the future when narcotics become legal, uh, will, will there be booths that, that show the, that are marketing marijuana and whatever else is legal in the years to come? Well, it should be very interesting. You forget where we live, right? <laughs> I mean, there are, <laughs> you know, sure. I mean, here in Portland, you know, it's as they say, there are, are more, um, you know, THC places than um, than Starbucks. Really, it's true. You know, if you want to to look for for cannabis, it's it's everywhere here. And I have a feeling, you know, most of the country eventually follows what the West Coast is doing, right? This is where the trends tend to start. And yeah, I have a feeling it's uh, going to spread, particularly now, right? When you're seeing state budgets just absolutely collapsing everywhere, what an easy way to raise revenue. <laughs> <laughs> you, you laugh, but I, I have sure. a feeling this is what's going to be. You're going to see a lot of states turning to this because why not? Yep, absolutely. And, it has, and I don't think uh, you don't see stone people walking the streets of, of Oregon. Well, you know, <laughs> wait a minute. It depends. Minute. <laughs> oh, well, you may not know. I take it back. <laughs> you haven't been downtown recently, so you, you wouldn't know. <laughs> Steve, as an investor, uh, do you invest in uh, in companies that that uh, are growing cannabis or marketing it? Yep, Steve's gone. I think he's he's in the lecture. So he's, he's busy. Steve, Steve may be gone. He's busy. Okay. He's got real work to do. Yeah. To talk about that on. No, I'm in, I'm here. Can you hear me? I'm back and forth. Oh yeah, we can um, hear you. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah uh, just a little bit. I um, did a little bit of Aurora and Talray. Um, made a little bit of money and then lost it and said no, it's not for me. These stocks have really got, were depressed even before the pandemic and now they can't sell anything. So um, uh, so the answer is uh, that was one of my poor investments. Um. <laughs> and they didn't even give me a sample of the product. Um, one other course that we that it's becoming a, a, a thing a lot of states have to take. One, it's called trafficking. I don't think it means passing a red light. So I'm always in charge of content. So Gretchen, if you have somebody that can do a lecture on trafficking, that'd be great. I know Florida, Texas, and a few other states are requiring that uh, for licensure. So uh, that's a new course. Talking about like, human trafficking, right? Yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> okay. I'll get on it. So it, it, they're requiring it, and uh, if you put it in, it, they they will come. And I, it's something I guess I, I should learn something about. It. We never did traffic in our office, at least not very much. We just had some. Um, I won't say anything. <laughs> I put my foot in my mouth. Um, so yeah. Um, 
Cat, uh, there's, they're working on that problem. It should be solved. But, um, Adam, they, um, the, the transcripts are coming through as live interactive for everybody now. And uh, it has to do with this, the software was hard-coded. This is what Kat said. Um, we had to hard-code the system for the last event, just doing the same for this one. Um, she's on it, and it should be rectified way, you know, hopefully in the next couple of minutes. So okay. some people don't get freaked. Okay. Did somebody respond to this person that couldn't uh, hear in room four? I did. Yeah. yeah. Again, if you can't hear, usually that's a problem on your end, not our end. Um, because if you can see video but you can't hear, that just usually means the sound's not up on your computer. Or you could just reload your browser and see what happens again. So this is almost almost never is it a problem with us if you can't hear something, if the video's that's coming correct. through. Some speakers do speak a little bit lower, um, and this one does, but it's perfectly hearable on my end. I checked it myself, so you're right, it's the, uh, it's the user end. Yep. Yeah. Some things definitely, you know, are on our end, and then other things, yes, like that, you definitely want to check out, your, you know, if your sound's turned up or not. Um, cool. One thing I want to show you guys, since we have a minute here, um, I mentioned before this idea of putting the instruments outside. Now, now Gre Gretchen, Steve, and Paul, you probably won't be able to hear this video because your sound's turned down. But I want to show everyone. Everyone at home will be able to hear this and watch. This is, a, I think it's like a two-minute long video of people taking their equipment outside and doing a drive-through um, and having patients wait in their car. And then they call when, the, when the, the sort of drive-up experience is ready, and the patient just drives up to get their exam. So I just want to show people this for a second. So you might be able to see it on your screen, but obviously if the sound's turned down, you won't be able to hear it. But here we go. Hi, it's Christine with Bold Vision. We are so excited to begin offering curbside drive-through exams for our patients. I'm just going to walk you through the process really quick. As you can see, I am wearing a mask. Due to current CDC recommendations, we ask that if possible, you wear a paper or cloth mask when you arrive for the drive-through, just to ensure yours and our staff's protection. So let's pull through the process. Hello. Hi, I'm Barbara. I'm a receptionist with Vol Vision. This is the station where I would check to see if you've called ahead and given us your information and insurance and just move ahead to the next station. Okay, thanks, Barbara. You're welcome. All right, so we're gonna pull through our drive-through area. Hello. Hi, Christine. Okay, well, I'm Deanne. I'm one of the other technicians here at Volt Vision. At this first station, what I'm gonna be doing is just collecting some medical history from you, uh, any visual complaints, problems that are bringing you in to see us today. Once we've got your chart complete, I'll have you pull forward where you're going to be meeting with some of our other technicians curbside to get a vision and some other tests. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> so we pull forward and we're just going to step out of the vehicle. It's only to the curb. There are no other patients present. And if we have a patient who needs assistance, the team will be happy to assist them exiting the vehicle and, um, and crossing over to the curbside. All of our technicians have masks and gloves on and sanitize each and every surface in between all of our patients. And then you'll step on over here and we'll take this instrument right here and then we'll check your eye pressure with this instrument right here. Right, everything is sanitary. We will be wiping everything down. And we also have, of course, hand sanitizer. <laughs> everything is sterile. Perfect. All right, our last step is we're going to take a fundus photo. It's very simple, chin and forehead in there. This just lets our doctor review the health of the back of the eye, rules out any diseases. Um, it's equivalent to being dilated, so they get a good view. And that's Wonderful. it. Perfect. So at this point, I would get back in my vehicle, and one of our doctors will call, text, or telemedicine my results. And that's it. It's as easy and simple and safe as that. Thanks so much. We'll hope to see you soon. Okay. Now... How nervous did that make you seeing that with the, the Claris sitting there <laughs> on that rickety table outside? 
Um, but it was a really interesting thing, you know, showing people how you can do social distancing uh, and keep patients apart from each other in the pretest area and do it in a really efficient way. And I don't know if you caught, uh, you know, you could see the cables running all the way back inside to the office as well. So they were also transmitting data straight into the office. So that's one really sort of good example of social distancing that I thought was really interesting. And that came from the Zeiss conference that we did a couple of weeks ago. So I, I think know. that is really, really cool and really innovative. And obviously you can do that only in a warmer climate. Um, and you also don't want it to be too warm. And it poured rain here late yesterday afternoon. So depending upon where you're located, your weather might be a problem. But I think that is a very innovative way to keep patients and staff uh, socially distant. Bravo. Yep. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting, too. And I kind of wonder, though, you know, are other practices going to try to implement this? It obviously works better if you have newer equipment that can do, you know, can, can one, be easily moved, but two, can transmit the data easily. So you just saw a bunch of Zeiss devices there that can do it. There are others as well. And we're going to be, you know, speaking to, to different people at different companies talking about that too, how their equipment can be used to do more of this remote stuff, uh, which I found really, really interesting. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see what sort of creativity optometric practices use once uh, they're opening now how they've changed their practice and sharing what they're doing that makes a difference. And what, what comes to mind, this is totally off this, this particular subject, uh, the, uh, the neighboring county uh, where, where we live in Oregon opened up and the, my wife's manicurist and pedicurist opened up for business. And these were very, very progressive uh, Asian folks from Vietnam that always wore masks. In advance. Yep. Well, I I already shared my opinion with mom that she's nuts. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, if anyway, she, she 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 did I, she did go. Oh God. And during the during the three months that that store was closed, talking about creativity, they remodeled the whole place, mm -hmm. and they put plexiglass between each chair that they they used to people to give the pedicures and manicures. So it's alternate chairs uh, in in there, but they're they're totally cut off from for the other co customers, and they did the, the normal temperature check and and re, you know the release that they would give, but they are busy and they're probably the busiest pedicurist and manicurist in in this particular area. So they've always been progressive, but they did do something that that's unique, and uh, I hope optometrists come up with some ideas that they'll share what's working and what hasn't been working. So it should be very interesting in the next month or two. Absolutely. And you know, you're seeing the equipment vendors responding kind of similar. You mentioned the plexiglass. I can put it up on the screen right now. You can see what Zeiss has been doing, right, where they're giving away these shields for the slit lamp. Um, this is a, a thing that is becoming very common. You're starting to see this sort of barrier solutions for equipment. Uh, and so I think this is going to become the new normal very rapidly. And I'm really curious. I know we're going to be talking to Jeff Sancino in a few minutes, I think. Um, yep. And I'm kind of curious as to what he's been doing, right? So, you know, Jeff is a contact lens specialist. He, he you know, works with, with um, patients who have medically necessary contact lenses a lot of the time. So I have a feeling that during the shutdown, he's been working at least somewhat and probably seeing emergencies too. And I'm really curious to know what he's been doing, because contact lenses, right, you really do kind of have to get up close. Um, so I'm curious as to what he's been doing over these past several months. It will be interesting to hear. Um, yeah, because, I mean, in, with the, uh, the brush shields for the slit lamp, that's helpful, and the masks are helpful. But um, when you're looking at the cornea, you're right in their face, and if you are applying or removing contact lenses for a patient you're you're right in the patient's face so yeah it's it's a bit more challenging with that yep so yeah so we'll, we'll talk to him about that and see what he's doing and then after we speak to him we're going to be speaking to the folks at luno uh, as well and a, and a doctor who works with some of their products again talking about social distancing and, and what they're doing uh, to make things a little bit easier um, so that should be a little bit fun as well. And then after that, I think we're going to be talking to Ben, probably, uh, Ben Casella, see how his reopening's going, <laughs> yeah. for, for better or worse, right? Um, 
So he's always you know I'm going to be I'm going to be very interested uh, as far as uh, what optometrists are going to be doing as far as fees are concerned. Uh, many of them are going to be working at 50 percent efficiency for the next couple of months at least. Uh, and the question is how how do you ma manage to uh, pay your bills and and pay staff etc. when you're uh, when you're seeing half the number of patients, right? Uh, one obvious way is well, to raise your fees, but what do you do? You get you a PPP know. loan, yeah, or a grant that what everybody's hoping it will be. Yep, but you know, then there's the the alternative, right? So you can actually start bringing in perhaps some different products into your office or different services, right? I think we saw Craig Thomas talking about that a little bit. Um, you know, moving into to different fields like he was doing something with allergy right for his dry eye patients so trying to sort of or, or you maximize what you have and expand hours that's the other way obviously you can uh, you can just uh, have many more hours to start to seven or eight in the morning and go until six seven at night right uh, so with the uh, so you can you can do it that way but it'll be interesting to see what alternatives that are done yeah the other factor, Paul, is that um, people are out of work and people have less money and raising your fees might be a, a disaster for that uh, segment of the population, which is a, a good deal of it. Uh, right. you're, um, going to more hours and, and adding more services, and you have to realize that um, a great many people are seen by vision care plans and raising your fees does not do anything there, but adding services which are extra and above um, especially medical services with the vision care plans provided is the way to go. Yep. And I kind of wonder, what are people doing around contact lenses at this point? You know, and, and the companies would obviously have this data. Are people really stretching it out with their supply lenses or are they dutifully reordering? Well, when I talked to Ben the other day, he said that he is um, making some deliveries of contact lenses for patients who need them. And I think doctors are just like with um, Arbo, giving a little bit of a relaxation with COPE rules. Um, I think a lot of doctors are filling scripts for patients, even if they do need an exam, just because it's been hard to get one. So I don't wanna speak for Ben or any other doctor, but I would suspect that Doctors would prefer if patients would call and say, may I get another uh, three months supply as opposed to stretching out wearing what they currently have just because new lenses are cleaner lenses and they're healthier for the eye as opposed to stretching it out. Right. Next so the question, the question is, are you proactive doing it? Would, would, you, would, would the average uh, optometrist communicate with their patients and say, hey, here's the problem it's difficult for you to come in, but here's what what we can do for you. Or do you well, have to wait until point. the patients call them and we're called, we're, we're still call 1-800-CONTACTS. Correct, and Paul. From what get just, them. When this was occurring, the practices that were proactive had uh, systems to e-blast patients and kept in contact with them, supply contact lenses via diagnostics or, or supplies. Those practices are going to thrive. The others who didn't do it properly, um, people went to the online services or other sources of contact lenses, and they might never come back, realizing they can get the same product and maybe less expensively. So, like always, the good manager of practice is going to survive, and the bad one is going to curse the ground that he walks or he so she walks on, and it's their own fault. Yep. Yep. I'll get off my um, soapbox. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, you know, speaking of extending hours, it, it takes me back to some horrible memories. Adam might remember one one year I came back from a very tough lecture thing, and it was an airline strike. I come to the door. I was at about 50 patients scheduled the next morning, and Adam comes to the door and says, Dad, take it easy. Take it easy. Catch your breath. I got good news and bad news. And I said, what's the good news, Adam? He said, you can sleep late tomorrow. I said, well, what's the bad news? Your office burned down. Yep. <laughs> That's <laughs> really so, how you phrased so it, Adam. <laughs> yeah, you know, Adam was a teenager. And, 
and, and the, yeah, the office burned down. Uh, we had a, a short circuit and, and the old uh, Bausch & Lohm aseptor units, I don't know if the older people could remember those, that's where you heated the lenses overnight and it, it didn't turn off and we had an electrical fire and our brand new office, it was six months old, burned down. And uh, so what do you do with a, a major practice with uh, lots of associates and staff? Luckily for me, I had a wife that does makes my life very easy and she's an interior designer and we were able to get a an office right adjacent to the office where we were in an office building with the fire you know, had only one one quarter of the space. We went down from 4,000 square feet down to under 1,000 square feet and only a single lane to do eye exams. We didn't lay off anyone and we just had only one optometrist working at any given time, but we started uh, working from seven in the morning to seven at night, Monday through Saturday. And amazingly enough, our, our gross went down a little bit. However, our uh, rent went down as well, and we had insurance, had business interruption insurance. So if anything, our bottom line was almost equal, and it took almost six months to rebuild the practice because the city of New York would not allow us to start because they thought we intentionally burned down the office. There were you know, some wait, people wait, that were in trouble. They thought you burned it down on purpose? Oh, oh, you know, New York City, absolutely. There were always fires when you, it was tough business. Uh, tough business, you, you know, there were fires. Uh, oh, we, we lost the Bronx office to, to fire because we were, uh, our, our next door neighbor on the same floor was a beauty school. And this was in the Bronx. And the beauty schools, uh, all your veterans could get the, uh, you know, the beauty uh, education but there was a beauty school on the opposite side of the street and they were both mafia run <laughs> and the one next to us burned down and and of course we we lost that office luckily we, you we, were we, accused we, of arson we well. yes we, we were accused of arson in in manhattan you know they they thought that uh, we we burned it down intentionally and we tried to show them uh, you know just, just the the volume of patients we were seeing it was a uh, you know, they, these were the days of the, the heyday, 1989, uh, contact lens heyday. We were as busy as anything. So it had nothing to do with it, but it took a while until we could get the insurance companies to, to pay, uh, to, to agree, and then we could start uh, redoing the office. And we, we worked that way in a, in a tiny office for many, many months. So for those of you that are afraid of expanding your hours, I can tell you it, people will come. Build it and they'll, they'll come. Uh, yep. They're doing off hours. All right. Well, okay. I said my with, took the trip down memory lane. Well, That's with, enough. <laughs> with, with, with that, uh, we have Jeff Sonsino coming up. I don't know if he's here yet. Jeff, are you here? I'm here, guys. Did you hear that ridiculous story? <laughs> I, I just caught the tail end of it. I, I, I caught Paul giving the, he, the always wise um, long term perspective of it. Yes. Paul who, Paul, who totally didn't burn down his own office. <laughs> totally. Um, so so how, how's it going, Jeff? How's everything going for you out there? Uh, everything's going great, guys. Thanks for having me on the show. Hey, Jeff. How's See? it going? Stretch? Uh, Hi, Jeff. No Be rest here. for the wicked. <laughs> I'm sorry? I said no rest for the wicked. Oh, no rest. That's that's for sure. Yeah, Jeff, we yeah, everyone, we need your wise counsel during we, these. Yeah, we tell we, us what's happening in in the real world of optometry. That's right, Jeff. Have you actually been seeing patients? What's been going on? Uh, so yeah, I, I've been seeing patients now for a month. Um, Tennessee opened up probably sooner than most of other states, um, and it's you know it's been a very interesting, very interesting time. Um, Immediately when we opened up, uh, we were super busy. There was a lot of pent up demand. Um, we were trying to space patients accordingly. Um, you know, we were scheduling one patient every half hour for each of our doctors. And um, what was interesting in the very beginning is we, we were just wall to wall patients. And then after about two weeks of doing that, 
um, we started seeing a lot of no-shows. So our no-show rate kind of skyrocketed. Um, and, you know, we did our best to kind of backfill the schedule as best as we could. But still, you know, we were, we were not being as productive as we normally are. And then um, this, this week um, marks, it, it was one month, and we became, I mean, we were, we were seeing less no-shows as, as people started getting more confidence to go out and, and to kind of be in the real world. But now the issue that we're facing is my practice, which is basically all complex contact lens, um, is booked out for a month. But my associates and my wife, my partner, um, they it's been the least they've been booked out since we've been in practice for 18 years. I mean, it's it's kind of scary. Hmm. Um, our, 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 we still have appointments available within one week. So like five days away, which we've always been a practice that has been booked out for a minimum of two weeks. So that's concerning us a little bit. Um, and, I, you know, I've talked to some people around the country who are experiencing similar, similar experiences. What have you guys heard? Yeah, it's actually interesting. I've seen it on OD Wire as well, where people were talking about that too, the pent up demand in the beginning, followed by just a mass of no shows, which I find really fascinating. Mm. Um, so I wonder if it is mm -hmm. the fear factor that people have about actually, you know, going out again. Yeah, I mean, That's look, you know, I... go ahead, Gretch. Sorry. Um, I, uh, I was talking with Ben Casella and he's got patients scheduled every hour and he would like to schedule them a little more frequently but he says he knows that as soon as he does that that somebody's going to show up early somebody's going to show up late somebody's going to show up with somebody else with them and it's i think once people get started with opening that they kind of are chomping at the bit to kind of move it along faster not in an unsafe way but I know we can do more. I know we can do things better, but it's, it's, yeah, it, it's, it, it just public opinion is swaying that some people think you're opening too soon. Some people think you're not opening soon enough. And it's, it's really, really tough. Well, I think, you know, from the, the, from the main patient, differentiator. From, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I was going to say the main differentiator is what state you're in and what, what your guidelines have been. Because, you know, I'm in Tennessee. And so right now, restaurants are open at full capacity. I mean, you go out and life has resumed nearly to, to, to normal, with the exception of large gatherings like sporting events and, and concerts in Nashville. So to me, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever to restrict yourself past what the rest of society is doing, right? So if I go into a restaurant and everyone around me is not wearing masks because who's going to wear a mask in, you know, in a restaurant, then to me, it makes no sense to restrict my practice to one patient an hour. But, you know, Ben may be practicing in a different state with different opening requirements. Right. So right. I, I really think it depends where you are and, and what the situation is. I mean, in Tennessee, we, we have in Nashville itself, we had 50 total deaths and we're in a, a, a city of 1.4 million. Right. So, you know, that, that is a lower death rate than uh, stabbings, you, you know? Right. Yeah. So there's a relative risk argument there depending on where you are. Right. And it's obviously different if you're in Midtown Manhattan from where you are. Of right. course. Yeah. Of so course. It's all, it, it really depends yeah. on where you are. Yeah, from a patient's point of view, since I'm an old guy, I will not visit. I'm not going to see the barber, and I'm not going to see my dermatologist for just fifteen six months checkup, and any any other routine type of health care, or, or dentist. I'm not going to get my teeth cleaned, which I usually do every six months, for a long, long time, because the benefit of my, my having clean teeth versus with uh, catching uh, COVID nineteen when you're, you know, you're an older person, it's just not worth it. So 
So I'm just wondering how many of your Medicare type of people will be coming in? So you won't go to the yeah. dentist, Paul, but your wife will go to the nail salon. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Because that, her, her nails, you know, the, her nails were growing out and the pedicure was needed. And yeah. Adam had a nervous breakdown when he found out. <laughs> I uh, but the, my wife, my wife insists that I put my, the plastic gloves on each time I take out the garbage, though, because that that's important to, to watch. So yeah. it's a little de, a little debate we're having. <laughs> I, I'll tell you guys one thing is definitely clear, though. I mean, we are already seeing the effects of patients wanting to purchase lower cost things. I mean, I think there's definitely a, a a sentiment of fear over the economy. And so we are shifting a lot of our kind of normal day to day. Look, you know, we're not stopping to selling, um, uh, you know, our, our luxury uh, spectacle brands. You know, if patients want that, we certainly offer that. But we are definitely making modifications to other aspects of our business to, to be able to owe, offer more affordable um devices right that that is an interesting issue too although you have a specialty contact lens practice right so obviously there are some patients that you see who absolutely need what you have um so for those patients i would imagine like your scleral patients that's is that pretty much staying the same yeah that's staying the same i mean look when, when we're talking about specialty stuff typically we're talking about payers other payers who are responsible for it so you know, if, if you have keratoconus and you are wearing sclerals, there's no compromising. But, you know, if, if you are a soft contact lens wearer, then we are definitely pushing iris more than we're pushing, you know, the big four brands that um, honestly just are, are not price competitive. I don't know if you guys heard this, but um, we've heard tons of reports of doctors um, finding out that online, the, the big four have been hard at work with online resellers and have begun offering, um, uh, offering lenses to consumers at costs lower than what the doctor can buy those lenses from the individual company. Have yeah. you heard reports of that? I haven't. That doesn't mean it's not happening, though. Yeah, we, we're aware of at least four new online resellers where patients can purchase big four lenses for less than what optometrists can buy them for. Wow. So, we, we, you know, the, the industry has not been quiet during this. 1-800 has capitalized like crazy. Um, An inside source tells me that they, their revenue is up 125% during COVID. Wow. So they are hard at work. Hmm. It's not surprising. I mean, look, you know, 1-800-CONTACTS offers something that's convenient, right? And in a time like this, where people are afraid to go and get an in-person exam or, or walk into their doctor and buy lenses, of course, that convenience is going to supersede. But as times get back to normal, the question is, what is consumer sentiment going to be? Right. And so you mentioned Iris before. We have to let you get this in, get this plug in, because people might not even know about Iris. Uh, you know, with, with all the cancellations of all the in-person conferences, it's, uh, I'm sure it's a little bit more difficult to get your message out. I remember, where the heck was it? Was it an expo? You guys had a gigantic booth and there was a lot of fun stuff going on around you, but I'm going to put this up so people can see. Maybe you can give us a little bit of background about what's been going on with you guys. Yeah, so if you're unfamiliar, Iris is a contact lens uh, company that I co-founded with an expert in business strategy and um, kind of business management. And we got together and realized that there is a major problem in our industry with just the race to the bottom with commodity contact lenses. And so we brought to market a brand new lens. This is not a copycat lens of any kind. It's a brand new hydrogel daily disposable. It competes at the same level as the top lenses in our industry. 
And so we've routinely taken patients out of Daily's Total One, Oasis One Day, One Day Moist, um, Aqua Comfort Plus. Um, we designed the lens to be super comfortable, so it's made out of a material that has a wonderful DK for a hydrogel. It's, it's the DK over T is 31.25, and um, it has the lowest modulus in the industry, which means it's the softest lens on the industry. In the industry, um, the lens resists drying uh, significantly end of day, so patients are able to sub out of what we formerly thought were premium lenses that may cost, you know, eight, nine hundred dollars and go into the iris lens, which is to the consumer four hundred fifty nine dollars. And one of the major keys to this is that we always respect the doctor patient relationship. So there's a massive margin on this lens. So with a four hundred fifty nine dollar retail lens, there's a two hundred dollar doctor margin. The, we provide conveniences similar to 1-800-CONTACTS. So the patient can purchase, after being fit by one of the Iris Network doctors, the patient can be fit, I, I'm sorry, the patient can purchase their lenses online directly through Iris, okay? But the difference here is that when the patient does that, the doctor who prescribed it realizes the same margin as if the lens was purchased in their office. So. At $200 on a $459 lens, that's a 45% margin, which there's nothing like that in our industry. So the point to Iris is it's really good for the patients because they're getting a top quality lens that's really inexpensive, a third to half of what they're paying right now, and it's really good to the doctors. So the doctors always profit and, um, you know, they're, they're, they're always kept in the mix, Okay. The people that it harms, that, that this disrupts, are the big four and the online middlemen. So they're not profiting at, a, profiting at all from this, and it just stays with private practice, which I know appeals to Paul. <laughs> the big question is, Jeff, is your life insurance policy paid up? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's an interesting. We, we, we've raised some eyebrows. Yeah. There, there's no doubt about that. You know, we, we are definitely disrupting this industry, but we're disrupting it in the right way. We're disrupting it so that the doctor-patient relationship is always intact, right. which is not currently what's going on with the industry. Yep. And so what's, uh, what's interesting, too, is you're encouraging people to order online from you guys, so there's no inventory issues, I would guess, in the doctor's office, right? So you're freeing up a little more space that way, too. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. We, you know... We, we didn't think there was going to be a need for inventory in a doctor's office, but some of our top producers um, are interested in an inventory. And so we've we created a way for doctors to get inventory. Hmm. I guess they like the idea of when the patient leaves, handing them boxes. Right. Right. And it, it's proven to be very successful. I mean, those offices are much more successful than the non-inventory offices. I'll tell you what's cool is seeing what actually happens with our industry, you know, seeing how individual doctors, their prescription um, habits and how much they're selling versus, you know, other offices, we can definitely tell there is a huge divide between doctors that know how to put lenses in patients' hands and those who don't. And it's, it, it, it's a stark difference. I mean, it, it kind of goes to show that, you know, as doctors, we are not taught anything about sales. But seeing the data on the other side, on the contact lens side, man, like there, there is a stark difference between offices. I mean, and how, the, how they function and, and how effective they are at patient communication. Yep. And speaking of communications, right, there's the other half of this business as well. There's the contact lens side, but looking at your site, there's another piece. You have sort of an IT thing going on here for, um, it looks like basically where, where if you have no-shows, you can sort of fill the gaps in a person's schedule. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have no qualms about saying that Iris is the most technologically advanced um, contact lens company. We don't have a national sales force. That's one reason why the lens is so inexpensive. And we do everything digitally. We have a 
huge web development um, component uh, to the company. If anyone has seen some of the stuff we've produced, you know, we are marketing this lens directly to consumers. So, you know, doctors can prescribe it, but the, the other part of that equation is we're actively um, reaching consumers using social media and even some, I mean, we do like television ads in the markets where, where, where we have doctors uh, with the fit set, uh, sorry, the diagnostic set. Um, and so we're kind of pulling patients in. And so what happens is when a patient comes to us and says, we want to be fit with the iris lens, where do we go? We, we actively push those patients into the offices of the doctors who have the fit sets. And so now we have doctors with fit sets in, in 50 states. Um, and so a patient gets online and says, okay, I want to see Dr. Farkas uh, Tuesday at 10 o'clock, right? And so we ping the office and say, hey, we have a patient that wants to be fit in the iris daily. Uh, they want to be seen at 10 o'clock on Tuesday. Can you see them? And if Dr. Farkas says, no, I, I, I can't see them, then we go to the next doctor that is closest to them and get them in. And so doctors are kind of highly incentivized to see these patients who are coming in going to be asking for the iris lens. Right. And so I'm looking on your site right now. Where can doctors sign up uh, for the services? Basically, are you guys national now? It's, it's, is it everywhere? Yeah, we're everywhere. We have, um, we have <coughs> over 780 practices. Um, we have a wait list of, right now, I think it's 250 practices um, to get the fit set. We're, we've grown faster than we can possibly supply and so we're, we're trying to produce lenses as fast as we humanly possibly can uh, to satisfy that demand I mean look the, the response in private practice has been nothing short of incredible like I, you know there's always this this undertone in optometry of optometrists being you know complainers but not being doers I'm here to tell you that is absolutely false when you offer optometrists something that they truly benefit from and that their patients truly benefit from, they answer the call. And that's exactly what we've found. I mean, we found, and I should say that we're offering this only to private practice optometrists, uh, OD, MD practices, and optometrists in academic practice. Um, if you're practicing with the aid of, you know, a corporate location, um, then you have that support. But IRIS supports the doctors in private practice who are the ones who are the most struggling. Right. Um, and, you know, the, like our, our colleagues have answered this call. They, they've said in the market, this is something that we want. And it shows with our numbers. You know, there's something like 44,000 private practices in America. And we need less than a thousand to be like a highly functioning, um, profitable business. And so we're not, you know, we're not out there trying to get everyone. We're trying to get the best practices. Right. And so, and Jeff, I, I have a, I have a question, Jeff. Uh, yeah. If it's not confidential, where are the, uh, where are the lenses manufactured? What country? Yeah, the lenses are manufactured in Taiwan, and it's it's actually a very good question, Paul, because in the past, what's happened? was people would try to go to Asian manufacturers and say, hey, make me a lens, hey, make me a lens. In fact, Asian manufacturers get approached probably on a monthly basis from Tom, Dick, and Harry company wanting to make them a lens, okay? The Asian manufacturers have wised up and they've figured out that like, if they contract with a Hubble, that business model doesn't really work in America. And so they're very selective about who they partner with and so the only reason that we were able to be successful is I had a major industry contact uh, in, in Taiwan that said, yes, if, if Sansino wants to get this done with his partners, they will be able to get it done ahead of other groups. 
Now, here's the here's the big um, the big thing though. So you say, well, what's the quality difference of a lens made in Taiwan versus a lens made by the Big Four? And it, 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 it there there is a difference. There is no doubt. There's a difference. There there are some Asian lenses on the market now that have poor quality. Okay, what we did is we forced the manufacturer to manufacture of the, at the standards of American companies. And so we basically redid their manufacturing techniques. And the, the concrete example, or one of the concrete examples for this, is that how you cross-link a, a hydrogel material, um, we use the same cross-linking technique as the big four. And we are now the only Asian manufacturer that uses that same cross-linking technique. Hmm. Right. So the quality is not yeah. really... The, the Very quality. important information. Yeah. And in fact, with, yeah. with everything that's been going on, has the supply been okay? You know, have you been able to, to get product back in the United States? Yeah, we, we've had zero supply problems with Taiwan. Taiwan has been pretty immune to everything that's going on. They, they are a country that immediately when this broke, they closed their border. So, you know, they have ties with China. They closed the border with China. Hmm. So even, even people who were Taiwanese who were working over in China couldn't get back into the country. So there were almost no cases in Taiwan. So we've had absolutely zero supply chain problems. Wow. That's great. Cool. All right. Well, we're Jeff. Yeah. Oh, I had a quick question. You said a few minutes ago that you want to work only with the best practices. How do you determine that? Yep. So every practice uh, that applies to be in the IRIS network is vetted. And we use a bunch of different metrics to look at this. First, they have to, sit, they, they have to be who they say they are. You can't imagine the, the kinds of things that we've seen. We've seen reps from the big four try to infiltrate our network. We've seen optometrists from 1-800-CONTACTS try to infiltrate. We've had corporate people from Hubble try to infiltrate this. I mean, it is literally, it's, it's like when you hear about like corporate espionage, I'm here to tell you that stuff is real. Okay, the, the, the prying eyes are, are real. And so we also look at um, what has, I mean, some people would think that this is an unfortunate uh, turn of business, but it is now the new reality of the optometrist's life that Google reviews are the new currency of a modern practice. And so we look heavily at Google reviews. And the reason we do that is because when a, a patient is using our patient finder, sorry, our doctor finder, to, to find a doctor to fit them in, in Iris Daily, um, they're looking at the Google reviews of that practice. Well, if we have, uh, you know, a, a practice with 300 reviews with an average of 4.9, the patient's going to choose that practice. We are also... We're, we're marketing to the patients that we're, we're getting the best doctors. And so, you know, you can't really market that to, patient, to patients and then have doctors with 2.2 Google stars in your network, right? So we've had to unfortunately decline a lot of really good docs just who haven't paid attention to their Google ratings. Um, and then, of course, it has to be a, a doctor in private practice. And that, that's kind of our, our definition. Gotcha. Thank you. Cool. And that's, that's a good tip for everyone to remember that if you're not, you know, taking care of your business online, take a really close look at what's going on. You know, go to Google Maps, pull your practice up and see what you actually see, you know, when somebody pulls you up um, and try to do whatever you can, you know, to, to make it better, to get at least four stars, but, you know, hopefully more. It's easy, Adam. I mean, basically all you do, if you notice that some, you're getting a few bad Google reviews, is you take the patients who are so loyal to you and who love you, and you just ask them, hey, can you put a Google review? And they'll do it. Yep. It balances out the bad ones. Yep, absolutely. 
All right. Well, it looks like we're just about out of time. You have anything else you uh, want to share with us? And uh, you have a, you have a talk actually at this thing, right? So uh, you're giving a talk I know. about disruption. I know. I got to get off and moderate. <laughs> but no, I, I I appreciate you guys giving me the stage. I mean, I think what you do with, with CUI is just so timely and topical. And doctors who are not taking advantage of this are somewhat crazy because we all need CE. Yep. And, uh, you know, hopefully by next year, things will nor normalize a little bit and we can all get together in person again, because it is kind of a weird experience not being able to see all you guys in person. Yeah, it is very weird. But hopefully, look, Academy is still going on. So hopefully we'll see everyone in Nashville and Academy in a few months. Um, I've talked to a lot of our colleagues who are still coming for that event. Um, yeah, and it's going to be a good one. We're going we're gonna to give it the, the Nashville flair. Excellent. Excellent. Well I, well, I hope to see you there. All right. So awesome. I guess, thanks, guys. Yeah, well, thanks. Thanks, thanks Jeff. Phil. It's always great to talk to you. Great hearing your voices. Catch you later. <laughs> see you, Jeff. Bye. Good job, Jeff. Oh. Hey, Adam, before we jump into our, I know we have a guest coming, mm -hmm. but um, it is one o'clock Eastern. All right. So Jeff has a, a class talking about optometry in the age of disruptors when patients are harmed. Mm -hmm. uh, Clark Chang and Brandon Ayers are going with their second lecture on cross-linking, uh, the cross-linking revolution, redefining keratoconus care. And Ben Casella is going into his second hour of narcotics. And Michael Trattini is talking about ocular and orbit trauma. So time to jump into uh, the third class of the day, people. All right. Good stuff. Yeah. So hopefully people are all getting on. I'm, I'm not seeing too many problems here, which is good. You know, obviously we all look and Steve is patrolling stuff and making sure that everything's okay. So I think, I think we're in pretty good shape right now. One thing, Adam, that people have to realize, mm -hmm. if they've taken the course live interactive in February and they're trying to take the same course live again, you can't do that. Cope won't allow it. Um, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So if, if you've taken the class already, Cope remembers you when they were there first. Right. You can't. You can't take it again. <laughs> is the point, right? So you know, try. We have a million different classes to choose from here, right? We have 63 hours, so take something different. You can't take the same class twice. Cope won't honor it. And in <clears> fact, if when we submit the course again to them, they're going to be like, "What's going on here? You've already taken an interactive. You can't take it live, and you can't certainly can't take it on demand again." because uh, they want to make sure you're taking different classes. So, yeah, that's something to look out for. Okay, I'll right. see. Excellent. So let me let me spin this up here. We're going to have uh, some, some guests here, uh, and, and I want to see if they're here right now. So I'm turning my head I over here to see. You, so let's see. So because it's 10 o'clock Pacific time, 1 o'clock Eastern time, and we'll see. So Jordan, Melissa, are you there? Hi, this is Melissa. Hey, Melissa, how's it going? Hi, Melissa. I'm good. How are you today? Doing well, doing well. And I guess, uh, Jordan, are you there yet? I am. I'm here. Ah, oh, great. How's it going? Very well. I'm, I'm in between patients as we speak. Oh, my gosh. So we'll make it quick. <laughs> Excellent timing. <laughs> well, yeah, so it was perfect. I, I was planning to do this, right? <laughs> right. So, yeah. So, so, yeah. So, we'll be very fast for you then. So, the, the question is, you know, the reason that we had you here today, obviously, Luno is, is uh, one of the sponsors of the conference, and we're really appreciative of that. But, Jordan, I got to hear, you know, you're in the Chicagoland area, and I'm kind of curious, what's your experience yep. been with sort of opening back up and trying to get going again? Yeah, absolutely. Well, we, we kind of, I would say, we've been in a slow open as, as everybody since May 2nd. So, we were still in the midst of our, you know, state mandated shutdown, if you will, when we started kind of easing back into patient care. Um, during our full shutdown, we had basically just kind of revamped to do telehealth, um, you know, created new websites. I mean, you know, basically everything that everybody had to do to, to be the new, the quote unquote new normal. As of May 2nd, I came into the office and we had to change, you know, a lot of our protocols. The main thing that we did was, you know, spacing out our, our patients, um, hence the reason I have time in between patients to, to speak on the phone right now. Um, I would say the, the main things, you know, that we have done is trying to make everything, again, as touchless as possible. We're, we're a small, you know, kind of private practice with multiple locations, but when I'm here and seeing patients, 
I'm gloved up, masked up, the room has been sandy wiped, everything is ready for the patient. And I'm basically personally meeting my patients at the door after they call the office to say, is it safe to come in? Meeting them with hand sanitizer, I'm opening the door for them so they don't have to touch anything, walking straight into the exam room, you know, literally trying to keep them from touching as many surfaces, not only to protect myself and the, the other patients coming through the door, but I think just to give patients that, that sense of safety and security that like, hey, these people are looking out for me too. You know, if, if I'm treating every patient that way, they know that the person who's here before them and the person who's after them is going to have a safe and, you know, comfortable experience with everything. Right. And actually, I pulled up your website just to show everyone when you pull up your website, you get the COVID warning there and, and you know, giving people advice on what to do. So very obviously, from the moment they come to your website, yep. they're engaged and thinking about it. Absolutely. We, when we have a questionnaire that's going out, I mean, we're, we're emailing every single person before with a questionnaire, you know, kind of the standard stock questionnaire of, you know, risk factors and everything else. And we're trying to schedule our, set our schedule. And I know I had some conversation with a couple of dentist patients of mine, like, hey, what are we doing? You know, why are we asking people if they're over 60 or 65? You know, are you still going to see them? And, and in our practice, we absolutely are. But what we're doing is we're trying to make our schedule such that the higher risk patients are the first of the day. So, you know, our slots, we are strategically placing, you know, an 80 year old diabetic with COPD, they're not going to be middle of the day after there's already been, you know, a higher risk of, you know, an asymptomatic person coming through the door. That person's going to get a fresh office right off the jump to keep it as safe as possible for, for them. You know, and then again, working backwards from that. And, and I'm reaching out to these patients again personally as well, calling them if something on the questionnaire is flagged at home and saying, hey, listen, you know, what do you deem urgent? Do you feel like you want to come in? I'm more than willing to do all these extra steps for you. But if it is something that we can do and we can push this off, you know, another month or two, do you want to? To give them that opportunity and make them aware, you know, again, I feel it's our job as the, the healthcare professional to to let people know, you know, what the real risks are out there and what we're doing to try to help them. Yep, absolutely. And, you know, one other thing that we've been talking about a lot this morning is this idea of using technology to try to at least minimize your odds of getting infected, right? So keeping people at a distance. We actually showed a video before of people who dragged their entire pretest area into the parking lot <laughs> and have people drive up, yeah. which is sort of an interesting solution. What are you, you doing yep. technology-wise in your office to try to sort of minimize the contact as best you can? So, so for us, again, you know, our, our office is such that I don't have a pretest area. I, I personally do everything. And we have, you know, the, the VX bot for our visionics with our wavefront topography, everything else right there. I have a retinal camera right here. Again, with those, the, the beauty of the automation, right, is I can hit the button, get it started, and step back. I'm doing everything with door open, um, right. you know, to try to, again, keep the airflow moving through. We do have the beautiful and fantastic digital foropter, the VX65 as well, which has probably been the, the, the saving grace of everything because the, you know, the high contact time where you're literally ear to ear reaching over someone's mouth type of thing. I am sitting in the door 9, 10, 15 feet away running it through a tablet, which is absolutely fantastic, you know, from that. And it gives the patient the opportunity, you know, again, to know that like, hey, this person's not breathing on I me. Mean, we don't have to worry about you know, holding our breaths or any of those kind of things from a manual four opter standpoint. Right, and I just put up on the screen for people who are unfamiliar with the VX65, what it is and how it looks like. It looks just very much typically like an Android tablet, it looks like to me. Uh, so is that how it works? Is the whole UI just sort of encapsulated uh, in the tablet? Absolutely, so I have, I have a Samsung tablet right here, you know, running an Android software and it literally, you, you, you can take it and drag it and move it where you want to. So from that standpoint, you know, again, I don't have to be tethered to anything. I could, I could move myself to the parking lot and do a voice conference back in if I wanted to, probably. Wow. Yeah, it's really, really sort of neat. And then there's the control panel as well. I'm looking at that, too. Um, so is that just sort of something you, you dock yes. the tablet to? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the, the way that the system is set up, there, there's two different, I guess, iterations, if you would, if you will, one that literally looks like the Feropter that you're used to. And from that standpoint, you know, it is an, it's an image, if you will, on the tablet screen that has eight, the same knobs, the same dials, everything that you've always used from day one that gives that kind of instant learning curve that you don't have to learn anything else. You don't have to twist a knob or move something. It is, you spin up, you spin down, you tap here, you move there, you twist the dials everything that we've always done is still there. 
The second mode would be, again, the little jog dial type one, which if you use digital parapters of other manufacturers, has kind of become a standard. I personally have been using the, this machine for, for quite some time, and, and I like the, the look of the tablet version. Um, I'm used to it. It's comfortable. It's easy. And again, even when we've had other doctors that have come in to you know, kind of sub for the practice for a day, there's no learning curve, right? They just basically can do it. You show them two seconds, and it's, it's right there in your face, easy to use simplistic. It's fabulous. Right. And kind of curious, how do you get the data, you know, in the system, not, not, not knowing sort of what the back end looks like at all this? How does that work where you, you're, you're drawing data from this? How does, how does that work in practice? Yep. So, so we have, like I said, we have the, the wavefront topographer from, from, from Lenovo as well that will pull over the data. And from the standpoint, um, you can pull in refractive data. So, you know, the autorefractive data, you can pull in lensometry data. And then you can also program a Pers you know, previous RX with a new RX, and it literally pipes right in. You hit one button after it's done, and it zips right in. Hmm. At the end of the exam, you have the opportunity to, again, you click one button, end exam. There's basically an interface box that pipes right back into your software. It throws that into the software, and you will, again, get your autorefractive data, your lensometry data, your manifest refraction data, all piped right back in the system. It's, it's two buttons. It is about as easy as you could possibly hope to have from that standpoint. And again, from, from if you haven't had a digital for if you've never used you know, a digital for the, the ease of it, the, the simplicity of it is fabulous. The thing that I would say, even pre you know, COVID and, and what our quote unquote new normal is and the ability to safely be away from someone in safe distances, the ability to hit one button and show a previous RX versus the new RX, that alone is worth its weight in gold. Right. You know, I mean, patients, sit there, you hit one button, and it's like, hey, this is your old, this is your new, this is your old right eye, this is your new left eye, this is what it looks like at near versus distance. You know, that instantaneous feedback for a patient, that lets them see and know rather than, you know, trying to flip before, like, all right, let's look through the fropter, let's put on your old glasses. Well, I can't tell much of a difference. If you can occlude an eye with one button, hit another button and show them a difference, they get it right away. It's, it's right in their face. Right. Yep. And, you know, taking a look at this tablet based interface, it looks pretty simple. And I'm kind of curious, you know, Melissa, obviously you're, you're with Luno and what other um, sort of products do you have that are, that are kind of based around this, this sort of interface? Sure, Adam. We have our iRefract, uh, which is a dynamic binocular wavefront refraction. Um, and then we also have our Nexi retinal screener, um, and that also operates off a tablet. So the Nexi, um, I'll tell you a little more about because you guys are going to talk to some of my other coworkers about the iRefract, I believe, tomorrow. Yep. But the Nexi is our newest addition to the Visionics portfolio, and it's an affordable next-generation fundus screening camera that combines an automated process with advanced imaging technologies. It captures a high-resolution 45-degree angle view of the eye. It's easy to use, fully automated, and it's optimized for telemedicine. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'm actually pulling it up on the screen right now so people can take a, a look at it as well. And is this something that you recently acquired? I, I, I'm trying to remember. I thought I saw this at a trade show a while back. We did. We, um, we our company, Luno Technology, acquired Nexite, which is an Italian company, in October of last year. Yeah. So we're just bringing the Nexi out here in the U.S. started this year. So, and um, some people call it the sexy Nexi. <laughs> kind of cute, makes cute noises. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, the industrial design is such that as people are looking at it right now, you can see it's actually kind of a cute unit and it's, it's rather small as well. It is, small form factor um, and easy to use. I mean, it's 32 pounds, you know, and literally you could take somebody and off the street and literally ha show them how to use it. I could show them how to use it and they would be using it within five to 10 minutes very easy. Yep. And I'm seeing that there's obviously a, a tablet-based interface, so you can get pretty well distance from the patient, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and you can actually be in another room and remote into the device and use it. I mean, a doctor could act technically use it from their home. <laughs> you know, we've actually heard this concept. They, what, are, what do they call it? Reverse telemedicine, where you keep the doctor away from the office and just use the staff um, to try to keep the, the doctor, sort of the linchpin in the office, from not getting sick. <laughs> exactly. And all of our devices allow the doctor to do that. So, 
That's fantastic. Yeah, and in fact, I'd, I'd recommend everyone who's listening to us to head on into your booth today at the show where they can get a real overview of everything that you guys are doing to, um, you know, to try to, to, to sort of keep the patient and the doctor as separated as possible. Yeah, absolutely. You know, come talk to us. I mean, we're going to be, I'm one of the clinical application specialists with Luno Technology, and um, what, we'll be there and the salespeople will be there. We can chat with you from the booth, booth today. We can actually set up uh, virtual product demonstrations for you so you can see all our devices while you're comfortably at home or you're in your office. You know, just reach out to us. Yeah, pretty neat stuff. And for people who aren't familiar with you guys, you know, like the, you can see the names of the different companies that make up your product portfolio. Obviously, like Brio has been around for a very long time. That's probably even from my father's generation. Um, so you guys are actually made up of a, a bunch of different companies now, right? We are. So our, we're, our company is under Luno Technology. And then we've got the Vibionics products, uh, which are based in Israel. Then we've got uh, Brio Waco. Uh, Waco was originally German. And now it's based in France with uh, Brio, which is a French company. And Aluno was also a French company. And we've got over 100 years under our belt with all our companies. Right. And you guys are actually located in the Chicagoland area. Is that right? You're in the central time zone. That much I know. <laughs> yes, we are. Our home office here in the U.S. is in a suburb of Chicago. Great. Okay, cool. Well, is there anything else that you might want to let people know about today? Um, just that you can find us. We have our website, Luno Technology USA. You can find us on LinkedIn, Facebook. Reach out to us. We'll be happy to, like I said, give you a virtual demonstration of our product, show you how they can work for you in this social distancing time. Okay. Well, great. So, Jordan, Melissa, thanks so much for being here today. And, uh, you know, again, I hope everyone heads on over to your booth and, uh, and speaks with the reps that are there. Because uh, there's, there's certainly a lot to learn, and we'll be talking about you guys. You know, again, we're going to have another interview tomorrow. Uh, you know, and, and we're going to, you know, keep talking about the different technology because I think what you're doing is really important. I know that there are so many docs right now who are just trying to figure out how to navigate this stuff, right? Um, particularly, perhaps people with older equipment who might now want to use this to take the opportunity to make a change to try to sort of revamp their workflow in an age of social distancing, which I have a feeling is going to. If it's not permanent, it's certainly going to be around for quite a while. Exactly. For sure. And there's, going to be an aware, there's going to be an awareness. Yep. Absolutely. Great. All right. Well, thanks, guys, for being here today. Thanks, Adam. Thank you, Adam. Appreciate your time. All righty. That was fun. So, you know, it's funny. We did a conference the other day. Um, and Gretchen, I don't know if you heard this the other day, where I was talking to one ophthalmologist who was just in the process of redoing 10 lanes in his office. <laughs> right, yes. I mean. That is, uh, <laughs> that is quite a chunk of change and a commitment to redo 10 lanes in your office and, right. and not one at a time. I mean, I guess with economies of scale, you end up saving money overall if you buy it all at one time and from one vendor, but. Yep. I was I was blown away when he said it and he was just about to do it right when all the stuff started. And he's actually had to take a step back to think about, OK, you know, we have the opportunity to redo our workflow in, in the face of this new reality. So thank goodness he didn't you know, jump six months ago. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a mess. So, yeah. But it is fascinating watching all the companies and how they're positioning themselves and um, using, you know, a lot of this technology, this remote technology has been built into this equipment for a very long time, but no one ever used it, right? They never thought about it um, because for many practices, it just wasn't part of their workflow. They put these new units in to their old workflow in their office, the remote capabilities, you know, well, they're nice, but who really needs them? And now all of a sudden, this has sort of come to the fore. I was talking to an OCT vendor, right? I think it was ICE talking about, oh yeah, our machines have been able to do this since forever, but no one ever cared. <laughs> and now all of a sudden everyone cares. You know, I, I wonder how many of these units get into the optometry colleges. There's just so much to choose from. And, and how do the kids, how do the optometry students get uh, experience using these various different devices? I mean, most well, of I think a lot of it comes down to what type of partnership a school might have with an equipment manufacturer, because um, a lot of that stuff is donated, I think, or that they get a grant from a certain company and they help with things. So that's my supposition, but I'm not claiming that I am correct. 
Yep. Yeah, I, I think what's interesting too, though, is that these days, especially from what I've noticed anyway, the user interface is becoming very easy on many of these devices. And so moving from one to another is not as big a deal as it used to be um, in terms of, of training. In the old days, of course, the user interfaces across the, many of the high-tech devices were completely different. Uh, and it was a little more challenging. Oh, yeah. And the other, the other side of the coin is I wonder how many students get uh, used to using basic optometric equipment mm. uh, using, using the old-fashioned stuff because many of them might be getting out of school and going into a practice that's 30 or 40 years old with the old stuff. Uh, are they well-trained enough? For example, uh, many opt young optometrists don't know how to use a retina scope. You know, that this... Uh, this was uh, something that every optometrist was really proficient at. And now with all the automated stuff doing automatic retinoscopy, many of them have lost their skill. So I wonder what's happening there. I do think well, that well, this is a technology, I think, and I think you're right. But um, as far as these interfaces with the automatic refractors, et cetera, um, they're really easy, and the millennials are really good at it. Um, so give them one day in the office, and they, we, I've had a Marco in my office, the uh, TRS system, since 2000, I'm coming, 1995, and we kept them upgraded, upgraded. In one hour, you learn how to use it. So, and, the, and obviously, somebody who's 27 years old can even be quicker than uh, myself. So, but you're right, retinoscopy and all those weird prisons of technology. If things go down, um, you don't work. You, know, you, if, you can't fill your prescription with a retinoscope and or a direct ophthalmoscope, for that matter. Yep. Well, I mean, we took that trip to the Contact Lens Museum, which, by the way, we will replay again today since we do have to take a break eventually. Um, and a lot of that equipment, I'm sure most people, when they look at it, they just sort of scratch their heads and, and walk away. <laughs> I do think, I wouldn't call it a problem. I would say that it's um, it's a challenge for some new doctors that they are learning very high-tech equipment in schools. And then, as you say, Paul, they go to a practice that might not have that. But I know that many schools pride themselves on having the latest equipment and technology because they want their students to understand how that works and what they can use these devices for. Like for example, OCT, um, it wasn't so long ago that students didn't learn about OCT because it was still very new technology. And now more and more practices are getting it and that's a competitive edge for younger doctors to be able to learn that information. And honestly, I think it's also helpful if they go into a practice with a more mature practitioner who might not learn some of these newer techniques. Like for example, you might go into practice with a doctor who isn't very proficient at fitting multifocal contact lenses because back in the day, they were definitely a bigger challenge to fit, that the lenses themselves were manufactured differently. So same with Torx, that you wouldn't get the same lens when you uh, reordered for a patient just because the manufacturing wasn't that precise. So you hire a younger associate who understands how to use an OCT and what conditions and diseases it can be used for. When do we use it as a screening device? When do we use it on a routine basis? And can add some services that you as the older doctor may not have any capability there. So I think it depends on how you look at it, your perspective on having students and residents learn new technology, also with knowing how to use some of the older, more basic skills. And let's not forget that there's a big conversation happening in the industry now about what to include in education because you have only so much time. What can you throw in there? People are already saying we need to have more practice management and there's no time. So are like who uses a carotometer now? Nobody has one. Not many people know how to use it. So from an educator's standpoint, do you want to spend time training students on how to use a, a piece of equipment that they likely will come across only a handful of times in their career? Right. So it all comes down to how do you spend the time? 
I mean, it's like teaching people how to rebuild a carburetor these days or use an astrolabe or something. I mean, <laughs> you're really going to, you know, spend your time on it? I don't know. You know, I, or, or is, is this something that you just, you know, say that was great. It's history now. We have more modern tools. And if we ever have to fall back on these older ones, I guess we'll be in trouble. <laughs> Well, there is something to be said for some technologies for doctors who um, travel around, for example, with nursing home care. Right. That you can take your equipment with you. Now, some equipment is smaller and is more portable. Um, some things have adapted. For example, there's a tono pen or there's the eye care tonometer that you can use to check pressures and that's portable. So you don't need to drag your slit lamp and have your Goldman. I mean, cause that's not physically possible. Right. So there are pieces of equipment that have come to, I don't want to say replace um, other equipment, but are able to be used in a different type of setting. So if you are a doctor who's going to nursing homes, or if you are practicing somewhere in a less developed area where you're traveling around or overseas, or you're on a mission trip, well, then those skills might be far more useful to you than to somebody who's practicing in, say, downtown Chicago. Sure. You know, I mean, it's it's like yep. learning to use a stethoscope, right? You, you can learn what those sounds actually mean, and you have to know at a basic level what you're hearing. But the reality is to make a definitive diagnosis these days, a lot of times you're, you're not going to rely on that, right? You're going to use more advanced right. testing. Uh, but it's always nice to at least have a, a first a first sense of what's going on by using the more basic tool. Right. And so, Paul, I don't necessarily disagree with you. I think, though, that um, educators are facing a very real problem of how do they design their curricula to give students the best bang for their buck in terms of education. Um, they also don't want to cram everything in that if we're teaching you, we want you to be proficient in it. But on the other hand, there are so many new things that are coming up that weren't around when optometry schools were first putting together programs. So although students are now going to school over summers, it's still a, a four year program in most cases. And you're trying to shoehorn a whole lot in there. And at some point, something has to give. And whether they're making the best decisions or not is for the students to say. And Gretchen, I think that any good practitioner, like you know we all have to incorporate new technology as the time goes on. What we have to learn five years from now is not what we're learning today. The same thing goes poor with old technology. If you're in a third world country and you have to do retinoscopy, undilated pupil, you get really good after a while, even if you've never done it or learned it in school. So the old techniques are not... They're difficult, but they're just easily learned and picked up, especially with some mentors. So I don't think it's a problem, really. What I think is a problem is that some schools are deviating away from um, some of the basics of optometry, like binocular vision, vision therapy, uh, things like that. And that's falling by the wayside. So whole areas are just being maintained by so few uh, ODs in this day and age. Right. All right. So it's coming up on 1030. We have a little bit of – I'm going to take a little bit of a break now because I have to answer a whole bunch of questions here. Why don't I uh... – we can show the Contact Lens Museum trip for a while, and then at 11 o'clock, Ben's going to be here, um, Ben Casella, so we can talk to him about his reopening experience. How does that sound? Sure. Sounds good. I'll go grab lunch. All right. So let me get this going for everyone, and uh, we will see you in about a half hour. All right, guys. Thank you. Bye. Pat, would you um, tell us how you came about? this idea? What prompted you and Craig to start a collection? Well, you know, uh, like most collections, you start collecting things one at a time and then one day you wake up and you find uh, you've got a museum sitting in your home in closets, garages, and we found ourselves in that situation and then uh, decided that uh, we were just going to open up a contact lens museum. How long did it take you to curate the collection in here? A long time, and we, that's an ongoing endeavor. Um, you know, trying to do something of this magnitude while you're working full time and everything else, uh, got full curriculum and back there, it's, um, it's, it's been very busy, but as you can see, um, it's just such a joy. It just brings so many smiles to so many faces when you bring 
older practitioners through here <laughs> yeah, the, because another relic in. <laughs> yeah, right, it really it's so true. Why don't you me? I mean, I yeah, that's right. Uh, we'll put you in the chair. There you go. That won't be creepy at all. <laughs> no, it won't be creepy at all. But no, you're so right. It's just uh, so many memories and come back to all of us and we're touched by contact lenses. You know, it's uh, when you think about how contact lenses have changed so many people's lives and changed their lives, all those keratoconus patients, irregular cornea patients, it's it's humbling, you know, to you know be a part of you know having this history. So we we felt that I you know. Was one of the younger patients, where did you get your lenses? Nine years, nine years old. Yeah. 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 You know, there in so many millions of people's lives have been changed so much with these. Now, when practitioners have anything lying around their basements or garages or the oh. back room of their practices, mm -hmm. would you be interested from in hearing from them? Yes, we'd be very interested. That's where we pick up a lot of these relics. Mm -hmm. um, Every practitioner, literally everyone uh, out there, has one or two items that have been given to them by an elderly patient, or uh, they took over a practice that you know had been established back in the 30s or mm -hmm. 40s, and somewhere in their archives uh, are these treasures, you know, that they've not known what to do with them. They hold on to them because they don't take up a lot of space. But they don't know, where, they know they can't throw it out. Right, of course uh, not. But they, they're looking for a place to send it. This is the place. <laughs> this is the place to send it. So there, it can be archived, uh, taken care of properly. Um, we've, Craig and I have spent you know, hours and hours learning about curating um, an optical museum and like this. It's, uh, there's a lot that goes into it. We had to then uh, apply for a, um, a nonprofit uh, organization, a 501c3 with the government. We uh, got that, so we're official. So not only are you accepting items to be displayed here, you're accepting financial contributions to support yeah, the museum. Yeah, very much so. This has been totally funded uh, through gifts and so on, and by Craig and myself. And oh, that's a, that's a good charity for next year. Absolutely. That is. It really is. It's a lovely charity for uh, individuals in the eye care profession that want to see, you know, the history of uh, contact lenses preserved. So uh, you can see here we uh, uh, encourage donations, and uh, so we uh, yeah, we love it. You know, when people can uh, when they win the lottery, you know, <laughs> send us uh, some of that, and uh, so we have fun. But it's um, we get the believe it or not our biggest support from uh, patients, so they feel this incredible emotional you know, tie to these lenses. Sure. Now this is uh, actually just part of the collection. Uh, uh, a lot of it still is in storage right now. Uh, we need a, a bigger facility. When we opened this up in July, we opened it up with the knowledge that uh, we've already outgrown it. Uh, it's a good that, problem to uh, have. Good problem to have. And, so we're just going to keep raising, you know, funds as best we can and uh, hope to move into a bigger uh, facility as time goes on. And then this is, like I said, part of the collection. The other collection I'm going to show you is the uh, collection of antique glasses, uh, oh. spectacle lenses, um, probably one of the finest in uh, North America right now. That's across the street at the school. Um, so um, it's this has been just a passion for Craig and I, you know, this collecting. And, um, fortunately, we have wives that understand 
of the insanity because <laughs> uh, that's what it is. It's truly, it's insane to be doing this. Uh, um, uh, but, you know, Craig and I have been blessed so much, like you have, like we all have, by the eye care industry. That, Very much so. Yeah, that it's just been a humbling experience to be a part of it. So this is our payback, or this is our legacy that we'll leave. And it's a beautiful one. It's a start. It, uh, yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful start. And so we're real happy. Very, very happy with it all. Excellent. So many, many years ago, as you can imagine, the um, it's really myself and Craig Norman who kind of put this all together. The story begins over here. I'll sort of walk you through. This is kind of the evolution of contact lenses. The, uh, all of these lenses here are made of glass. And so these were the earliest uh, contact lenses in Germany and Zeiss. So they were the three making glass uh, scleral lenses at the time. When did Obra come in? Obrick came in in the uh, 1940s. How do you know that name? <laughs> I used to live with him. <laughs> oh my, my! I was just uh, reading a, a book uh, this morning. Uh, his uh, the textbook from 1945 on um, contact lenses. It's really one of the earliest. Yeah, and uh, that is. What a coincidence. Oh, yeah. So all are, of are these companies related? It's it's no, Muller Sohn no, and Muller Welt? No, they were different um, families. Okay. Yeah, they had no uh, no relation. And uh, so these uh, like I said, it's the largest collection of glass uh, contact lenses in the world. Hmm. So it's um, they're hard to find, they're very rare. Uh, wonderful to feel because they're incredibly heavy. Can can I touch one? Yeah. As a matter of fact, you can touch the one that is yours. Uh, <laughs> we wanted Craig and I wanted you to have this. This is a glass uh, really? scleral lens. Wow. And uh, it's all the contributions you've made to the industry, you deserve that. Oh, you are so <laughs> kind. Thank you. Yeah, it's, Look at this it's thing. kind of neat to have. You can see kind of how rough the optics were. Very rough. And, uh, but, you know, they got better with time. Mm -hmm. That's a real early one. Which like year? So, uh, this would have been probably early 1900s. Wow. So between 1900 and 1910. But you could feel how smooth uh, yeah. the glass The workmanship was. was wonderful. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, that's definitely one we wanted you to have. Oh, very nice. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. This would be a real challenge to apply and to remove. Yeah, it really, it really is because of the size. Um, these were about 24. Two to twenty-four millimeters in diameter, so they were pretty big. And then I see that they're fenestrated as Some well. Some of them were, and that's kind of unique. The number of them that were fenestrated. Um, you can imagine drilling a hole in glass can be a little bit challenging. And, a lot of breakage. Uh, yeah. But uh, I'm always surprised when I'm going through the lenses, the number of them that have uh, actually been fenestrated. And that would have been a challenge as well, not only drilling the hole, but making sure that the edges are smooth enough. Because oh, yes. That would have been quite painful had you applied a fenestrated yeah. lens that wasn't smooth. But then you look at these Zeiss lenses, the optics are absolutely perfect, and they're incredibly thin. And I always wonder, how many of those broke in the eye? You know, it wouldn't take much trauma. That would have been to a shatter really big those. Problem. Yeah, 
but that was unique of the Zeiss lenses at the time. Um, they, uh, they were incredibly thin. Do you know who made this one, the one that you gave me? Uh, that one, yes, I do. That one uh, was uh, from the uh, Mueller Weld Company. Wow. Yeah, that one. Look from at these. There. And then so those are the molds right those there? Those are the molds. So that and is let brass. Me, let and me then take you through how, let's say like it's uh, 1920 and I'm going to fit you with a contact lens. It would all begin over here. Um, May I sit in the chair? Yes, please. Okay. You sit in the chair again. That's where I sit. <laughs> I get comfortable in here. <laughs> and um, now the molding process began by just simply mixing this compound. It's called moldite. moldite yeah. And we would mix it in one of these uh, containers and then uh, it would be placed into a syringe. And this mold then would be placed onto the eye and the moldite compound injected through here and then it would take a perfect mold of the anterior segment. So the molding compound would harden in about 90 seconds. So you had to be real efficient with your time. You had to load this, inject it, and uh, be pretty efficient. So you have to do that on a board exam, right? right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> 1950s. So. Jeez. And. Uh, then uh, what happened next was when you had that beautiful mold, you would mix this next compound called cast stone. And that cast stone then uh, was just like a, um, a concrete, but incredibly fine, powdery concrete. And then you would let it harden and uh, then you would have this beautiful impression of the eye. Now, back in the day, in the, before World War II, a second mold would have to be made of brass. And the reason for that is that when the lens was actually turned into a contact lens, it um, was made of glass, and the glass would just simply, the heat of the glass would destroy the, the moldite, so it had to be turned into a brass mold. Then it was taken over here, and this is probably the highlight of the museum in the fact that we have the only remaining glass contact lens making apparatus in the world. This really? is it. This is the only one left. Does it work if it you works. wanted to create a lens? Oh, yeah. Can? Yeah, we've had it fired up, and you can see we've destroyed part of the. Uh, table from the firing <laughs> it up and uh, uh, it makes a lot of pops and noises and now there was a, this vice was on the stand we don't know what its function was but uh, it must have had some function the problem with this instrument is that nowhere can we find anything written on how to manufacture the contact lens or how they were manufactured. Wow. So we're having to piece it together little by little. Now, the... Um, if the, I push this, is something going to happen? Yeah, push oh, it. Push it? Yeah, push both of them. Uh, this one. Oh and my god! it still works. That's the amazing thing. We fired up these motors, and um, uh, they were still working. Uh, this is incredible. So, uh, they, uh, now, the way it worked was you attach the mold, the brass mold of the shape of the eye here. Top two, I think. Perfect. Now, that bottom, yeah, no, you got it. You got them both. Okay. Good. And what would happen is you uh, had natural gas and oxygen that were mixed together. Those were, um, it wasn't propane. Propane hadn't been invented yet, so they actually used natural gas wow. back in that day. 
And so the gases were then mixed up here to the appropriate concentration, and these valves controlled the amount of oxygen versus the uh, amount of natural gas. It looks like it's a very non-precise process. Exactly, exactly, very non-precise. Then they had these two by two wafers of glass uh, that were set right here. And then this was just simply brought around once the glass had been molten and this just brought down and an impression made of the uh, contact lens. And that's the mold right there. And that's the mold. So you would of swap the, uh, that out depending upon the yeah. patient you're creating this for. And then in this little container, when I got the instrument, uh, it was just filled up to about here with asbestos. Oh, excellent. So <laughs> that uh, made it all complete. Uh, so then you would bring it back here, drop this mold. And because it was flaming hot from uh, being in contact with the glass, and it would fall into the asbestos where it would be cooled. And now, with these little tools here, the residual glass would be broken away. And then you saw over here how the edges were rounded and then the power placed on the front of the lens if, uh, with this. Now, the only thing we can think of here is that this was actually operated by hand the, to oscillate the uh, application of the power on the front side of the lens. That's all we can actually kind of surmise. We don't know how else it was driven. And, uh, but everything came with the unit, it was intact, and it's actually from, of all places, Perth, Australia. Don Ezekiel. Yeah, Don Ezekiel. And, and if anybody would have something like this, it would be it'd him. It would be him. And uh, you'll see as you go through the museum, many of the pieces are from Don's collection and that was probably the largest in the world. And he gave it all to us. So we're really super fortunate to have that. And he got his basement back. I'm sorry? He got his basement back. Yes, <laughs> he had his garage. He had, uh, had it in his laboratory, but when he sold the laboratory, it went moved into his garage. So he was kind of uh, grateful, but Again, sad to see it all go away. And, uh, but to have the only one remaining. Uh, now this is for this. <laughs> <laughs> A mechanical tool then. Nothing no, to do with creating the contact no, lens. No, just strictly for changing out the gas. If you wanted to. Is there gas in there? Could no, you make one? No, we uh, we keep the uh, the live ones in my garage at home, uh, <laughs> but these are uh, actually empty. And so you have uh, filled ones if you wanted oh, to. Yes. I mean, I don't know that oh, I put asbestos sure. there, but you could create oh, yeah, a glass yeah. lens. We're the only ones in the world that can make glass contact lenses if you need one. Have you tried it? Wow. Oh yeah, yeah, we've tried it and it's incredible. Just, there's a lot of experimentation getting the temperature right, getting the, just the exact amount of uh, natural gas and the exact amount of oxygen. But you could see that it uh, would be very easy to, uh, to accomplish. Now, when PMMA came along, things changed rather dramatically because now it was possible to just simply use the mold itself rather than turning it into a brass mold. And what was used at that time then were these PMMA wafers. That's Actual PMMA? Yeah. I thought now, it was cardboard. No, it's, it's it has this protective coating on it, and you just peel this away, and then there's this beautiful piece of acrylic plastic. Wow. For scleral lenses. 
That's really cool. Very cool. And now, you know, it didn't take any temperature at all to melt that. You know, you, that was not like melting glass. So I think we may even have one here that might be, yeah, there we go. Oh, so that's so, it. That's it. So did so I ask the question when you were in school? Did you ever see anything like this? Yes, well, with, with the way it worked in school, <laughs> our, our contact lens course was one person with keratoconus that was handed down from class to class. <laughs> and we had a, it was at Columbia University, and we had Isidore Finkelstein was the professor, a very bright guy, but that was it. And he had this one guy, and every time they had to do something to wash the lens or something, there was no sink. Fink, the Fink used to walk in to the bathroom and wash it and try it on. And this guy never succeeded, but he kept coming back from class to class. Oh. And that was <laughs> the contact lens course in the 50s. Oh, my gosh. That's so interesting you mentioned that name. I read his name for the first time last night, uh, Fickelstein yeah. from Columbia University. And the reason I came across it I was uh, doing a story, as I'll show you down here, on Dennis England, who helped invent the first corneal contact lens. But uh, I came across an article written by Hank Knoll from Bosch and Lowe on uh, this gentleman from, uh, from Columbia University. And it was the first time I had seen his name. So it was really yeah, so that that was the kind of neat. That was the contact lens course. Oh, wow. period. <laughs> End of story, cool. and then whatever you learn happened afterwards. Yeah, it happened afterwards. But the academy required, in order to become a diplomat, you had to be able to fit a, a scleral lens, lens and oh. using moldite. Yeah. And what oh. happened? Yeah, as basically we smuggled in some anesthetic because there's no way you can put that shit in your eye. Yeah, I don't get and say stay still now because you so, can imagine if the patient's eye was moving right. during the molding process, you know, you have a pretty bad. Mold. Yeah, I mean, so. <laughs> what year did you earn your uh, your diploma? In 1965, I think. And so that so was being required at that yeah. time. It was a very large class. Uh, they, the word was, you better get it now because it's going to get much tougher to do. But that particular part was separating the men from the boys because you had to learn not only to do it, but then to adjust it. And, yeah. were, and I was always very unhandy. I figured I'd cut my hand off with the bars yeah. that, that they used. Um, oh, my. So, Wonderful. Uh, <laughs> So we yeah. have glass lenses. Glass lenses, and then yeah. uh, we, oh boy, Irvorish and I was suffered. Oh <laughs> my! So here we go to PMMA sclerals. PMMA sclerals, and you know it was uh, very uh, plastic. It was very slow to get involved into the evolve into the contact lens industry. It was only after World War II that. Plastic really did replace glass. Yeah, as the World War II. Huh. Yeah. Plastic star first started on airplanes. Mm -hmm. I see up there Ernst Abbey. Yeah, Ernst Abbey. Does that have anything to do with the Abbey value? Yep, it sure does. <laughs> that is it right there. He was the mathematician, uh, the brains behind the Carl Zeiss Corporation. And... Um, he was a brilliant mathematician. He developed this machine right here. This um, was it's like a, an early lensometer. It it looks like an early lensometer, but it's called a refractometer. And what it did is just measure the index of refraction of huh. the glass. And because when they were manufacturing glass at the time, they could never control the index of refraction of it. Uh, so each piece had a different index. And so what they had to do is read the index of refraction, and then they knew what radius to put on the front to create the power. There was a lot of math involved. There was then. a ton of math involved back in those days. And, uh, but he was the one who really kind of uh, 
was at the forefront of that. Now I see back here there are corneal lenses as well as scleral lenses. Yeah, it's just like um, um, CDs and uh, VHSs. You know, there's that time uh, in space where the two cross over, mm -hmm. and um, this was uh, really it in the 1950s. Uh, it was unsure which of the two modalities was going to really take over. Was it going to stay scleral or was it going to go corneal? And so you see a number of these fun sets that have actually both in them. Now here's the uh, Theo Obrick sets uh, out of New York. Uh, the one in the back was the original Theo Obrick uh, scleral lens set. And then the one in the front uh, is one of the um, later uh, sets. I like these glasses down here. The world of contact lenses. That is that really is cool. Bizarre. So um, W.J. made them. Well, Newton Wesley uh, was the man responsible for kind of bringing contact lenses into the mainstream. Uh, so in the early 1960s, he marketed everything uh, to get contact lenses out to the masses. God bless him. Yep, and um, he appeared on the Steve Allen show, <laughs> and he was just this incredible kind of showman, but yet incredibly ethical. And, um, I yeah, never, he was keratoconic. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Do you have any stories? Well, yeah, he, and he had a partner, George Jessen, mm -hmm. yeah. and George was a, a glad hander type of salesperson, and Newton was the front front guy with the research type of thing. Right. And uh, they they did everything, and they not only the market glasses, but I remember they used to hand out ties. Oh, I've got this one. Oh, it says contact lenses on it. Yes, I'm so, it's so funny you should make that you're the only one I've ever known right there uh, oh, from the uh, Newton oh, Wesley is, yeah. Company. And, uh, but he, he was just this incredible marketer. Yes. And it was just so cool what he was able to do. That's good. Somebody needs to get the word out. Well, you know, and uh, little known fact, it was Newton Wesley who founded Pacific University College of Optometry. Is that right? I didn't yeah, know that. Yes. He, uh, it's a rather kind of long and sometimes sad story because um, he founded it uh, but then had to give it up and sell it uh, because of uh, World War II and the internment camp. So his two sons and his wife ended up in a, an internment camp uh, throughout uh, the course of World War II. And uh, it was here in Portland where the internment camp was. And um, uh, Roy Wesley, his son, is still alive. And um, he is... Okay, everyone, I'm going to pause this right here where we're at in the video and uh, get back to it here. So welcome back, everyone, and let me get this going. And guys, are you still on the line? I'm here. All right, Steve. Steve how's it going? I'm here. All right. Gretchen, gone? <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Okay. Well, welcome back, everyone, and... Before we get started here with our next interview, I just want to remind everyone uh, about what's going on in the classes. So let me pull that up here and also remind everyone to uh, make sure that you check in to actually get the credits that you deserve. So by the way, if you uh, miss filling out the little form during a lecture and you want to receive credit for going to a course, always click on the Help Center. It's always at the top of the page. Click on that scroll down to the lecture you just watched, like let's say that you, I don't know, saw Richard's show in the morning about claims, denials, and rejections, you click that, and then you just fill out your OE tracker number and you attest to the fact that you were there, not your assistant or anybody else, uh, and then you'll get credit and it'll be on your transcript. So, um, there you go. So, I guess uh, that's about it for right now. We're going to be doing an interview right now with Ben Casella, if he is here, and with Gretchen, if she returns as well. Um, so let's hope. 
and we will go from there. But otherwise, the conference seems to be going pretty well today. What do you think, Steve? It looks like we're having very few technical issues uh, across, you know, many thousands of people who are taking it. Um, just a few, a couple of, like you said, video, I mean, audio checks because they don't have the speakers on loud. Um, a couple of the lectures started late. One was three minutes, one was about seven minutes late, so they just ran over. But luckily, the comp slot had nothing afterwards, so really no big problems. People are challenged to find out how to get their credits, um, even though I'm posting it at the beginning and the end, and right. I probably best them. But that, I mean, with um, thousands of people attending and five people asking, it can't be too big a problem. Um, so, yeah, no nope, uh, How are questions? Are people asking questions? Are they interacting? Uh, all right. Just like um, the last seminar we ran, very, very interactive. Um, not as much because there's just not as many people. Um, there's over 1,000. Last time we had over 2,000 at one point in time. Um, but very interactive. In fact, I was going to cut and paste one particular part that was really interesting. But you can always get that from the archives, right, Adam? But yep. much more than the February show because just more people and uh, more interest in it. And um, I think that's what people like, and that's what ARPA likes, and that's what we like also. We want people to be um, interested in it. This is, this is why, you know, I'm not going to do this to plug Z-Wire, but if there's a conversation going with uh, 15 or 20 answers back and forth, imagine having that with a live lecture. Yeah. You would be not <laughs> watching the lecture, and he's answering questions back and forth. It's a, it's a much better interface than being live in this particular, maybe not in all ways, but in this particular way, it certainly works better. Right. All right. So we're going to wait for Gretchen to come yep. back on here, and uh... I'm here. Oh, you're here. Cool. How's it are going, we, Gretchen? Are we live? We are live. Um, and I guess we're going to have Ben coming up here. I don't know if he's here yet. Ben, are you around? Hey. Hey. Can you guys hear me? Oh hey, yes. Ben. Yes, we can. How's it going, Ben? Hey. Hey, everybody. I'm doing well. Hope y'all are. Oh yeah. How was your class? His very long class. What's that? I said, how was your class? Oh, oh boy. Well, you know, um, they say the best way to spend five hours is to listen to two hours of drug diversion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was watching no, it was everybody else been. Weren't you getting a lot of interactive uh, questions and uh, it makes a lot of for you? Um, I did. I did have some really great questions, and I was uh, very uh, appreciative of it. Even some um, uh, questions with uh, opioids as relates to uh, the current global pandemic, which um, uh, which was really great to know that people were listening. Hmm. What were some of the questions, Ben? What was was the one outstanding question that you could share with us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one. Um, uh, particular question was um, uh, I was during a uh, I, I was in the middle of uh, the meat of the lecture going over um, uh, side effects of um, narcotics and we were talking about depressed respiration and somebody said has this been shown or something to the fact has this been shown to be a, um, um, a, 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 a reason for um, using caution when prescribing a narcotic to somebody who might have COVID. Mm. And of course, we don't have a lot of longitudinal data on that, but common sense would tell us overwhelmingly if you are at risk of having depressed respiration anyway, an opioid's probably not the best thing for you. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, I really appreciated the question. And I, I'm going to put up on the screen here just so uh, people are aware of who you are and what your situation is. We all, of course, know you here. But, uh, you know, you, not only are you a great lecturer and, and not only are, are you the, the uh, optometric editor at Optometry Times, but you also run your own private practice. And here it is up on the screen. And you've been running a series over the past several months now um, documenting sort of the country's sl slow slide into clinical depression. <laughs> um, and, well, that's a right. yeah, I mean, it's. I mean, you know what though? It's a great. It's a great historical document. What you've actually put together, right? Because you know we're watching you over time, and now we're sort of watching you. You get things back on the road and running again. So, how are you actually doing right now? You know, I really, uh, I really uh, appreciate you bringing that up. We're doing. Um, I mean, we're doing about as well as we can be doing about as well as any practice can be doing right now. You know, we were, um, of course, you know, the CDC uh, guidelines were to uh, be available for emergency care only. Uh, and that was 
and that went on for about two two months or so. Um, of course, the reason being would be to keep eye emergencies out of the emergency room so that some guy with pink eye doesn't catch COVID. Um, with that said, uh, when they um, augmented their guidelines and said that we can start to get some of our non-emergent patients back in, it took me a few days after that just to get quote unquote up and running physically, uh, but also to get up and running psychologically to wrap my head around it. And I feel like we're, we're sort of settling into it. We're operating uh, a patient about every 45 minutes to hour right now. And we're probably going to be around there really until, um, until social distancing is, uh, relaxed. So that's, uh, that's where we are. We're doing okay. Uh, I got my small business loan, um, for payroll, rent, uh, health insurance, and utilities, and I've been uh, blowing through that. <laughs> and uh, we're, um, you yeah, know, we're 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 just plugging along in the new normal, and wondering how long it's going to be this way. But the point of the videos is really not only to give a log as to what I was doing, but also my thought process what I think I did right, what I wish I could have done differently, and just to let people know that they are not alone in this, that there's a lot of us uh, going through this, but let's go through it together. Right. And, you know, we've heard from a lot of people this morning about their social distancing practices that they're using. You know, some people, you make people wait in the parking lot till you call them in. You know, other people are dragging right. their pretest equipment out into the street, as we've seen. What are, what are you doing? It looks like you practice in, like, a bank vault and or an Apple store, looking from the, uh, your, your drawing. It does have a vault. I've seen it. Yeah. So, uh, over 100 years ago, that was a movie theater. And uh, in the 40s and 50s, it was a bank. So, it's pretty easy to social distance in our building. Uh, uh, you can get lost in there if you try. Um, we uh, have not relocated any equipment. I've taken almost all the chairs out of my waiting room except for like three. I've taken all the magazines out. I've, 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 it, it just, just if I think to do it, then I do it. Um, our um, optical, we only have one person back in the optical at any given time as far as on the uh, patient end. As you can see, I'm uh, essentially storefront brick and mortar on Broad Street downtown. I don't have a parking lot. Um, and um, honestly, there's a, a fair number of patients that actually walk to see me. And so, and so uh, it, it, um, it, it's worked out okay so far. I feel like I could probably go with a patient about every half hour because there are some periods when we're kind of twiddling our thumbs. But I also know that as with has been previous experience with me personally, it, the second I do that, like five people are going to show up thinking they had an appointment at the same time. And, 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 and I don't want the psychology of that. I don't want the physicality of that. It's just so weird, Adam. It's like three months ago, a crowded waiting room was like a really good sign. And now a crowded waiting room is the absolute opposite of what you want to happen. It, 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 it's just, it's just incredibly it, 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 it's incredible from both the physical and the psychological aspects of it. Absolutely. You know, I actually had to go get blood work about a week ago, and they're in our lab now, which is in a, you know, it's a sort of freestanding healthcare facility. they doing appointments, mm -hmm. right, just to get labs, which I thought was really interesting. So you have a scheduled time. And as I was sitting there, I came in dutifully at my scheduled time. Three people came in, yep. you know, off the street wanting to get their labs done, not realizing that you need an appointment. And it's a really awkward situation, right? Because you don't sure, want to be you don't want to be is. near you don't want to be near anyone else and like everybody's eyeing each other nervously. We're all wearing masks and we're like you just want to throw these people <laughs> out, but at the same time, yeah, they kind of do need lab work. So what do you do? <laughs> you know, it's 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 it it's it's just psychologically thrilling. I don't have a better word for it. We um I did have one patient that um you know Georgia we're um. Georgia was a little, uh, dare I say, cavalier with um, uh, quote-unquote reopening. I think we were on the front end of it. And we, uh, fair number of people down here, you, you, you're not going to see as many masks in Georgia, uh, at least in my hometown, as you would in the Pacific Northwest. And um, I did have one patient. Um, he was an older gentleman, um, came in, uh, had something in his I, 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 I uh, waved at him from like 
20 feet away, said, hey, I'm just going to put on a mask and goggles and gloves and I'll come and we'll get you fixed up. And he, he, he said, oh, you don't you don't need any of that. I'm fine. And I, I felt like saying, well, actually, this is also for me <laughs> right? and my family. This is, this is not all about you. It, 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 and you're an old person. You're, you ha- have a higher risk of doing poorly if you come down with this. Um, I did have one lady, um, we're doing forehead, uh, thermometers on the way in. Boy, I wish I had invented those things. Right. Um, and she, I explained to her that I needed to check her temperature before she came in and she just backed away and said, I don't want you to do that. Hmm. And I, I just politely explained to her that she's not coming in unless we do this, because this is specifically itemized by the CDC. And, um, I don't know if it was just a uh, 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 invasion of uh, privacy or if she had some sort of uh, personal liberties ideology that she was projecting. But the long story short, she had her temperature checked and she was a febrile and she was let into the building. But, um, you know, it just is what it is. Dealing with the public is what we call that. Yeah. I mean, I know here in our medical centers, before you can even get into a waiting room, they have someone there with the thermometer waiting for you, almost like a bouncer at a nightclub. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, right. You just right. don't, you don't pass. And, you know, they give you a sticker if you're good, and if not, they throw you out. <laughs> it's a big, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big bald guy wearing like a Shemedium t-shirt. <laughs> right. Hold <laughs> His sleeves ripped out. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. If optometry doesn't work out, I could be a thermometer bouncer. But, you know, it's it's fascinating. You're right, the cultural differences. I mean, here on the West Coast, I guess there's a huge Asian influence that we have. So the idea of wearing masks is not at all alien to people out here to begin with, right? Uh, because you see it oh, all sure, the time. Oh, sure. Absolutely. So for, for us here, <laughs> wearing masks was like nothing. This is something that everyone does. And when you go out to the supermarket, everybody's doing it. And it doesn't seem weird at all. I understand that we uh, it, it it um it's it's it is funny that there are some profound cultural differences. Um, I will say that I, I my, my my stance on it is you know what if you feel better if I wear a mask or if I feel better if I wear a mask when I go into a restaurant or go into a bank or something you know I have to wear a shirt and shoes and that doesn't bother me. So I I I I got my mask. I don't have uh, qualms about it, but I'm also, you know, you know, you never want to um, walk a mile in my shoes. You know, somebody with a mask on, they may have, they may have a child who currently has some sort of cancer and is immune compromised. You just, you just don't know. You just don't know what somebody's particular situation is. And I think it's sad in a way that, that the quote unquote science behind COVID is now political in its nature. And it, 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 and it seems difficult to get to scientific absolutes. It seems like everybody has their own scientific principles here that they subscribe to. In fact, even the peak dates, like here in Georgia, it's like if you happen to lean this way, you think that the peak date is now or that the peak date hasn't happened yet. And then there's other people say, no, 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 no. It already peaked a month and a half ago. It, 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 it's just incredible how politicized the virus has become and it's a, it's a sad state of affairs yeah it really is yeah. that's, a, ben, that's do you, how my life do, do, do you have any uh, preference uh, when you decide who to call back uh, for routine care are you are you breaking it down by age group how are you managing I, to, for, for callbacks I do and thank you that's a question that I have not yet gotten and thank you very much for that I um I am trying to keep very elderly people away if I can, uh, because um, here in Georgia, that's actually um, part of the governor's mandate. I, I am I am trying to keep my diabetics away if I can, and I am prioritizing. So my practice is almost 50% glaucoma, so I'm trying to get my IOP checks in before I see, say, a young myope who just needs contact lenses filled. I can, I've been, I've been um, extending a lot of contact lens prescriptions and and, and I've been, I've been trying to categorize it to my non quote unquote routine exams, which I hate the word routine exam because of course a patient can have 
fuzzy vision and be nearsighted or have fuzzy vision and have a brain tumor, but I don't have a better term for it. But I'm trying to get, get younger, uh, quote unquote, medical patients in first. Uh, and that's not a cookie cutter approach. And there have been some exceptions to the rules, but I'm extending glasses and contact lens prescriptions um, as they're coming in. Ben, are you right. finding in the older population uh, a great amount of no-shows where they make an appointment and then just think better of it? Or yeah, that's a great question. So I have a pretty good or I should say bad no-show rate anyway. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I've had um, um, a couple of people um, – I've had that happen several times. And I had one patient um, um, call us and say, you know, I have an appointment in two weeks. Um, I am immune compromised. And I told my doctor that y'all wanted me to come in. And he said that that's crazy and that I don't need to go out and I'm not coming in. And, and I just kind of politely told her, I said, well, please pass along to your doctor that we're, we're still rescheduling people and that you're on our list of people definitely not to come in. And we're going to reschedule you for the, the fall. Um, but it's weird. I, I feel like, at least in my experience in my practice, I feel like my younger patients seem to be the ones that are, that are more apt to wear masks. And it seems like a good bit of my older patients are kind of acting like teenagers about this. They're, 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 and, 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 and that may just be my own experience, um, but it's an interesting one nonetheless. Yep, and I put up on the screen right now just so everyone can can get to your uh, art, your videos on Optometry Times. So you know you can pull it up and check it out here. You can see your progression over the last ten weeks or so. Um, you know of everything that's been been going on, and you know kind kind of interesting to see what's been happening there. And you know I'm I'm wondering since you guys were sort of on the leading edge of quote reopening for whatever that means. Have you guys seen any spikes? Yeah, exactly. Have, have you guys seen any spikes recently, or are people not even talking about it anymore? No, people are um, people around here. It, it it seems like they're just tired of it. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, I uh, have been following the uh, Georgia Department of Health as my resource, and specifically not network news. Uh, and it seems as though Georgia has not had a has has not had um, a quote unquote peak or any type of a substantial rise since we quote unquote partially reopened. So that's um, encouraging. Um, I don't know if the warm weather concurrently has something to do with it or if or if people are just taking it seriously where we're we're gonna partially reopen and we're gonna be careful about it. Uh, but that's encouraging to see here. Yeah. And I, I can't help but wonder what's going to happen as the summer drags on and you know sports will eventually come back. You know, what will the stadiums look like eventually? How serious are people about, about all this? Well, the, the big question here in uh, Augusta, Georgia, is um, is the Masters Golf Tournament going to happen? Mm. And it's slated to happen in November right now, which, which would just be wonderful because that's, uh, I mean, that's just what Augusta's known for. And, um there's all types of theories out there. Uh, as far as uh, Georgia football games, some people who are quote unquote in the know are telling me that they're looking at selling just a certain percentage of tickets. Uh, but, but I mean, who, who knows? I mean, I, I, I really hate to speculate. I mean, and I'm frankly tired of hearing about, you know, about uh, the second wave coming. It's like, l let me, let me get through the first wave and then we'll talk about if I have to shut down again. Okay. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and it's funny, actually, up on the page right now, I have the Optometry Times website, and it's the save the date for, for Nashville, <laughs> for Academy. <laughs> well, Jeff Sonsino, our last, um, one of our last guests, seemed pretty pretty definitive that he thought it was happening. Yeah, so but... I don't know if he's got some inside information. or I if... wonder if Jeff, I, I wonder if Jeff's got some intel on that. I don't, you know, it's easy for him to be brave, though, because he doesn't have to get on an airplane. <laughs> right. It's right in his town. And of course, yeah, he, exactly. wants, he wants it to happen. Yeah. I mean, um, I'm, I'm oh looking at God. this. I'm looking at this and I'm thinking about where do I have to connect and what kind of a plane is this going to be and how many hours am I going to be breathing? And it's just, yeah, I just, yeah. 
Well, you'll hopefully be breathing all of those out. Yeah, I, I just if, if I, I just, have anything I to just, say about it. I mean, it's just I I can't see myself getting on an airplane anytime soon, at least until I'm vaccinated <clears> for this. I completely agree. We, uh, it, it's and, and truth be told, an airplane may be uh, if they're spraying them down or something. I mean, an airplane may be one of the safest spots on earth right now. Who knows? But the psychology of it prevents me from wrapping my head around that at present time. Of course, that's what's that's in uh, October. But as you know, the days come and the days go and October ain't that far away. Right, right. And I mean, I'm thinking like Expo West. So I'm going to land in Las Vegas. That's going to be interesting, right? Get off the plane and you know, you're, you're with the sea of humanity. How is that going to work? I think I, I'm thinking. <sighs> so yeah, so I, I was early next week and they will casinos are opening and I just can't imagine. Yeah. What I'm thinking about doing is just um, going ahead and um, winning the lottery and getting a NetJets account. And if I do, I will, I will scramble the G five and I will pick you all up and we will socially distance all the way to Academy. <laughs> uh, I'm just hoping that all, here in the Northeast, um, if I have to go to Nashville, if I will go to Nashville, I have to go two weeks earlier and quarantine myself before I get into the conference. <laughs> you, sign, you, you, you signed up for a neat month there, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I can't go to Florida. Florida actually has that law for um, anybody from New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, I believe. You have If you fly That's down right. there, you have to in for two weeks, which is not a great deal. So well, I, I think the last thing that will open is, like Gretchen says, is convention centers, because it's even worse than a bowl game where you could socially distance and, and plan it out. This is, you know, five, six, seven thousand people in a, in a small area um, that you can't possibly um, control as well as you can other events. So I think convention centers in general are going to be the last thing to open up. But when, um, my guess is as good as yours. I agree with you 100%. I, I, I mean, no matter how big it is, you're in a you're in a fishbowl with a lot of other fish. Yep. And if you take a convention like Vision Expo West, it's an international one. First of all, I don't want to get on a plane flight and fly five and a half hours from the East Coast, but you get a lot of people from China and Japan and Europe coming to these conventions for frames and various other devices, Germany with equipment. Right. Um, right. They might not be permitted to come, and so that particular conference, I think, is more up in the air than... Um, than the Nashville one, the Academy. Understood. We'll see. Yeah, but all Strange these casinos world. are opening next week. I mean, I I don't get who would want to go to Vegas now. Gamblers. People. <laughs> uh, I, I bet you can get a good deal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. So. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm just, I'm hoping beyond hope that we have a vaccine that's ready relatively soon so we can all just sort of get on with our lives because I just kind of feel like we're yeah, in just just, one, just... one gigantic holding pattern. Well, I mean, really um, somebody... Uh... Sorry. No, 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 no. Go ahead, Gretchen. I was going to say, Adam, do you really think if we have a vaccine that, I mean... Everyone's going to jump on board. It, it won't. It will have been hastily developed. There won't have been a lot of testing. Do you really think that everybody's going to sign up for that? I think that people who are at very high risk should probably do it. So, you know, Paul can only stay trapped inside for so long, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, the, the main, I think the main difficulty, however, is as with the flu vaccine, it's only about 50%. Uh, effective uh, so would i even take a chance and saying oh yeah you know this is very good and effective and then start going out in public when i might be one of the 50 percent where it's not effective so enough it's taking well, an enormous risk enough people yeah, have to have flu. to take it so that it yep. just doesn't get transmitted that's that's the thing right the population needs to all have this on board or as many people as possible so right. the odds of running across someone with an active infection is, is low right so, uh, and, and, and we're going to need Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 please. No, I, I'm, I'm more concerned uh, about this phase two when they're starting to encourage people to go out and there'd be more carriers that you bump into. Right. Right now, my, my, my experience going out is strictly 
I, I go for a walk every day and I barely see anyone on the paths. And if we see someone on the path, you stay way, way far away from them. So the chance of getting a virus that way is, is limited. But if I start going to the barber or start going in for uh, dermatology, et cetera, I'm going to be coming more right. in contact with, with potential people. So that's the risk. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, I, I personally think that if the vaccine comes available, I unless there's a reason not to, you know, if, if we're seeing some horrible side effects, I would take it straight away because I don't want to feel like, you know, I'm, I'm limited in what I can do or frankly being even limited to go and and visit Paul and my mom, right? I mean, it's a challenge right now. We're trying to limit right. the number of people who were around just so we can actually go visit them because uh, we obviously don't want to give them anything. I understand that. I mean, if, they, if, it, if it comes out and it, 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 and it, and it passes my sniff test, I'm, I'll be ready to shoot some up my nose and get back to work. Yep. <laughs> you know, uh, on the other hand, there, there are those of us that are introverts where life has hardly changed at all. <laughs> I never shook hands and I didn't hug people. So this is well, far too easy. Oh, you hugged me, Paul. <laughs> or I, maybe I should well, say I, I you, you. You, you passed the sniff test. <laughs> oh, I, okay. right, people come you. up to me and I haven't seen them for years. No, it's okay. Yeah. No hugging, the three pats on the back. Yeah, it's, it's okay. It's very, it's a very strange thing though. And I know Paul, you haven't been out very much. I was, I went into Portland yesterday. I needed barbecue. Like I'm like, okay, I've had enough. We've been trapped long enough. You know, there are places where you can just go order online and go get takeout where you don't have to be around anyone else. And it's just a very strange experience going into the city, and it's like a neutron bomb was dropped. There's just nobody there. Um, and I just don't know how long cities can keep going this way. Uh, before everything really just starts to break down. Well, yeah. I think we can all agree on one thing. You can kiss the salad bar goodbye. Yeah, that's gone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and buffets in general. Yep, buffets yeah, are right. What's Vegas going to do? <laughs> um, I know, right? <laughs> Where are you supposed to nurse your hangover if not at the buffet? Yeah. <laughs> you have to have full course dinners and pay five times the amount. Oh, there you go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, oh, my gosh. Well, Ben, Ben, I wish you luck because out of all of us, obviously, you're exposed more than anyone else, right, being out in the community every day. So, um, you know, I, I know we're speaking to a lot of different uh, manufacturers and device vendors and stuff, and they're all coming up with ways to socially distance using tech. So hopefully you're taking right. advantage of at least some of it. You got the shields up at least. Uh, on your slip lamp. You bet. Yeah. Yeah. I feel, I feel, I feel good about our current system. Um, um, I do. I think we're doing as much, if not more than, um, um, a lot of places that I talk to, but I mean, we just, we just have to continue to be open about it. We just have to continue to go back and forth and bounce ideas back and forth and listen to our guidelines and pray to whoever we pray to that this is over at some point. Absolutely. All right, Ben. Well, thanks for doing this today, and thanks for that epic lecture that you just gave. You have another one, right? You have, uh, have... I do. I'll see you for uh, glaucoma in about a half hour. All right. Cool. Good deal. Hey, thanks, hey listen, it's great hearing from everybody. Y'all all have a great day. You too. Thanks, Ben. I'll see you later. Okay. Bye-bye, Ben. Bye. All right, so so Gretchen, you're going to go all anti-vaxxer on me for this one when we finally have it, huh? You know, I was wondering if I should have kept my mouth shut. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I, I completely get what you're saying. I mean, the fact that they're rushing these trials is a little bit unnerving. <laughs> um, well, you know. I, don't, I don't want to say that I am a complete anti-vaxxer because I'm not. I am more of a cautious vaxxer. I wish that I hadn't listened to the chicken pox advice from my daughter's pediatrician because she had the first dose. And that was when I was a lot younger and I hadn't learned all the things that I had learned. So when it came time for her second one, um, we got her a titer and she still showed immunity. Hmm. So I didn't have her get one. I would have rather of her had the natural um, virus and just get chicken pox like all of us did as kids. And I opted out of um, 
uh, what is Gardasil? Uh, cervical? Ca no, HPV. HPV That's yeah. HPV. Um, yep. I opted out of that. But my daughter's over 18 now, and so we've had conversations, and I said, it's her body, and it's her choice. This is what I decided, and here's why, and here's information. And she did sign up um, three years ago, I guess it was, almost three years ago, two years ago. She got rabies vaccines because hmm. she went to Costa Rica and was handling bats. And she was the only student in her group who opted for the vaccine. And they needed at least one student to get it in order to have bats as a project option because there were, uh, they were there, they were visiting different ecosystems in Costa Rica over their winter break a few years ago. And there were bat or butterflies and birds and she really wanted bats. So she got the vaccine and I joked that I took her to the vet to get the rabies shots um <laughs> but it was a series of three and she decided and given that she wants to work with animals during her life for her career it was a smart move but others are now up to her and my job is to give her information and her job is to decide so i'm more of a space it out as rather than a non-vaxxer so that's why i don't want to have my head stamped with anti-vaxxer. Yeah. Although I will say I am an anti-flu vaxxer. I haven't gotten the flu vaccine and I don't plan to, so. What about the herpes zoster when you reach the um, age that you should get it? The new one, Shingrix, which is really effective. For shingles, you mean? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I need to know more information about that because I did have chicken pox as a kid and I do have herpes simplex in my system just because when I am really stressed, I tend to get cold sores. So I caught that when I was in college. So I don't know. That's a really good question, Steve. And the simplex is not related, but chickenpox means that you're probably more likely to get shingles because you've got the vaccinia virus in your system. So well, I had it. It was nothing. I mean, it's two doses um, uh, covered by insurance and uh, it, one third of the people develop shingles in their lifetime, and now I, that I check that box off, it's 97% effective. Yeah. The older vaccine, I don't care, you don't have to know the name of it, uh, that was only about 50% effective. But they're, they're actually, when you reach the age of 50 is when you're supposed to get it, so you have a few more years to go for that. But um, oh, Aren't you a sweetie? <laughs> yeah, I am. Well, um, but <laughs> Well, so the bottom line, though, is for the, the, you know, the COVID one, if and when it comes out, I'm going to take it straight away and take one for the team because I want to do whatever I can to disrupt the chain of infection. And if I'm one carrier less, that's fine. I'm pretty sure I can withstand most of whatever the, the bad effects of it are going to be. I mean, unless they develop, you know, a vaccine that is just completely, you know, unsuited for human use. <laughs> Um, yeah, but how do you know? That's the thing. I so mean, the, the trials are going to be big enough, I would imagine, for this, because so many people want it, that there's going to be a natural experiment happening. I won't be the very first, I'm sure, to get it. Um, you know, So I think of the several thousand people involved in the trial, they're going to work out pretty well what the problems are with it, I have a feeling. So, it's just longitudinally. Yeah. What's the effect three, four, five years yeah. down the road? You're not going to know that. You won't know that. But, you know, the recruitment for this is going to be so big that at the very least in the short term, we'll have some sense. And, you know, I, I don't want to feel like I'm contributing to the problem is, I guess, my point. I don't want to be part of that chain where this thing keeps uh -huh. ping, ping ponging around. So I'm willing to take one for the team because someone has to or else this is never going to go away. Yep. So anyway. I don't disagree. I just wish that we would have more longitudinal data on it. Oh, no, I agree completely. In an ideal world, I, I agree, too. It's just, uh, I mean, ultimately, we should have been more prepared for this, right? As Bill Gates said from way back when, he wished he was more forceful about it. Um, so, because they've been studying coronaviruses for years. No one really ever put it on the forefront. And, you know, who could have foreseen that it would have been this bad? Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how many get the common cold this year. Right. With the social distancing. Yeah, or the flu for that matter. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Uh, and I think we have another we have another interview coming up right now. I think uh, we've gone yep. we've, we've gone overboard on uh, on the virus. <laughs> but let's actually <laughs> let's actually see uh, if if uh, Ben from Zeiss is here. Ben, are you here? Ben, yes or no? If you're not, I don't think so. If you're not, we're gonna have to talk more about the virus. <laughs> yeah. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. 
Um, <laughs> all right, so hopefully Ben will get here soon and we can talk to him a little bit uh, about more social distancing stuff since, uh, you know, we Oh, did you see, um, did you, I, I passed it on to you, Steve, and, and Adam hasn't seen it. Uh, yes, the editorial great by, piece. by Art Epstein. Great piece, just on CE in general, Kent Education. I just read it um, during the break. I saw it as well. Yeah, yeah he, so he's, he's making an active push. I think he also wants to get into the act. Well, the, the like bottom line is the... he's lost a lot of income. He does so much live CE that I think it's I think it's commendable that he's um, approaching this from the avenue that it's good, not bad. Even though it's uh, to him personally, it's actually a loss. Well, you know, I've spoken with Art, think... I've spoken with him a lot wow. extensively on the phone. Art and I do talk a fair bit, and I think he realizes the value of a lot of the continuing education online, although. He'll tell you too that the in-person component is important as well, and I agree with him. You know, there are some things that you really do want to be face-to-face -face for, uh, but I think that he, he, like us, is probably just a little bit sick of all the sort of different rules that are out there, right? It would be nice to get some sort of a common framework and agreement upon, you know, with everyone getting together and figuring out what this should look like. Because the number of questions just over the last couple of days that I've had to answer about what counts and what doesn't is just crazy. It's not really an efficient system. Just imagine his so, lifestyle has its changed. He was in an airport every single weekend, and for the last three or four months, he's been home. Uh, big, big change for him. I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure sick. Shannon. Shannon's probably ready and, to kill him, right? Sense. <laughs> Boy, you know, it's going to be tough on the marriage. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, the the, the uh, I was going to say something, and I oh yeah, the the question I have there are a lot of name speakers that are doing freebies. Mm -hmm. Free webinars, blah, blah, blah. Do you think that the speakers are getting reimbursed by the companies? Nothing's free. And, and, it, well, and, yeah. and if so, how is, why is COPE accepting it? So, the, well, they're, they're doing it as a, as a grant. And the grant means that they really, like, we, we know we can't highlight a piece of equipment, a company, et cetera. So they're speaking generally about subjects, but not specifically promoting the particular grantee, grantor. Um, for these conferences. And then there's the ophthalmologists that I have locally and regionally that are doing it for free just to develop a, a database of doctors to solicit from. So there's a lot of, it's always about the money, except for us. Uh, but um, so I think that you do see that when you see these lectures for free, four credits, et cetera, um, with a uh, unconditional grant by, and you could fill in uh, a number of names, that's how it's being done. So they're getting paid, I'm not sure how much, but you know their um, lectures have to uh, pass the SNEF test of uh, Arbo Cope. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. and and I think that the quality of the lectures is is different, right? So some of them, you know, are very high quality. Some of them less so. And I think just in the period that we're in right now, until the end of June, it's going to be like the Wild West, right? Everybody's trying to well, do something because they can. Uh, I've seen some things that probably. If Arbo knew about them or were looking closely, they'd probably you know tell them to cut it out. Uh, frankly, over the past couple of days, things like single companies setting up CE, which they're really not supposed to do. Um, right. You know, even using their own employees to actually give the CE, they're really not supposed to do that. Um, so yep. things like that, if Cope found out, would probably not fly. But you know, people are doing it. And like I said, I've attended several um, online CEs, uh, mostly webinar formats, where I click in, take the quiz, pass it. Never listen to a, a, a second of things. So they don't monitor like we monitor, and I don't even I don't need those credits. I don't use them, but uh, they, they're certainly not following the rules. That um, and those rules are good rules. You have to listen to the lecture to get some education. Yep. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not entirely sure why you know they're allowing it. They probably I mean if you think about it, Arbo itself is not exactly a huge organization, right? They only have a few full time employees. So actually trying to catch the people who aren't in compliance can be really challenging. Um, yeah, how come all their employees are always at our lectures, though? <laughs> so, you know, we, <laughs> we, we, we have we, nothing to hide. Well, no, so we, we've uh, drawn, uh, you know, Cope's attention because just because of the sheer number of people that are coming through our lectures, right? When we make a mistake, it impacts, you know, hundreds or thousands of people, and then we have to go back and correct that mistake. And so they're watching us closely, and I don't blame them one iota. In fact, I've been in communication with them a lot over the past couple of weeks because I want to make sure that we're doing everything right because you want to catch the mistake before you make it because you don't want to have to go back and fix everybody's credits or whatever else. Uh, so that's why they're watching us a little bit closely and I completely get it. 
Um, you know, we, we want, in this case, the regulator to watch us closely and make sure we're doing everything right so we don't have to make work for ourselves later. Yep. Well, we are, so we don't have anything to worry about. Yep. And I, I think wanna... anyone is listening. I... We no have one's a... sort of... Yeah, we no have one's a, been on our chat here. So we have a few people think listening. On? Yeah, we do have we do have several people listening. It's on Facebook as well. I don't know. I think tomorrow, Steve, what we can do is maybe try to embed it in private practice and optometry. Uh, we can work on it tonight. I can, if you make me an administrator in the group, I might be able to embed it there as well, uh, so people can can get to it. They have really funky embedding rules, as I learned yesterday. Like I couldn't even embed the stream on the OD Wire page until I manually approved it to do so, which I thought was funny since I administer both the CE Wire and the OD Wire page. Are you a member of the group, then? Did you join? I, I think I did. If I didn't, I have to do it tonight. I spent so little yep. time on Facebook that I just, I, you know, my settings are, uh, who knows? So, yeah, let me let me check it out tonight after we're done here, and we'll set it up for tomorrow I, morning. I can't make it in name unless you're in the group, because you can't do that. Okay. So after after we get off here, we'll send the link, and we'll we'll set it all up, and then tomorrow we can try it again and see, because, yeah, I just, I spent so little time there. And again, LinkedIn, we're going to probably do that for the June conference. We'll have it streaming there as well. Um, so that, that's another interesting place to do it. By the way, it, the streams are working. Um, I have them on Facebook now. So the stream is there's up. There's no Facebook. Adam Farkas. Okay, so you're not in the group. You have to join. Fire. And there's now four, the four hundred people in the group. Okay, so I'll join the group, uh, and, uh, and then we can try to embed it tomorrow and see. So we'll that's see my little goes. beep. I have to change phones because this battery's dying. <laughs> Let me just I'll, I'll keep on talking. Go ahead. I'm here. Okay, so. Yep, no problem. We're just waiting around for Ben from Zeiss to come, so I don't think he's here yet. And if he doesn't make it, that's okay, too. Um, and then we're going to take a nice long break, uh, and then Tammy uh, is going to be around here at 2 o'clock. Um, I see oh, she... I have to... Wait, Let me on have... Tammy. It was so funny. She posted something on Facebook. Uh, she went at it. Uh, this is uh, related to the virus, but not, you know, she's a full-time teacher. She's online with VT and stuff, and she has three little boys, 9, 7, and 5, all been home for months, and she's pulling her hair out. So she decides to go out with them in the morning to, for a little 15 minute walk on the boardwalk or something. And they pass the donor place and she didn't bring any money. So very quickly, um, she couldn't get the kid a donut. And he, for the, now the walk back took an hour and a half. He walked as slow as he could. He said, don't look at me. Don't talk to me. And, uh, <laughs> and I asked my daughters, what would your kids do? And they said, oh, that, that was great. They would have hit me and, and been on the floor. <laughs> so, so you can talk to Tammy about that. Um, that's I'll, awesome. I'll chime in. Oh, my God. That's okay. awesome. All right. Yeah, because she's, she's making lunch, actually, for kids right now. So at, at 2 o'clock, though, our time, or I guess 5 o'clock her time, we'll have her on. We were going to do an interview with Conan, too, but unfortunately, they can't make it today. I just got the message. So we're just going to take a nice long break here um, if Ben doesn't show up. But, you know, what I want to do is actually uh, post, post up here so you can see on the uh, page right now talking about – whoops. Let me just uh, – Hang on here a second. Talking about um, CWire and the size of the conference. So I think you guys can all see just how big it's become um, size-wise. And Steve, I think those numbers are close to right. Uh, obviously, yep. I haven't been checking today. We've gotten a lot of people come in today. So it's been yep. kind of a kind of a free-for-all here. So, But about 5,000 ODs. So that makes it the largest conference in optometry, period. Uh, Expo West has about 3,200 ODs that show. And as far as I know, and Dad, you know, you can correct me, you've only been attending conferences since like 1950. Um, you know, yeah. <laughs> conferences have only gotten bigger over time, right? So this would make it probably the largest of all time, physical or virtual. Yeah, I would, not only have I attended, but I still have t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> that I'm still wearing. Girl, I, I used to, at the, end of, okay, at, the, at the end of some of the conventions, I used to go into the convention hall and they used to have the extra large left, and I would, I would take a half a dozen at a time. So they, they hung on. I, I still have one from the, uh, a, a green one, from the AOA's hundredth anniversary. I think it was 1976. Oh my God. So. Okay. For, Did you ever go to 1996? 1996. Oh, 1996 the one. Yeah. You know, so, I think that that's my most classic one now. Yeah, Did you ever go to Prentice's sure. and Skeffington's booth? I'm sorry, say it again. Did you ever go to Prentice's and Skeffington's booths? <laughs> <laughs> they practiced in that 1920s up there. Oh my God. Well, yeah. I, I, it looks to and, me like. Uh, uh, it looks you know, like, uh, 
I mean, but Dad, so seriously, you, you have attended these things forever. What were the size of the conferences like right. before? I remember you told me they used to hold one in the Drake, and that wasn't a very big place, so... We, yeah, we were basically, we, the, you know, the, this whole idea of having vendors to come to meetings is a relatively new idea. I, I think Irving Bennett was the one that promoted it. The Academy ne never had vendors, and they never had wives. In those days, there weren't women in optometry very, very much. And when they held it at the Drake Hotel, it was a small hotel. And, uh, and it was... Uh, it was just education and fun for the guys, but the, the ladies were left out. Uh, but but as far as uh, exhibit halls, uh, that really didn't start until uh, OptiFair. You know, Irv Ur Bennett started OptiFair uh, in New York City. And at it the was Hilton, such right? a hit. The Hilton? Yeah, it was at the Hilton. Yeah, and they, that's, you know, and, and it, was, it was psychologically, it, it was so busy because the, it was so crowded at the meeting halls that it was really was a hit. Uh, so yeah, that was yeah, uh, so 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 basically uh, having the, the vendors and and those, and those numbers and I have a feeling some some of the meetings uh, they fudge the numbers because they include the vendors and they include the wives, you know, who is attending rather than just the ODs. Yes. So for sure, the five thousand is. Yeah, so, way, way, way above. So in most, in most media kits these days, they do try to break out the types of attendees. Expo actually does a very detailed job, and that's how I know they have 3,200 uh, last year. Uh, and Expo East has 2,800. Was it 3,200 um, 32, ODs? Correct. Or would, does that include opticians and no, ophthalmologists? No, no, 3,200 OD. ODs. 3,200 ODs. Uh -huh. The site, you know, the Expo itself has you know, 10,000 people or something, but most are not actually doctors. Um, so they're, they're mostly just opticians and, you know, people in industry and so forth. So, uh, it's hard to actually, yeah, also. it's hard to tease out numbers, uh, from the other meetings. Like AOA actually does a decent job of breaking it out. They usually have about 1800 doctors according to their media kit. Uh, SECO plays the numbers much closer, uh, to the vest. I have no idea exactly how many. Um, but yeah, so as far as I can tell, you know, we're, we've, we've, we've uh, cracked the code here at least this year. So, 5,000. So, anyway. Maybe we'll have 6,000 by the end of June. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, we'll see. You know, June's going to be a fun run-up. We'll see how it goes. But, all right, so I think what we should do then, since uh, I don't see uh, Ben coming at all, I want to actually play a video for people. Uh, it's a webinar that we just did recently with Craig Thomas, um, and it's all about COVID and coming back and getting your practice back online and what new things you can do to try to enhance your revenues. And specifically, he was talking about allergy and, and, uh, and dry eye. So I don't know if you guys caught this one before, uh, but it's a pretty interesting lecture, as all of his are. Uh, we did it on the site, I guess, about a month ago. So I want to play that for everyone now, because we have a pretty long break. And then at 2 p.m. Pacific time, 5 Eastern, we're going to get Tammy back, uh, and we'll talk to her. So how does that sound? But I'll still patrol okay. the classrooms, make sure. Yeah, so far, all the doctors have been there, so very good. Okay, great. Let me see. So I... What time are we coming back then? Uh, 2 p.m. Pacific, so 5, 5 Eastern. Okay. All righty. All right. So let me see if okay. I can get let me see if I can get this going. Hopefully, uh, it won't blow everything up here. Let's see if I can find I'll, it. I'll wait to make sure that it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's always an adventure, isn't it? Love your new graphics. <laughs> uh, okay, I have it here. So hopefully, it won't just destroy the entire system, but. Uh, if not, I will see all of you guys uh, in a little bit, I guess. Uh, working right. on this presentation, Bye -bye. reading Bye. articles, research, uh, talking to a few people around the country. Uh, you know, a lot of time uh, for uh, something kind of out of nowhere. And as we get into it, it'll all make sense, hopefully, and, and you guys will get the benefit uh, of this work and, and can carry it further. So you see the, the title, Outbreak Optometry, uh, Clinical Care After the COVID-19 Pandemic. So... To me, we're, we're practicing outbreak optometry right now. Uh, we're rendering urgent care. I don't know about the rest of you guys. Uh, I decided uh, approximately the, the day that the county judge said stop working, that we would stop working uh, because I started seeing young people get sick. Most of my staff is young. They have young kids. Uh, you know, selling glasses and dispensing contacts is a fairly intimate experience. You're up on close to people and touching them. And uh, we just decided that it wasn't worth the risk. And, and so we shut it down. Uh, as to, except for urgent care emergencies. 
and, and we see three or four, five of those a day, you know, the, it, but that's not enough to make any money. It's not enough to stay open. Uh, we're, we're losing money every day that we're open, but we are providing urgent care. That's what we're supposed to do uh, as opposed to just totally closing down. And anybody that's real busy, uh, most of us are fairly busy. You can't just shut your business down on Tuesday if they say shut it down on Monday. People still have to pick up glasses. People still have contacts coming in. It, you have to wind it down. So we've kind of wind it down to where now there's no really glasses and, and contacts to pick up other than people ordering contacts, which they still do. But it's pretty slow. Uh, and I think it's going to stay that way for several weeks. Uh, my feeling is that uh, uh, maybe, you know, if we get lucky, and people stop getting real sick like they are now, you know, maybe first week in May, second week in May, who knows? I mean, I'm hoping, uh, I'm thinking it'll be sometime in May, we'll get back to normal. And then we'll be practicing uh, what can be called, you know, post pandemic optometry, which is going to be different than it was pre pandemic or during the current pandemic. Now, almost like a, a before, during and an after uh, we're in the during right now. <clears throat> and we're going to we're going to be in the after hopefully in a few weeks and who knows how long the after is going to last or what it's going to be like who can predict the future but i'm trying to get ready and predict it as best i can based on my 36 years of being a private practice optometrist in Dallas Texas so i've got some insight as to what i think is going to happen so we'll proceed so we're you know kind of the whole gist of this thing this coronavirus outbreak covid-19 uh, you know, the first thing, and <clears throat> I didn't really put a whole lot of information on here because everybody's office is different. Everybody's going to go at this a little different. Uh, the main thing is, you know, we're now going to have to incorporate a heightened level of infection control in our offices. Those of us that are not closed right now and still seeing patients on a limited basis have already started doing it uh, for our own particular office. Uh, I've got masks for everybody. Uh, we give the patient a mask if they don't have one when they come in. They wash their hands the instant they get in here. Uh, we, we wash our hands before and after in front of the patient. We wipe the equipment down. Uh, you know, we, we, we take reasonable precaution to, to disinfect the multiple contact points that exist in an optometric practice. They are so numerous and the precautions are, are are so comprehensive to, to really do it properly. Again, in this one presentation, I didn't think I needed to spend 10 slides talking about it. From a, uh, a medical legal perspective, which I generally don't care about too much, uh, but you know, just to, to be thorough, uh, you'd have to be aware that you'd have the occasional knucklehead patient that would come into an office, say that they got infected by coming to your practice, and then try to sue you. Uh, you know, good luck with that. But, you know, they may try just to be a nuisance. And, and if they have a knucklehead lawyer, you know, they could bother you. I think as long as you can prove that you're following uh, Centers for Disease Control recommendations, if you just say, hey, look, I, I, I do whatever the CDC says do. If they said put a mask on, we put a mask on. If they say stand on your head, we stand on your head. Whatever they say do, we do. I think as long as you go by their guidelines, you're going to be fine. Uh, you know, nobody's trying to be really crazy, hopefully. Uh, but infection control uh, will have to be a point of emphasis. Uh, people will have to see it. It'll have to be obvious, not subtle. Uh, it'll have to be right up front. It'll have to go on for a while. Uh, it may not, I don't know if it'll ever go back down the way it was. Uh, you know, but I don't think I'm going to shake, I don't, I don't think I'm going to wash my hands before I touch the patient and after I touch the patient a year from now. I don't know if I'm still going to be doing that stuff. I always wash them once. I don't know if I'm going to go twice. We'll see. But I think uh, the first thing as we talk about practicing optometry going forward and now uh, infection control. So I'll leave you guys to that. You can hit the, the website. I'll put the stuff up there for you to go look at it. Uh, so you know, read to your heart's content. And again, we all have some time to read uh, right now. Let's use it constructively. Uh, I, I, you know, I put this up here. Uh, this, this second slide is, you know, just a nice schematic of the COVID virus. I just, you know, hijacked it from Medscape. You see there, I want to give them credit. Uh, you know, I put this up here for review. Uh, we are doctors. We are scientists. Everybody listening has been to a bunch of classes on microbiology and cell biology and anatomy and physiology and immunology and all kind of stuff. That's why we're, I mean, just really, we're smarter than everybody else almost. I mean, we're pretty smart. 
uh, well, we, we got a uh, to where, you know, when I put this little schematic thing up here and I started looking at it, almost everything made sense. I mean, I remembered all of it. Uh, not, not heavy detail, but I remembered what a, a, a protein capsid was. I remembered stuff about the envelope membrane down here. I remembered that terminology. Uh, so it's not like I'm looking at some kind of you know, Ouija board thing. I mean, I, I know what I'm looking at. I'm looking at a virus. But I wanted to refresh everybody about what these things are. Okay, and what they're made of and the constituent parts of them. And, and, and you see that here. <clears throat> and, and I spent a lot of time looking on the internet, trying to find pictures that everybody would understand. This was the best one I found. So just as a review, you know, this is what that COVID virus looks like, you know, in, a, in an artist rendition. Okay, uh, here's the Centers for Disease Control uh, rendition. And this is the image we see on TV all the time, this, this virus uh, spherical looking thing right here. This is the one I've seen most often. And again, just as a, a refresher, I mean, I'm 60 years old. I got out of optometry school in 1983. Uh, you know, I, who knows when I actually went to microbiology. I mean, this might have been in the 70s. Uh, so even though I'm pretty smart and I got a good memory, I wanted to refresh myself. So I spent a little bit of time refreshing myself. So I want to refresh y'all too. You know, hey, you know, there may be the occasional patient that looks you dead in the eye because you're a doctor and says, hey, doctor, would you please explain to me what the difference between a virus and a bacteria is, please? You know, and we shouldn't be stumbling and bumbling if that ever happens. So I wanted to review that again, you know, with this virus. What is the virus? You know, it's, what's the difference between a, a virus and a bacteria and a protozoa? Or what, you know, because they're different. And so the first thing you got to remember, uh, and I remember this back in, in from the 70s in my microbiology and the you know, the stuff I saw as recently as this weekend was talking about the same kind of stuff is that, you know, do you really call a virus something that's alive? You know, is it a piece of chemicals? Is it, is it a different form of life from outer space? You know, what is the thing? You know, it doesn't re meet the, the standard definition of life that we use, uh, but it's pretty close. You know, I don't know if close counts. You know, is it alive or is it not? Uh, it, it certainly, to me, it's more alive than dead. So what it is, you know, at a base level, you know, it's a bunch of molecules put together with different kind of genetic material. And, and you see, you know, the little bullets here. So what's inside this thing is proteins, genetic material, RNA, DNA, the different kinds, the, the single stranded doubles. Y'all remember all of that stuff. I mean, it came back to me kind of, you know, to where I remembered it. I mean, I can't write an essay on it, but I remembered it to where I have a, an awareness of it. And so when someone says there's a bunch of RNA and DNA inside this thing, okay, I know what they're talking about. Uh, and then the whole ball is, is called a protein capsid. So just a kind of a, a virology lesson, as it were. So now you, you hopefully maybe kind of sort of know a little bit more about viruses and what this thing is uh, compared to just, you know, 10 minutes ago. So let's move forward, okay? So we've talked a little bit about about viruses and the coronavirus. And why are we talking about that? Why, why are we talking about that stuff? This is why. I got to tell you, uh, you know, this, this whole presentation, you know, the guys uh, asked me about, I guess maybe two and a half, three weeks ago, hey, Craig, you want to do a presentation for the society? Uh, you know, during the, you know, we don't have regular speakers now. And I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, no problem. Absolutely. Just, just tell me when. And then, that, you know, like two days later, I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I don't have a presentation. And like, what did I do? Why did I do, <laughs> what am I doing? And, and so I started working on it, trying to conceive. And, and I just, you know, I kind of had some ideas. And then it all kind of crystallized over the weekend where I did most of this work. And I was sitting there watching CNN on Saturday, just, you know, watching the virus news. You know, that's what we do now, some of us. So I was watching the virus news and trying to stay up to date. And CNN had this, this uh, uh, special show on in the afternoon. And... <clears throat> And I got to tell you, I sat there, watched it like I was a crackhead hooked. Uh, and and it, was a, it was a show on the immune system and the virus and how the virus enters the cells and what it does. And it started showing pictures of, of proteins reacting with cell membranes and pictures of histocompatibility complexes doing this and that. And I was like, wow, man, well, look at that. I mean, this is incredible. I like, they're doing an immunology lesson on CNN that's fairly sophisticated to where I had to recall my doctor training and knowledge, but it was simple enough and the graphics were simple enough to where regular people, if they really were paying attention, I think they would have understood most of it. And I was just, and I understood it all, of course. 
and it was really interesting. I don't want to say fascinating because it was stuff I knew, but to see it presented and reviewed uh, in such a, a modern way and in such a timely manner and, and how they were linking it to people getting sick and, and then they were trying to explain how, you know, some people get the virus and they barely have any symptoms and some people get the virus and they're, they're in the hospital for two weeks and some people get the virus and they're dead. And, you know, we're thinking it's the same virus. So what's the difference? The difference is the people in their immune system and the response. And, the, and the, the, the thing on CNN was trying to blend all that and weave it together to where the people that were listening would have some kind of idea what was going on and why. And it was, I just found it just incredibly interesting. So I'm sitting there watching this show and, I, and, it, and it's like the light bulb going off in my head, you know, with the cartoons. And it's like, ding, 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 ding. I say, idea. I got idea. I said, this is the idea. And it all came together. So this is, this is it all coming together, okay? So you see the slide on the immune system. You guys have hopefully been reading the stuff while I'm talking. Uh, you see all the organs and whatnot so, you know, that make up the immune system. And this is, a, you know, the third grade rendition. This is not, you know, a sophisticated uh, a rendition of the immune system showing how the stomach comes into play and all the intestinal stuff. And, you know, there, there's, a, there's more parts to it than this. Uh, but this is the, the, the main stuff, okay? So you, you see the little bullets. I've got them there. I'm not going to read them out loud to you. Y'all can y'all read the bullets. So this is what the immune system is all about, trying to, trying to keep us healthy, okay? Now, the function of the immune system is to produce an immune response, and we've all heard that term. We've seen it before. And so, again, you see these, these bullets here. And there's, you know, literally who knows how many kinds of immune responses that, that the body can produce. Uh, this, this kind of cartoonish graphic that I put over here is simply a representation of one of them. And remember, what, what generally happens, uh, you know, is that something gets in the body. It could be a virus, a bacteria, something that's foreign, whatever, or something, something that ain't supposed to be there. So something gets in the body. And the body recognizes that it's, it's not supposed to be there. And the recognition of that foreignness or that harmfulness it initiates the inflammatory response. Uh, the inflammatory response is, is basically a bunch of chemicals. It's a chemical reaction. A bunch of chemicals getting released. Uh, you see there on that second bullet how it happens, you know, whatever there's injury, trauma, whatever. And, and you get this inflammatory reaction that starts... Uh, without getting into the whole immunology, immune response lecture, uh, you know, there's a whole sequence of events, a cascade of events, you know, one thing happens that makes the other thing happen, that makes the third thing happen, almost some kind of a biblical, you know, somebody begetting somebody else. So you get this cascade of events, chemical reactions, one reaction causing another, causing another, and eventually the blood vessels swell all up, leaks fluid into the tissue, and you have the obvious clinical signs of uh, of inflammation. <clears throat> and then the last thing, kind of the, again, the cartoon graphic I've got represented is that once the, the cell membranes get damaged uh, from whatever the, 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 the initiating insult is, then the, 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 the intracellular contents get kind of disgorged into the extracellular space and all that stuff that's inside the cell is now outside. And, and it's like, you know, kind of flipping a switch. And once those cells get outside into the extracellular environment, they, they produce this chemical signaling thing that we call chemotaxis, where it draws all these other white blood cells that are in the, the uh, uh, blood system floating around in the, in the uh, blood vessels. You know, they're the white blood cells, they roam, not roam, they float. Uh, the, it's almost like some kind of slow river attraction at a kid's park. You know, the white blood cells are floating around in the blood system in an inactive state. Because uh, they can't be active because they'd be killing stuff all the time. So they, 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 they can't be, they got to kind of, they're in hibernation almost, like some bear in a cave. So the white blood cells are floating around in your blood system, kind of hibernate and stay asleep. And then when something gets hurt and, and the cells get damaged and the cell membranes rupture and all those chemicals come out, the chemicals draw the white blood cells to that site and then turn them on, what we call activate them. And then they start doing all kinds of stuff and, and killing things. So that's, that is a standard immune response. That's how it's supposed to happen. And in the, in the concept and context of what we're talking about today, the, the COVID virus, you see, I happen to find a picture where they actually have a virus instead of a bacteria or something. You know, viruses are pretty small. You see the virus right up here, you know, and, and the virus, you know, I mean, I, it's really, it's kind of cool in a way. I mean, I don't know when 
and I'm gonna use the information other than talking and teaching because <clears throat> I'm never gonna talk to a patient like this. But I mean, I was actually going through slides three days ago where if you look at this picture and you see these little receptor sites coming in and these proteins that are coming off the, the capsid shell of the virus, and, and they was talking about how the, the, the receptors bond to these protein sites and, and they link in. And <clears throat> I mean, it's just, you know, the science is incredible. Uh, you know, the, it's all chemistry. It's just everything's chemistry. So you see these, these attachments. The virus now gets, gets attached to the cell. The cell gobbles it up and then kills it and excretes out the rest. Okay, that's, we've all learned that. We learned that. I learned that stuff 37 years ago, but it's nice to review it, okay? And if you want to access it, here's the reference right here. So we've talked about the immune system. We've talked about the COVID virus. We looked at it in a, in a nice uh, graphic rendition. Okay, so we, we, we got some, some references on the CDC right here. Okay, let's keep going. So now, now, <clears throat> now we've got some refresher. Let's, let's, let's pivot again and let's talk about immune response disorders. Immune response disorders. We were just talking about the immune response. We were just talking about the immune system. Immune system, immune response, immune response disorders. You see the natural progression here, what we're talking about. So, and, and, and this is really, really, it's important stuff. So immune system disorders, you know, it, it, you guys have heard me talk more than once. Remember always, if I read a slide out loud, man, it's like three test questions, you know, if we were in optometry school. If I'm reading it out loud, say it word for word. Immune system disorders are characterized by one of the following. So it's directed against healthy tissue. That's option one. Option two is just, it's, it's excessive. You know, it's, it's too strong. It's too strong. It's too much juice in there. Or it's too weak. You know, it's like a wet noodle. So, so you either get it too strong, too weak, or it's going in the wrong place. Okay, those are your three options. There ain't no fourth option. So you're going to get it going in the wrong place. It's going to be too strong or it's going to be too weak. If it's just right, then the immune system is working properly. So there is a fourth option where everything is okay. Okay, so you got everything being okay, and you got one of these three things. And whenever one of these three things happens, it produces one of these things down here. Allergy, anaphylaxis, autoimmune, immunodeficiency, transplant rejection, okay? You see how that flows there. I tried to do the, gra the easy graphics with the big arrow. Okay, one of these three things is going to make one of these things happen. We all have lost count of the patients complaining of allergy in our office, and we are now going to pivot to that. So we're still talking immune system response disorders, immune response disorders. This is a test question, ladies and gentlemen. You see the first sentence. I'm going to read it slowly out loud. The immune system response is classified as either efficient or inefficient. And an efficient response protects against many diseases and disorders, while an inefficient response allows disease to develop. You have efficient, inefficient. No third option, no fourth option, no in-between. It's working or it's not. You're pregnant or you're not. It's that simple. That is the terminology that I have seen in the peer-reviewed scientific journals that I read to research for this presentation. That is the terminology that I'm going to use going forward. So immune system response is efficient or inefficient. If the response is altered and inefficient, then you can have one of these things, okay? We can, you see that. So now, I'm not going to have a lecture on autoimmune disorders and immunodeficiency disorders and transplant rejections. I've talked about that stuff before, but that's not what we're talking about today, okay? Today, we're going to talk about allergy types, and I promise you this is all going to go together, and we're going to come back to the COVID-19 pandemic thing and practice an optometry post-pandemic, okay? It's going to make sense. Allergy types. You see the different allergy types. I didn't know all of this stuff. I thought allergy was allergy, you know. You know, I mean, I had some awareness. Again, I'm, a, I'm you know, I mean, I've been to college. Uh, but I didn't know the difference, you know, the sinusitis. I didn't know that was a specific kind of allergy different than allergic rhinitis. You know, I didn't, I didn't know that. Uh, I, 
I didn't know that drug allergy is really different than general allergy, that there's a different mechanism, kind of. I, I, I didn't know that. So I, I saw some stuff from, I looked up these guys, uh, the American Academy of Allergy, uh, Asthma and Immunology. Uh, you know, you can access their stuff on the web pretty easy. So, so this is what they say. So this ain't no review of optometry and optometric management. <laughs> this ain't primary care optometry news. Uh, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but, you know, I'm starting from scratch. Uh, I thought I would start here, you know, to get my base information because I thought they would have the most experience. So that's, that's where I went. So these are the different kind of allergy types, okay? These are examples of common allergens. We've all seen this stuff before. This is stuff that we know. We know this stuff. You know, this, this first picture, this is some kind of plant mold spore looking thing. Uh, some kind of flowers, some ragweed looking stuff, and the the ubiquitous and infamous dust mite. Uh, uh, you know, only time we ever talk about critters usually is is talking about uh, demodex mites. You know, messing with somebody with blepharitis. You know, we talk about that stuff sometimes. And I can't remember the last time I had a conversation with a patient, and I'm talking, and the words dust mite are coming out of my mouth. <laughs> you know, but I'm telling you, as soon as I get back started, it's going to be a regular. Uh, that's why I put these pictures up here. Okay, I'm going to talk about all this stuff. You'll see why. So, you know, quickly review allergy types. So we, we're, we're, we were talking about immune system, immune response, immune res response disorders, immune response disorders. We're going to concentrate on the allergy type of immune response ah, disorder. These are examples of common things that cause allergies. They are called allergens of course, and this should be reviewed. So now we've got two, three basics to go forward. We talked about the COVID virus a little bit, okay? Talked about immunolo immunologic stuff, immunology, immune system, immune response, abnormal re immune responses, inefficiency versus efficient, okay? A lot of stuff just for 20, 25 minutes so far. So kind of put that all in the little uh, Al Gore type lockbox, you know, put that to the side right now. Okay. Let's pivot again and let's turn ourselves into eye doctors again because, because I was an immunologist a minute ago. So now I'm back to being an optometrist and I'm thinking I'm an optometrist. I've been an optometrist for 36 years. I ain't never been through nothing like this. I, I, we are essentially out of business. You know, I can actually shut my business and not lose as much money than being in business and losing money like I am right now. <laughs> so this, you know, this is uncharted territory here. We in new waters. So when you're in new waters, uncharted territory, you got no compass, you don't know where you're going, man, you got to go back to the basics. And to me, other than selling glasses and contacts, which I just told you I don't really want to do today, <laughs> okay, you're too close to people, and which I don't know if it's going to be coming back real strong three, four, five, six weeks from now, because people are going to still be a little skittish. I think they're going to be, they're going to be a little nervous. They're going to be a little skittish, a little tight, okay? People, everybody thinks somebody getting a stimulus check. Ain't no checks coming out right now. Okay, people are going to be a little tight. What they're going to have is some fear and some insurance. That's what I'm hoping they're going to have. Them two things. I don't even care if they got no money. If they, they want to be, they're going to be a little scared, a little tight. Uh, they're going to be venturing out, uh, like coming out after, after the winter. Uh, and, and I think the money's going to be a little tight, okay? So we, that's what I think. So in that, in that bunker down, hunker down, go back to the basics, wheat and bread and water kind of thing, I think from, a, from an eye doctor point of view, man, you got to go to your ocular surface disease if you want to try to uh, generate a little activity and, and stimulate something to do a little tickle because that's always there. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's low-hanging fruit. Why did the bank rob a rob the bank? Because that's where the money is. Okay, we don't, you know, you, you got to have $50,000 worth of technology to start trying to find you some glaucoma. And, and I got a feeling nobody's going to want to hear that three or four weeks from now. They don't care. Nobody care about, oh, you might, you might have glaucoma. Uh, we better do $500 worth of test on you because you might go blind in 18 years. Okay, nobody want to hear that next week. Okay, they don't care about none of that. That's what I think. So all of that stuff about... Uh, you know, let's, let's, you know, make sure you don't go blind in the future. I don't think people care too much. 
I think people want to not get sick next week. That's what people want. They don't want to get sick tomorrow. <laughs> That's what they cared about. And they cared about if their eyes are bothering them, because uh, you always care about that. Just like if you had a toothache, you always cared about that. So I think ocular surface disease is an opportunity to take the place, supplement, uh, 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 recruit. What's the, I don't know the other adjectives that the you know to. I think we are in for a slow time period from a financial point of view. And this is a clinical lecture, not a financial lecture. It's not practice management. This is a clinical lecture. But if you, you know, just to be honest, okay, you know, we got to stay in business. Uh, you know, it's going to be harder to do. I think this is a way for me to kind of sort of make up for some of that to where I don't lose as much money. I ain't trying to make, Make money, but I want to. The first step in losing money is to stop losing money, uh, and then eventually, you know, I might be able to make some money. But uh, you know, I don't want to harp on the money part. That's not what I'm talking about. But you know, I'm trying to stay in business. What can I do as a private practice optometrist to enhance my business going forward? Because I think my business is going to be affected. I am out of business right now. We, I, we've seen three patients today. I got three people up here. I'm losing money. Okay, we are. I'm out of business. So I want to get back into business. I want to get back into business strong. I want to get back into business properly, ethically, morally, the right way. Uh, I don't want to just be a, a I'm not going to, they don't want to be, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to do it the wrong way. I've been doing this 36 years. I don't need to do it any other way. I know the right way to do it. This is the right way to do it. This is a way to do it. Let me show you guys a way to do it. So we're going to pivot to ocular surface disease because it's always there. Whether you north, south, east, west, black people, white people, people with money, people without money, this is always there. These three things are always there. Well, looky here. This first thing is always there. I got three pictures of three young ladies living up in Plano, Texas, y'all. Okay, they're not living here with me. They live in up in Plano, Texas. Can't you tell? Okay, that's what that's what I'm thinking. Y'all see it all day long. Okay, it's that. These ladies itching and scratching and, and complaining and saying, help me, please, please help me, please help me. So you have the comical representation of allergic conjunctivitis. Uh, you see what it is. You see the bullets there, okay? And again, I, although I can certainly put any reference from any optometric journal that's peer-reviewed up here, you know, I think for a subject like this where it's kind of new for me, uh, you know, I wanted to go to to allergy journals and stuff as opposed to optometric journals. So I tried to find stuff there that would, that would be pertinent. So here's that reference. Again, it's the same stuff that we talk about. The science is science. Okay. Clinical science or clinical science. They think that their stuff is colder or better or anything like that. I just wanted to just start at the base. And I thought that, you know, starting with the allergy people and the immunology people would be the base as far as me reading articles and getting research. So that's what we got there. And here just more, representations uh, of, of patients complaining with allergic conjunctivitis. And, and uh, I'm concentrating right now on young people because supposedly uh, when I was in school back when they used to talk about people with diabetes spilling sugar and all kind of stuff like that. So supposedly uh, we were taught that, that allergy is a disease of young people. Uh, I don't believe that really, but it may, it may, be a higher prevalence in young people. I do kind of believe that maybe. Uh, and, and here I listed the common uh, symptoms that may be present in persons complaining of allergic conjunctivitis and, and showed some, some clinical images that we should have all seen literally hundreds of times in our careers. So I'm not showing you new stuff. I'm not trying to show you stuff that you haven't seen before. This is refresher, okay? Everybody's seen these three presentations. Everybody's seen the little kid blowing his nose. Everybody's seen the kid with the swollen eyes. Everybody's seen the red eye. We've all seen it. Okay. We learned nothing here. This is a refresher, but we've got to do it to do the job properly. So allergic conjunctivitis, excuse me, it's got the itching, the conjunctival hyperemia, excessive tearing, the swelling. Okay. All right. That's the reference. This is what it looks like. Okay. So now we're talking about the big three. So ocular allergy. My bony gland dysfunction, dysfunctional tear syndrome, and there's overlap in all of these, of course. There's an article by uh, 
uh, Milton Hom, I didn't include it in my references, I just ran out of time, where it was talking about the overlap between uh, the people that complain of uh, itching, ocular itching, that have allergic conjunctivitis, and people that have what we used to call dry eye syndrome, it's now called the dysfunctional tear syndrome, and how you've got 40, 50% of the people that have uh, overlap with that. And actually, I read his article yesterday, and it's got these Venn diagrams showing the, the big three is redness, itching, and uh, uh, what was the big, the big three? It was redness, itching, and I think watering. Uh, and and uh, you had the Venn diagram showing how they all superimposed. And the, the dryness, uh, it was itching, redness, and, and uh, dryness. That's what it was. So the itching and the dryness had like a 60% overlap on the Venn diagrams. It was, you know, pretty impressive that, that people had comorbidities and you can have more than one problem. And, that, and, that, and we'll get to that in a minute. That's a big part of why you're going to be doing all this stuff is to perform your differential diagnosis. And when the people complain of ocular surface disease symptoms, which are these things here, well, what we all know is that ocular allergy and myopia gland dysfunction and dysfunctional tear syndrome, you know, there's about an 85% overlap in the symptoms that those three conditions produce. And if you were simply listening to somebody on the phone without doing a clinical exam, it might be hard to perform a differential diagnosis because they all got the same kind of symptoms, okay? So the allergic conjunctivitis, the first one, ocular allergy, okay, that's, that's that. You see the symptoms. My bone gland dysfunction, it's got the same stuff. So here I got pictures of the second ocular surface disease, the biggie, my bone gland dysfunction. Uh, you know, again, I, I lectured to you guys just a couple of months ago on this, and I certainly didn't want to be repetitive or redundant, uh, which is why we're not going to talk about it a lot. But, but you know, this is a big deal. And anybody that's got my bone gland dysfunction, if you were at the lecture two months ago or you keep up with the stuff, you know, 80, 85% of the people that have dry eyes it's because they got my bone and gland dysfunction. And you can have all the symptomatology, all the itching, the burning, the foreign body sensation, the this, the that. You can have all of that stuff with the my bone and gland dysfunction, just like you do with the allergic conjunctivitis. It's, it's almost, it's, all, it's 80% overlap. So, so if somebody says their eyes are itching, is it this or is it this? Or is it that? Which one is it? So is it dry eye where, where you got a, loss of water for the tear film, putting all this mucus here in the corner. And then you, if you don't fix the dry eye and, and then it, it, the disease progresses and it goes to, to this conjunctival desquamation and you see that with the listening green standing here. And, the, and if you don't intervene and fix it and put some, some lubricants and some steroids and some, some sequin and some Zydron, and if you don't fix it right here, then it, then it gets worse and, and it goes to corneal desquamation and then the cornea starts getting damaged. And you see that with the standing here on the cornea and, and if you don't fix it and put something on it or put a membrane on it or some bandage contacts or plug them up or, or something, and it keeps getting worse. And then you go to the last milestone in the history of development of dry eye syndrome, which is destabilization of the cornea to your interface. And we see that as these dry spots forming, where now the corneal epithelium has lost all the microvilli and there's no glycocalyx to bond to the tear film. And so you get these dry spots that form. But when we were in opt optometry school, they taught us that this was mild dry eye and all they needed was some artificial tears. But the science and the, the anatomy and, and electron specular photomicrographs uh, show that, that this is in stage disease, not early disease. This is early disease where you have a loss of water. This is in stage disease where you have a destabilization of the cornea tear interface. And of course, practically anywhere through one of these four milestones, you would have practically all of these symptoms yet again. We've all seen this hundreds, if not thousands of times in our offices. People complain, hey, what, what can I do for you today? Ah, my eyes are kind of burning. Hey, you have any problems? Yeah, my eyes itch. Hey, what's going on? Well, my eyes are kind of running water. Hey, what, what can I do for you today? Well, I got this. It feels like there's something in this left eye. Hey, what's going on today? Hey, you know what? I, I got, I'm sensitive to light. I, it's, just, it's bothering me. How many times, how many times have we heard this stuff as we practiced optometry? It's really incredible. So we have the big three. Ocular allergy, myobomia gland dysfunction, dysfunctional tear syndrome, 
it is our job to perform a diagnosis and treatment program which will include a differential diagnostic process which will allow us to identify and exclude the diagnoses that are not causing the problem and treat the real diagnosis. If there's only one, if there's more than one, then you treat them both. So let's get into that. And it's all going to make sense. I'm coming back to that COVID virus. Don't, I promise you, I'm coming back to the COVID. I'm coming back. Allergic conjunctivitis, allergic conjunctivitis, my bone and gland dysfunction, dry eye syndrome, ocular surface disease. So what are we going to do? This is what we're going to do. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, my mama is so proud of me because in 2020, I have turned myself into an allergist. That's right. That's right. That is right. See, in 1983, when I got out of optometry school, I was an optometrist. And then I kept learning. I kept growing. In 1988, I bought me a corneal topographer, big old giant one, filled up the whole room. And the instant I bought that corneal topographer and started diagnosing keratoconus for real, instead of like with some keratometer, like some nonsense, then I became a corneal specialist and started prescribing contact lenses to treat people with keratoconus. It took me five years of getting out of school to get the technology to turn myself into a corneal specialist. Because here, when I was an optometrist in 1983, I promise you I ain't making this up. Okay, I had a tangent screen to do visual fields. <laughs> okay, and, and my only technology was a AONCT tonometer. I thought I was balling. Okay, that's 1983. I didn't get anything till here. But as soon as I got it, man, I got good. So <clears throat> 1988, I am a corneal specialist because I got me a topographer. That's all I needed. And then, of course, we had to mess around in Texas for a while. So then in 1999, of course, I knew all the, I had the information. You know, these are, these are, some of these are just legal definitions i you know i could I, I could be whatever i want to be i'm an optometrist uh i've been to college i could do whatever i want to do uh so in 1999 uh, i legally turned myself into a glaucoma specialist i was treating glaucoma years before that all of you guys know me know my stories uh being investigated here and there okay i'm treating some glaucoma uh so so i'm treating glaucoma and i'm a glaucoma specialist in 1999 and that's when i got my first scanning laser so as soon as I got me a scanning laser and I didn't have to guess and depend on some knucklehead patient doing a visual field with 15 out of 16 fixation losses to make a decision. Okay, once I started making my own decisions, then I became a glaucoma specialist. So I did that for a while. <clears throat> then, y'all know me, then in 2011, then I turned myself into a, a clinical neurophysiologist because I was the first optometrist in the state of Texas to do electrodiagnostic testing and get paid for it by Medicare. That's what happened in 2011. Y'all remember that. Uh, me and Joe DeLoach got that thing turned on, uh, mostly Joe DeLoach, but I'm taking credit too. <laughs> so, so I, I was, because I was the first one to do it. Okay, Joe helped me, but I was the first, I was the first one to buy one. I'll put it that way. So I bought the first VEP device in the state of Texas by an optometrist. I built the first claim to Medicare. I was the first one to get paid. I turned myself into a clinical neurophysiologist because anybody that does electrodiagnostic testing in their office is a clinical neurophysiologist by definition. So that's what I am too. Then in 2012, I started doing amniotic membrane transplants and I became a transplant surgeon. That's what my mama, my mama said, I'm so proud of you. She said, she, she said, said you, you, you're such a good boy. I said, yes, mama. And I became a transplant surgeon in addition to being a glaucoma specialist and a corneal specialist and an optometrist. So I've been doing that for a while. So y'all know I do pretty good with that. Y'all, I haven't talked about that. Y'all know I ain't making it up. Okay, I'm a transplant surgeon. I said it, I've said it 10 times. I said it on OD Wire. I've said it in the journals. I've given lectures on it. I, Craig Thomas, OD, am a transplant surgeon. Thank you. Now, I didn't think I could get much better. But, but I'm adding to my, you know, you never stop growing. You never stop learning. And especially now when we ain't seeing no patients, we actually got a little time. Uh, so, you know, I would recommend you use your time, you know, properly. Uh, you know, that this is what I've been doing the past couple of weeks is I've been turning myself into an allergist. I'm good at it now. I, I feel competent. I'm, I am not being facetious. Uh, other than giving injections, I have a reasonable working knowledge of what these guys do. 
Uh, I've read a bunch of stuff the past two, three weeks. I mean, the, you know, I'm serious. Okay. I can do all the, the one to five dilutions in my head. They were, I've, I've listened to lectures by otolaryngologists at medical school lectures. You know, their stuff is just like ours. It's just like ours. I listened to a two hour lecture by this otolaryngologist, Stella Lee in Los Angeles. It was incredible. I listened to it twice. I do, that's where I learned a lot of this stuff. I listened to the lecture twice. And 99% of it I knew. 99% of it was refresher. It was, and I, I really felt good after I listened to it. I was like, man, I know this stuff. They taught us well in optometry school, even 36 years ago. But you got to keep up, and I do keep up. You know, I keep up at an above average clip. We got time now for everybody else to, to catch up and keep up. And I recommend you use your time enhancing your knowledge base. Okay, so let's keep going. Okay, because now, now we're going to talk about being an allergist. That's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about uh, being an allergist because that's what I am now. All right, so here's, here's – and I, I got to tell you guys, I, I don't know if I've mentioned it. I even saw this stuff. You know, this stuff's just so wild. Uh, yeah, I'll get to it in a second, I guess. Okay, here. So traditional allergy testing. So you got the picture here. You know, I don't know if anybody uh, – this may be refresher. I don't think we had this in optometry school, but I've seen this stuff. I mean, we're all doctors. You know, we, we, we read, we, you know, some more than others. But, I mean, most of us continue our education and, and have a medical orientation to us, most of us, to where if I showed a bunch of optometrists a picture of this lady laying on her stomach getting this patch allergy testing, I'm thinking most of us would have an awareness of what they are looking at and, and I don't have to start from total scratch. So I'm assuming that we're at some medium to advanced level because we're optometrists, okay? <clears throat> so you see here, <coughs> excuse me, an example of traditional allergy testing. The testing that would be done in an allergist, you know, MD or DO, their office. Uh, and and uh, the big white bandage here is what you call patch testing. You know, I don't ever want to do anything like that. Uh, and then I remember seeing people's drawing numbers on people before. I remember seeing pictures of that. I remember seeing the, the gloved hand with a little plastic applicator. I've seen all this stuff before. Uh, so, that, again, it was all kind of refresher. But I, I, I looked it up here. Uh, and I actually read this. I read this this morning. Uh, you see, it was access today. I, I actually read this about five hours ago. Uh, so, in a general sense, uh, when you're doing allergy testing on a person, uh, you give them a list of medications. And I'm not going to go into the detail on that stuff. We, we wait, you know, we'll deal with that later. Y'all can deal with that if you want to proceed and turn yourself into an allergist, which is my strong recommendation. COVID 19, COVID 19, COVID 19, you're going to see. Okay. So, uh, you know, there's a few kind of procedural things you got to do. And I didn't know this because up until two weeks ago, I wasn't an allergist, but I, you know, now I am. Uh, so, you know, you got to stop taking some medicines before you do the test, you know, three to seven days before, just kind of get a little flush out so that you can get valid results and the test, can, you know, it'll be legit where you're actually getting some real information. Uh, the only uh, uh, deviation from this is this article these guidelines here from this uh, American Academy of Otolaryngitic Allergy says if the person's taken uh, chronic, not chronic, if, if they have chronic disease and they've been taking oral antihistamines like every day for a year, okay, you got to take them off like two weeks ahead to, to get good results. That was the only one that was more than three to seven days. So not too big a deal, uh, you know, three to seven days, you know, most people are not going to go crazy if you make them stop taking their antihistamines for that short a period of time. But, you know, I didn't know that. So I thought I would share that information. I thought, you know, boom, 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 you just do the test. So let me, let me tell you guys. So here's traditional allergy testing. Okay. This is now what we're going to talk about. Okay. In office allergy testing that an optometrist can do. Okay. This is my office. This is my kit. That's a picture I took with my cell phone on Friday morning. Okay. All right. This is, I, yeah. So this is what, this is what we're going to talk about now. <clears throat> and this is how this whole thing started. I told you, I was, I don't, well, I guess I told you, I've been talking so much for the past hour. Uh, I, if I didn't tell you what, what happened, as the brothers say, what had happened was, uh, so what happened is I was, I was doing a consult visit. Uh, I, don't, I didn't call the guy and ask permission, so I don't want to use his name. I was visiting a friend, uh, an optometrist, who has a very nice, successful practice in another city. Uh, I'd never been there before. It was my first visit. And I planned on spending the entire day there. I was going to hang out, consult, observe, 
uh, make any recommendations to improve efficiency or production and get up out of there. Uh, so, you know, I've done that before. Uh, I do some consulting. So <clears throat> I'm in the, in the doctor's office and it's really a nice office, really just top of the line, top of the line. Just, it just makes me proud to be an optometrist when I see doctors with offices like this, a multi-million dollar office, a bunch of staff, everybody's busy, everybody's modern, technology's everywhere. It just, just makes you feel good. Just it did. It makes me feel good. It's almost like I felt guilty taking. I'm like, hey man, who's paying who? You know, I'm learning. I'm learning while I'm here. <laughs> you know, so I'm sitting there all day. We're having a good time. You know, I'm a friendly guy. And then the afternoon kicks in because I had done some training with the staff that morning, so they didn't see patients in the morning. And then in the afternoon, we kicked up to normal, and I was going to observe all the functions and operations and, and make my report. So I'm I'm sitting there watching, roaming the office, watching the doctors, watching the staff, watching patient encounters, just just doing stuff. The, the office is real big. It's got like, you know, seven, eight, nine exam rooms. So I'm kind of, you know, just going from room to room. And I, I opened the door and looked in a room and there was a patient and two of the technicians in there and the patient, uh, a, a middle-aged lady, nice lady. I sat there and talked with her for a while and she had her arms, she was sitting in the exam chair and she had her arms stretched out and they were doing these allergy test things on her arm with these little plastic applicators. And I said, hey, what are you guys doing? And the technicians looked up and they said, oh, we're doing an allergy test. I go, huh? What are you talking about? They go, we're doing an allergy test. You know, allergy test, you know, allergy test. <laughs> I'm like, uh, okay, uh, can I watch? They go, yeah, sure. And I asked the patient, I said, ma'am, can I come in and watch? She goes, oh, yeah, sure. She was real friendly. And so I just stepped in the room. So you got me, the patient, and two techs in the room. The, the patient sitting in the chair, she's got both arms in the armrest. And one of the staff is administering the, the, uh, the uh, allergens and the other is recording stuff. And it's almost like a, you could tell they're good at it and they've done it before because they would, the one was just calling it out and the other staff member was recording. It was real smooth. It was really impressive. Uh, you know, almost like some kind of military thing, you know, 1A, 1B, 1B, 2C, 1B, 2C. I mean, wow. I'd never seen anything like it in optometric practice. I was totally impressed. So they're doing this now. And so they finished their stuff. It took about three, four minutes to do it. And then you, you let the patient sit for 15, 20 minutes or so. And you wait for the reaction to occur. So if, if one's going to occur. So basically, you're trying to provoke a reaction. It's almost like a provocative glaucoma test. You know, I'm trying to make you get glaucoma. So I'm trying to see if you're allergic to a bunch of stuff. So I'm going to, you know, stress out your system and see if you have a reaction. If you have a reaction to it, then you're sensitive to it. Uh, you know, that is, that's basic, basic allergy testing. So I watched him do the test, finished up, recorded the results. Doctor came in, went through the, the, the findings with her. And then I stepped out the room and, and I kind of missed the end point. But I was just totally transfixed and, and just, just hypnotized with that. I'm like, wow, what is that? And, and so then once I... Once I, you know, kind of got into it, I said, I think I want to do this. Uh, this looks interesting. Uh, you know, the, I don't know about you guys. You know, my practice is a little different than most of you guys. You know, I probably see 50% Medicare. So, so if I see 30 people a day, 15 of them are over 65. And I'd say probably 75% of those people are black. So I see a bunch of old black people, you know, all day long. Uh, and, and, you know, and I'm not trying to be racial or anything like that. You know that. However, what I got to tell you, and, and what any visitor to my office will notice in about two hours, is that in my patient population, about 13 times a day, no matter what the problem is, no matter what the presentation, no matter what the complaint, no matter what the appearance, no matter what, no matter what, whether it's decreased vision, blurred vision, fluctuating vision, no matter what, at some point early in the patient encounter, one of my black patients will say to me, Dr. Thomas, I can't see out this left eye. I think it's due to my allergies. I'm like, maybe, maybe not. And then two patients later, some old guy will say, yeah, man, this, you know, this left eye has been bad on me for a while. I, I, I think it's my allergies acting up. I say, yeah, Mr. Smith, it might be your allergies acting up, but it might not. And all day long, I will be bombarded with every second or third or fourth patient self-diagnosing and telling me their problem 
their decreased vision, their ocular complaint, whatever it is that they think is bothering them is somehow associated with, caused by, exacerbated by their allergies, whether that is true or not. It's such a running gag in my office when I have visitors, I take them out in the hallway and we play a game and I say, let's see how long it takes for someone to blame their 38 pressure on their allergies. And they're like, what are you talking about? I go, just watch, just sit here, just watch. I promise you, it won't take long, 30 minutes. There'll be, you know, I'll see five people in the next 30 minutes. I promise you, someone's going to say that their eyelid is swole shut because of their allergies. I promise you, okay? You just watch. I've lost count of it. It's, just com it's as common as me saying, as somebody telling me they can't see clear. It's as common as that, okay? So I'm sitting here watching this guy, this, this guy's staff uh, do this allergy test on this patient. And I'm like, I want to do this. And there's lots of reasons why. I'll get into the reasons why right now. This is what it looks like. <clears throat> so again, I didn't really show up, you know, we don't need to get too much gruesome detail. Uh, you know, I don't, I, if, you, if you want to proceed and, and think about turning yourself into an allergist, uh, then you'll get trained and you'll learn, your staff will learn how to do it. Uh, I'm not going to even go in the room when they train them. I'm not going to do it. So I watched them do it. It didn't look hard. Uh, so these two ladies did it. It took a few minutes. So they put these little plastic applicators on the person's arms, uh, exposed them to the allergen, and then waited for the reaction to occur. Uh, you see here, this is what the reaction would look like on a, on a, a dark-skinned person. This is what the reactions might look like on a light-skinned person. So just showing you examples of the test results. And then what the staff did is they had this little, this little millimeter ruler thing, almost like we would use to measure pupil size in anisocoria. So imagine a PD stick with the semicircles of different diameters uh, where you'd have, you know, three millimeters, 3.5, four millimeters, 4.5, and each circle would be successively a little bit bigger. So they have a scale like that on a device almost exactly like that. And you just slide it up to the, the raised lesion here. Uh, it's called a wheel. Uh, and and you, you measure the height and you measure the diameter. And there's two kind of components to it. There's a, there's, it's called the wheel and the flare. So the wheel is kind of the part that gets raised up and the flare is the part that gets red. I didn't know that two weeks ago, but since I'm an allergist, I know exactly what I'm talking about right now. So you evaluate the wheel and the flare of the, the responsive reaction and you make a determination based on those two things. So then when I say analyze qualitatively and quantitatively, so you can, you can look at it and you can measure it. You know, so, it's, so you can go one or the other and then ideally you would blend in both. So that's what the, the test results look like on the person's arm. If you had a person that was real heavily tattooed or they had burns and stuff on their arm, you could do this on the back if you wanted to, but I'm not real keen on having somebody take their top off, you know, in this day and age. And I wouldn't even consider it with a female patient. Uh, I would just say, hey, take some Motomax gel. I'll see you later. You know, so, so if we couldn't do it on our arms, I'm just not doing it. Uh, so this is, this is what the results look like. So this is the test kit. This is most of it right here, okay? I don't even think this thing has a name. Uh, I think they just call it Aller Focus Testing Solution. The company's called Aller Focus. And it does what they call these different panels. So you got to get your allergist terminology going. Uh, so it does a panel of 78 different allergens. And then you got uh, two controls in the test to make sure the results are valid. And then there's, there's only two that I could find. I don't think there's a third one. I'm almost positive they're not. So just to be fair, you know, and, and I don't care. I mean, I don't work for these guys. I mean, I mean nothing to me. Uh, I bought this one because it's the one I saw. Uh, the, the second one that's available is one from Bausch & Lohm called Doctors RX Allergy Formula. And, uh, and I'm kind of familiar with the Doctors RX guys. I actually went to a, a study group seminar a couple of years ago where the founder of the Doctors RX Allergies, the, the ophthalmologist, pretty nice guy. He's pretty smart. Uh, so I, I listened to a couple hours of lecture from him. So I, I know all about his stuff and their concept. And it's all good. I, I think the science is real. Uh, and Bash and Loan paid him a bunch of money for it. It's probably real. Uh, you know, they do 58 allergen panels in the two controls again. So the Al focus test, uh, 68 test for 68 different allergens. And as far as I know, and I looked on the Bastion Loam website this morning, 
and it said 58. So, uh, you know, it, unless it's different, you know, I'm just going by what I saw this morning. So this is the test kit. And again, there's a few other, you know, I didn't take pictures of the applicators. There's three or four other boxes that come with this stuff. <clears throat> and then you put this stuff in the fridge. This is all the, the, the allergens. So you got to store this uh, refrigerated. So this, this, this kit, this box, this, this thing that I ordered from these guys uh, is approximately $4,000. And I think you get 40 to 50 patients per kit. Uh, so the, the, if, I, if my numbers are right, I think I've got an approximate 80 to $85 disposable cost to do a test. So this ain't no free test. This ain't something that's going to be tossing out. There's time and money involved. It's real. This is a real test. I mean, I'm an allergist. Okay. This, you know, I'm not, I'm not putting some fluorescent in your eye. <laughs> We're getting ready to, you know, you're getting ready to stop taking medicine, come in for a specific appointment. You know, this is the real deal. And you'll, again, you'll see why COVID-19, COVID-19. So <clears throat> two different products available in the United States, uh, one by a company called Aller Focus, uh, one uh, sold by Bausch & Lohm. Uh, I don't have any personal experience uh, with either one because I got this kit on Friday. I have not done a patient yet. I've seen it in operation. Uh, and I don't know anybody that has the Dr's RX allergy formula one either. Uh, but I do know that they are out in the field because I talked to the Bash and Loam guys, so I know they've sold some. Uh, so, again, the refresher there. No, not refresher. This is new stuff. What am I talking about? This is new stuff. This is brand new. This is hot off the presses. This is state of the art. This is top of the line. This, you can't get no better than this right now. Okay, let's keep going. So, <clears throat> I've got my patients. You know, we'll get into a case report in a moment, but I've, I've got a patient where for whatever reason, and there's multiple reasons, uh, but for whatever reason, I decided that I thought they had allergies. Uh, I thought they had ocular surface disease. I thought the two might be related. I wanted to get as much information as possible before I started initiating treatment. Let's just to say all, all of that's going on. Okay. <clears throat> and, and, and the results are, are, conclusive and positive, and I've made the diagnosis, I've made the determination that my patient is now suffering from some type of systemic allergy, some type of environmental allergy. Uh, because I'm a brand new allergist, I'm only going to concentrate right now on environmental allergies. I'm not going to mess with food allergies and stuff like that, a little bit more complicated. I'm not there yet, but I'm an optometrist and I could do whatever I want. Uh, I'm going to start off with environmental allergies, and I'm going to go from there. So uh, environmental allergies, uh, there's three ways to attack them. Uh, these are the, the treatment options you see here. The first, the most common, uh, the one that was talked about most of the time, but it's almost comical to think about it, is what's called avoidance therapy, uh, where, where you're supposed to figure out what you're allergic to, and then you're supposed to stay away from it. <laughs> okay, that's, that's avoidance therapy. I mean, that's what it is. You know, figure out what you're allergic to and then get up out of there. Okay, that's it's almost like a biblical thing. The Bible tells you to flee. Get away. Get away. Go away. Leave, leave me alone. The only problem with avoidance therapy, based on the lectures that I heard this weekend from otolaryngologists in Los Angeles at the medical school, is that it doesn't work. Okay? And I'm thinking they got more experience than we do because they've been doing it longer. So they say that avoidance therapy has low to moderate success. And, and this lady, this Stella Lee, she went all into the, to, to the, the statistical analysis of it and all the, almost like you, you, if you keep up with this stuff and you, you read articles and, and do classes like I do and you, you're trying to evaluate studies, you know, is it a low to moderate? Uh, correlation is it moderate to high correlation the statistical analysis the p-values all that stuff I've I actually kind of sort of have to be aware of that a little bit now where I never thought I would have to touch it when we got out of school and this is in that realm where you say okay you've been we've been hearing about avoidance therapy for the past 50 years why do we keep talking about it when the studies show that it really doesn't work that well because it's too hard to do Okay, it's too hard to, it's, it's, you know what avoidance therapy is? Is what we're seeing the COVID-19 healthcare workers do when they come home now. They take off all their stuff. They take a 
shower before they go touch their family. They wash this, they wash that. They're trying to avoid the virus. And so the, the therapy is to, to, to disrobe in, a, in your garage. And when I was reading and listening to the, the lectures, and it's talking about, okay, so, so you, if you're allergic to pollen and you go outside, then you're supposed to come in and take your shirt off and leave it at the front door and shake it out and then let it sit for three days and then do this and then do that. And, and I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> I mean, it, was, it was nonsense. So I would, once I started reading all of the strategies and protocols that were involved in avoidance therapy, I agreed with the otolaryngologist and I'm like, I ain't going to tell nobody to do this. A waste of time. It, it's not that it don't work. It, if you do it rigorously, consistently, it will decrease the allergen load and it will decrease your sensitization level. Okay. It'll, you'll get better, but it's a lot of work and it don't work that good. As a result, the second line of therapy, pharmaceutical therapy is what most people do. So if I say, Hey, don't go outside, take your clothes off, shower before you go in here, wash your hands 12 times, stand on your head, jump with one foot, or stick this bottle up your nose and squirt. Which one is the average person going to do? Okay, they're going to stick that bottle up their nose and squirt. So second therapy, pharmaceutical therapy, you know, primarily steroids, antihistamines, uh, doesn't matter the route of delivery, whether it's a nasal spray, a pill, liquid, some pharmaceutical uh, treatment. The, the good part is that those things do help and they do make the person more comfortable. If you've got some tissue damage, it'll start to decrease all the swelling and get the tissue back to normal. Um, and so it's, I mean, it's, all, it's all good. You know, you don't want to say, you know, you can't say hardly anything bad about pharmaceutical therapy other than it has side effects. Well, that's kind of bad. Maybe all them steroids, you know, maybe, because that's what they use most of the time. And it really doesn't fix anything because as soon as you stop using the pharmaceutical therapy, the allergic disease comes right back because it ain't fixing nothing. But it does make them better. Okay, they're better. And, you know, I mean, I've prescribed plenty of drops to make my eyes feel better and look better. There ain't nothing wrong with that. Uh, there ain't nothing wrong with that, okay? Uh, other than side effects and it don't fix nothing. I guess that is the only thing. So I guess there is something wrong with that. Okay, I take it back. There, there is something wrong with that. The third option. All right, new stuff, new stuff. Immunotherapy. What's the difference? The difference is the immunotherapy treats the allergic disease state. You're treating the disease in and of itself. You're trying to change the person's immune system. COVID-19, COVID-19. Okay, immunotherapy, subcutaneous administration, sublingual administration. All right, y'all see the little pictures off to the side. You got your medicine here. You got sublingual. You got subcutaneous. Guess which one we're getting ready to do in the state of Texas, y'all. Okay, we're getting ready to do a some sublingual administration because that's what we can legally do. The good news for us is that that works almost as well as giving somebody a shot. And it's just like whenever I got somebody with uveitis, y'all know, Ms. Jones, hey, I can make you take these drops 12 times a day, or I can give you a shot in your eye. Which one do you want? Uh, da, 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 da. Give me those drops, Doc. Give me those drops. <laughs> Who wants a shot? Nobody wants a shot. Nobody wants a shot. If I say, if I showed a picture of this little cute girl getting this medicine under her tongue or having to put her in a papoose and tie her down like she's a criminal so she could get a shot, which one do you think this mother's going to prefer? Especially if I say, yeah, the shot might be a little stronger and a little bit better. This is real close, and she ain't going to go crazy with this. Which would you prefer? <laughs> and then, of course, the magic reason, I can do this one, whereas I can't do the other one. Which one am I going to prefer? Okay, I prefer this one. <laughs> okay, that's, that's what we're going to talk about this one. So we're going to talk about sublingual immunotherapy, new stuff. Stuff optometrists can do. Stuff optometrists are doing. That's what this is, okay? So y'all see the bullets right there. Okay, I just read half of them talking. Okay, this stuff's been out for a while. It's been out since 2014, FDA approval. It's real. Okay, we ain't buying no, no, no noni juice and no aloe vera stuff extract. Okay, this is real, all right? What's the difference? The difference is we can do it now. That's the difference. That's the big difference. We can do it. 
It's not new science. It's old science. Uh, the, the, this is the dominant. I don't know if it's dominant. It's, it's at least 50. It's, what was the number? I'm sorry. The, I saw it a couple of days ago. 45 to 50% of the people in Europe, and I ain't saying Europe is all of that. I, don't get me started, okay? Uh, however, Europe is a civilized, industrialized, modern part of the planet. And, you know, you have to say that. Uh, and so, you know, it, it ain't like they don't know what they're doing. Uh, they pretty much do know what they're doing. Uh, so this is what 45 to 50% of the people in Europe get for first line allergy treatment as opposed to allergy shots. Okay. Allergy shots versus allergy drops. It is indeed like night and day. Uh, you know, again, I, the, I've read all these articles by allergists. Now I've got, I've got five or six articles I read over the weekend. And, you know, I, I forgot, you know, we, we didn't touch on this heavy in optometry school. We just touched on it enough to have a, a working awareness of it so we can talk intelligently to our patients. But, you know, to, if you think you got bad allergies and you're going to an allergist, man, you might as well just, you know, it's almost like buying a, buying a room down at the new optometry school in Houston where you've got your nameplate on the outside of the door. You know, that's your room because you paid for it. Uh, I mean, you're going all the time. You're going every week. You're getting shots every week. You're going in once a month. You got to hang around for 35, 45 minutes after you get a shot. Make sure you don't fall out and die from anaphylaxis. I mean, <laughs> it's a whole different ballgame. I was reading these articles. I'm like, man, this is crazy. As opposed to me saying, hey, use these drops. I'll see you next month. <laughs> okay, that's a lot different. Uh, I, could do, I, I, I know which one I'm going to do. So sublingual immunotherapy. Y'all see that? Y'all read, read these bullets while I'm talking. And just kind of the, the little schematic of, you know, how do these drugs, these compounds get up to the eye? I found this cool representation here. Uh, clinic, you know, y'all know what I did. I pulled out my Bartlett Clinical Pharmacology book from 1999. I, I pulled that bad boy out three days ago and started reading stuff on pharmacodynamics and drug absorption and mechanisms of delivery. That's what routes of, excuse me, I'm sorry, routes of ocular drug delivery. I copied that out of clinical pharmacology. Okay, that book we had to read to pass our TMOD test for glaucoma. Yeah, I still got it. I still got it. So, I mean, uh, so, but it was kind of interesting seeing all this stuff, you know. So, you know, direct effects on the eye, all these things here going straight to the eyeball. You can put stuff up your nose, you know, corticosteroids, antihistamines, crack cocaine, whatever you can do, all kind of stuff. It'll get straight to the eye. And then you can put stuff in your mouth. These antihistamines, okay, it'll work its way up in there and start doing stuff. And with, and these, this immunotherapy, it'll work its way up in there and start doing stuff, okay? All right, so that's the, the, the different routes of ocular drug delivery. I thought that was kind of cool. So according to the peer-reviewed journals in all of the immunology and allergy publications, the benefits of sublingual immunotherapy are these, these, these four things here. So if you put these drops under your tongue, like I'm getting ready to start doing as soon as we get back to work, for most patients, it improves control of your ocular symptoms. So the drops make your eyes feel better, okay? Uh, that ain't me saying it. That's from this article I got. I didn't put the reference. It was, it was actually, it was from Dr. Lee's lecture. Dr. The, the otolaryngologist. Uh, Y'all got to listen to this lecture, man. It was so, it's like, it's, she's real friendly. Uh, it wasn't too boring. I listened to it twice. Uh, but it's, it, it's us. She's just, it was, she's sitting there talking to a room full of otolaryngologists at a medical school. She's giving a CE seminar. It's like me and me talking to you guys right now. And I'm telling you, I understood every single word of it. Okay. Every bit of it. Uh, now it's because I, I'd, I'd spent, you know, probably 30, 40 hours ahead of time reading all these articles and getting ready. Uh, but everything she said, I understood. I was like, man, this is okay. I got it down. Okay. I, I understand it. So these are all of her points, uh, the benefits of sublingual immunotherapy. And most of her lecture was talking about the subcutaneous giving shots. I mean, she's an, she's an old laryngologist. I mean, they, that's how they make a living. But, you know, there was enough here to where I peeled off information to make this lecture. So these are the benefits. And, and, the last one I thought was a big deal, you know, it improves disease specific quality of life. I mean, people feel better, uh, you know, they, cause they are better. Uh, and especially nowadays, you know, where people are pretty mentally down, uh, you know, it's just, that's important. So let's say that you're going to turn yourself into an allergist in addition to being an optometrist. And, and, and I'm not, I know this one lecture is not sufficient to turn you into a, a, competent clinician in this field of medicine. I'm not suggesting that. However, uh, we got time. And if you want to catch up to me, 
uh, 10, 20 hours after this lecture, you'd be right there with me. Uh, I promise you. Uh, so just as a shortcut, you know, these are some of the treatment guidelines uh, that I picked off these articles. And this was, I didn't know this stuff. So, you know, I, I, this was important enough to, to read almost out loud. Uh, you know, it's like, okay, who are you going to treat? Who would you recommend this, these drops to? Uh, and the drops are not expensive. They're like uh, 200, not what, 189 for three months worth and 330 for six months worth. And I, again, I don't sell the drops. I'm not trying to do that. That's not what I'm talking about today. Uh, it, it ain't no different than somebody buying antioxidant vitamins to try to help macular degeneration. It's no different than anybody buying omega-3 supplements to help with their uh, meibomian gland dysfunction or dry eye. It's, it's no different at all, okay? It's no, it's no different than anybody buying hyperchlorous acid uh, to work on their eyelids. It's, it's, not, it's no different. So, uh, you know, I'm gonna be prescribing this stuff, you know, very quickly. Uh, and you see the first bullet, you know, who would you prescribe it to? Uh, anybody that, has a positive test on the allergy test now. So I don't think I'm going to make recommendations to get on immunotherapy if the allergy test revealed that you don't have any significant environmental allergies. So, I mean, that almost goes without saying. So they would have to have a positive finding for me to take to the next step of recommending some kind of treatment. Uh, every single article I found <clears throat> says this thing is safe in kids down to age three. And a lot of the pictures I found were of little kids being treated. So again, I think especially up in the part of town, uh, up in you know the, the Collin County, Northeast, uh, 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 you know, Dallas and Plano and Frisco and Allen and McKinney and Pars Prosper and all of those spots up there, man, with the young families, you know, I, mean, they, they, I think allergy is a pretty big disease up there. It just seems like this might be a growth market. It might be an opportunity. There may be an opportunity here uh, to help your patients with young children. Uh, determine if they have any significant environmental allergies. Uh, pregnant people can use it. The only uh, caveat there is that if you, it, it seemed like it was safe enough to where if you put the person on the drops and then they got pregnant, you would leave them on them. But if they got pregnant, you would not put them on them. You wait till the person delivered the baby until you started. Uh, not real common around here, but just to know. Uh, the biggest negative with this stuff is, is the potential of, of asthma attack. It's very rare, but it's there. Uh, so you would you would uh, monitor people with asthma a little bit closer, maybe not treat them perhaps, or just be aware. Um, yeah, I would go about that. And then here, uh, even people that have uh, multiple allergies, which is fairly common, it's pretty uncommon actually to see a person with one specific allergy, uh, then even if they have multiple allergies, uh, they're candidates for the sublegal treatment because you can put more than one different type of allergen in, in the glycerin solution. Uh, so it's not a problem at all. So some basic treatment guidelines here, just as a introduction. So this is an introduction to treatment guidelines of optometrists prescribing FDA approved uh, sublingual uh, immunotherapy. Okay. Uh, there are some adverse effects. Uh, the, the literature says they are extremely infrequent and never serious. Uh, there has never been a death reported with sublingual administration of immunotherapy where there have been multiple deaths reported anaphylactic shock is the primary cause uh, of people receiving allergy shots. Can you imagine going to the allergy doctor, getting a shot and you're dead two hours later because uh, you had some itching? <laughs> that's, that's pretty tough. Uh, but there's multiple uh, incidents in the literature that are documented with that. And, and as a matter of fact, Dr. Lee commented on that three or four times in her lecture. And it was you know, they talk about that stuff like we talk about somebody getting a corneal ulcer. You know, it's like, you know, hey, make sure you keep them in the office 45 minutes so they don't die. I'm like, that's it? That's, that was it? That was the admonition? You know, it's just like, it's like wow, okay, okay. Uh, it's a little different, little different spice on it when I was listening to that part. But you see the adverse effects. Every one of these except for the top one is not serious. Uh, the asthma attack is the only serious one. And there are two or three... I think uh, examples in the literature of somebody having to go to the hospital uh, after they did a sublingual administration and had, had an asthma attack, and, you know, they treated it there and the person was fine. No deaths, nothing serious. The, 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 the guy that wrote this article here, uh, this Dr. Supporta, uh, and he's pretty big on, <clears throat> on this stuff. He's got several articles that I read. And based on his personal experience, uh, what he said, the biggest thing is this, this gastrointestinal upset. <clears throat> you know, I don't know since I haven't done anybody yet, uh, but he said, 
He said, this is the killer. He said, everybody else could put up with most of all this stuff. He said, but if they start getting diarrhea, it's over. He said, they will stop. They will not take the drops. They will look at you like you're crazy. And you better not try to talk them into it. He says, all of this other stuff, you could get them through it. You could hold a hand. It'll pass. He said, but if they start going to the bathroom all the time, uh, just it's over. You know, no matter how much benefit they could get from the therapy uh, to work on the allergies, nothing is worth having diarrhea. And the patients, I think his number was that 88% of the patients that develop gastrointestinal upset discontinued the medicine. And that, so only 12% figured it was enough to put up with. So he said that was the big bugaboo to where the patients would stop. All the other stuff, he could kind of just explain it and it would, it would ease up and go away. Or, or, you know, occasionally they would just stop treatment. You know, I mean, if every time you put the drops in, if your tongue started itching like crazy, okay, you got to stop. Uh, but that doesn't seem to happen a whole lot. So most serious thing is asthma, extremely rare. The most common thing is this. <clears throat> and to me, and I, I, you know, I, I don't have enough personal experience yet. I'll find out in a couple of months. You know, I, several of the articles I read say that, you know, with the under the tongue stuff, it's in a vehicle of glycerin to keep it stable. So what you do is kind of put it under your tongue, let it slosh around and kind of foam up in your mouth for 20, 30 seconds. Let it get absorbed through the humerus, tumoral system up under the tongue. You know, all the goes into all the, 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 the vessels there, you know, real quick absorption. And then you're supposed to swallow it. D depending on the company, depending on the, the, the specific agent, what I think, and, and, and I think what the recommendation here with the, the Allerfocus product is that after your 20 seconds of exposure, you spit it out. And I think that prevents you having the gastrointestinal upset thing. Uh, and the articles that I said, that I read that said spit it out, said that you get like 95% of the effect, you know, compared to swallowing it. So I don't even know why you would swallow it if you're going to get 95% of the absorption, just holding it under your tongue for 30 seconds. So to me, I think I tell my patients, hold it under your tongue and spit it out. And then you can eliminate one of these little circles, hopefully. So adverse events, just so you'll know, not too big a deal. <clears throat> so let's kind of finish up here. Let's finish up. So we've talked about all kinds of stuff. Talked about the COVID virus. Talked about ocular surface disease, talked about the immune system, we talked about the immune response, we talked about abnormal immune responses, the most significant one for eye doctors being the allergic response. Uh, we've talked about allergy testing, traditional testing, we've talked about skin testing with, with new stuff that optometrists can do. Uh, what do you do when the, when the results come back good versus bad? Okay, we've talked about all of that stuff, okay? So let's finish up. We're back to the immune system. You guys see the picture I hijacked off the internet. And I, it's kind of, kind of in a perverted, funny way. As I was doing my image research, I saw this picture 15 times. So a picture of somebody, you know, trying to put their hand up and stop these floating COVID viruses from diffusing onto his body. And it's almost like, get back. You see, he's got his hand up, get back. You know, get back, Satan, get back, get back. <laughs> it's just, you know, that's what the, I, I could I couldn't resist. I'm like, okay, that's it right there. So you got this guy, this image, the purple skeleton man, holding his hand up like it's going to stop something and trying to stop this COVID virus from getting in his body and killing him. Okay, that's what this picture is showing. And I saw it 15 times looking around for images about current topics and events. So I said, this is the image. I keep seeing it. And it makes perfect sense. So this guy's trying to stop it. And this image was associated with an image search, whereas I started my research looking at articles, you know, and I, and I kind of, and I saw that thing on CNN Saturday where it was talking about immune system and boosting your system. And so I Googled boost your immune system. Now, I warn you guys, after we finish here in the next 10 minutes, if anybody wants to waste time on a computer, as soon as we finished, you go Google boost your immune system and you will have 38 pages of paid advertisements coming up trying to sell you everything from snail shell to horse hoof hair and pig intestines and laetrile and vitamin C and zinc and hydrochloroquine and this and that. And it was dizzying the number of pages that I had to actually scroll through to get down to some actual scientific PubMed type articles on that topic. I was almost mad. 
ad after ad after ad. Nutrient, supplement, mineral, uh, what's it, animal, vegetable, mineral. Yeah, I mean, it was just, it was everything. Uh, everything, okay? And so I waded through all of that garbage and I finally got down to the science. And what I found is that there really isn't a whole lot of science. There's not any step-by-step -step protocols put out by the National Institute of Health on how to boost your immune system because there's no such thing. That's why there's no plethora of articles talking about that topic because the topic don't exist. It's nonsense. It's made up of, of hucksters and shysters and people trying to make money off of us. That's what I now think boost your immune system means based on my internet search. The terminology is your immune system is efficient or it is inefficient, period. It's working or it's not. It's gonna protect you or it won't. And all of the science says that these five things here are what you can do to improve your immune system efficiency, the diet, the exercise, drink a lot of water, sleep all the time, and don't be all stupid and crazy. If you do those five things, you appear to be healthier. And then they're extrapolating that increased uh, rate of health with a more efficient immune system. That may be backwards math, but that's the way it goes right now. Uh, I'm working with that as opposed to me taking some vitamin C pills so I can boost my immune system, okay? So the conversations I'm having with my patient very soon is going to be how do we improve your immune system's efficiency as opposed to leaving it in its inefficient state if it is inefficient. I believe that a positive allergy test on this skin prick testing that I'm going to perform would be a reflection or an indicator of the status of the person's immune system. And someone who's got 18 allergies to 17 different things, eh, I'm gonna think maybe their immune system's not really efficient and maybe it could be improved. Someone who has practically no allergies, eh, they may be in good shape and we don't have to do a whole lot. I can go right, I can go left. It would depend on what the test results show me. That's how I'm going to converse on this stuff. That's how I'm going to use the information. That's an example of the direction I'm going to take going forward. So let's use this person here, this, this last thing, as an example. I've been lecturing for 15 years. I've got over 100 cases on the COPE website. And never once in my entire career have I made up a fictitious or hypothetical patient until now. That is the, the reality of COVID-19 pandemic, ladies and gentlemen. I'm making up cases because I don't have one because we ain't working. I'm out of business <laughs> up, until, up until I hope at the most six weeks from now. So case report, in the future, in, in, in La La Land, where we all, you know, eating green cheese and, and living off the fat of the land. So it's six weeks from now, and we are all seeing patients again. That's what we're doing. It's six weeks from now. And we all see it patients again, real patients, not urgent, not somebody with a stick in their eye. You know, somebody want to buy something and, and we ain't afraid of them. Uh, you know, that, that, I'm hoping that's going to happen at the most six weeks from now. So let's say that's going to happen because that's going to happen. Okay, there's no way we're going to be like this. Not forever. It's, it's impossible. Uh, we all know that. Uh, we'll, we'll deal with the virus rather than be like this forever. Okay, that's what everybody knows that. Uh, we're going to wait it out for a while, but, you know, we ain't going to be out of business a year from now. So six weeks from now, I think we'll all be seeing the patients again. It may not be real busy. They may not be spending a lot of money. They might be kind of scared. They might have masks. I don't know. I don't know. But we're going to be seeing patients again. So I think for you guys up there, it's going to be a lady like this. So if you see... So y'all were seeing 25 patients a day? Okay, it's getting ready to be 17. That's what I think. Now, if I could be wrong, and you know, we've been rescheduling the patients for the past three, four weeks, and I got 50 patients scheduled on March, on, on May the 1st, but that's two weeks from now, who knows? You know, I could have 20 show up, who knows? Uh, but I don't think it's gonna be like it was for a minute. So anyway, 
33-year-old lady comes in, the hypothetical 33-year-old lady comes into the office for a routine exam. You don't already rescheduled her twice. She got VSP. <laughs> She's a minus six. She wants some glasses. Uh, so so she, you letting her in. So she's in. Even though the visit is routine in nature and the exam services are reported to her VSP, IMED, Davis Vision, Superior, whatever, during her history, she complains of intermittent ocular irritation over the past few months. Well, we didn't all heard that before. We've heard it so much time, so many times that we almost are dismissive of it. Uh, the staff may type it into the computer. We might not even reference it when we go in the room. Uh, if we're busy, bad day, whatever, it might say, hey, you know, which is better, one or two, get out, okay? Thanks for the money. Uh, you know, they might, she might say, yeah, my eyes are, are, are burning, they run water a little bit. She might have, your staff might have topped three things in there. You're like, okay, next patient. Uh, so during the history, she complains of intermittent ocular irritation. You're going to be listening a little bit better now if you got 12 a day instead of 22, okay? You're going to listen a little bit stronger now. And she's going to tell you that her eyes are irritated, and you're going to type it in, or you're going to look at what your staff did for real. And so then you're going to examine her, uh, and during the exam, as you must do, you'll document the clinical signs that suggest the presence of allergic conjunctivitis. I'm not going to go through all of that stuff now. We're almost done. Uh, Y'all know what that is. Uh, and, you know, just as a matter of protocol, uh, you know, sometime in the, in the visit, I would make sure that the patient is not under the, the current care of an allergist, you know, like, like going, you know, the past few weeks, past month, past two months, past three months. Ain't nobody been anywhere the past month. Uh, but, you know, if she's under the active care of an allergist, I'm not going to be probably messing with this stuff too much. Uh, you know, but again, uh, I, never say never, because I can say, hey, are you under the care of an allergist? And she said, yes, I am. So what am I going to do then? You know, just shut up and, and say, you know, can you buy some glasses? I'm going to say, do you like him? <laughs> do you like her? Because what if she says no? See, y'all, you got you to gotta take the extra. What if she says no? You know, so I say, hey, man, are you seeing an allergist right now? You know, you've been complaining about these allergies. Yeah, well, you know, is he good? Do you like him? No, I can't stand that son of a gun. You got anybody better? Yes, I do. You looking at him. <laughs> Come right here. That's what I'm going to do. That's my recommendation, y'all. I'm recommending that. That's my recommendation. So assuming they did not under the care of an allergist and have not had any recent diagnostic skin testing, then I'm going to talk them into gently to come back in a week. And, and because now, I promise you, I promise you what's getting ready to happen. So now my clinical case presentation is going to discuss the possibility of systemic allergies contributing to the ocular irritation. And, and we've all done that. I'm just going to hit it a little bit harder. I'm going to go a little bit stronger. I'm going I'm to be a little bit more thorough, just a little bit. I'm going to take the extra step, and you're going to see why, COVID-19. So I'm going to take the extra step, and I'm going to talk about systemic allergies and and. Oh, I might, I might talk about the immune system a little bit, and, and I might even mention the word immune response and how a, an abnormal immune response is, is related to having an allergy, and, and that's a reflection of the, the, the efficiency or the inefficiency of your immune system. And, oh, hey, wait a minute. You saw the TV yesterday that you saw them people getting that, that virus, and uh, uh, some people, they don't even hardly have a cough, and... Some people near death and some people are dying and, you know, they, they think that everybody's immune system is different and, and maybe that's why people respond different. That you've heard all that, right, Ms. Jones? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so what I want to do, if, if we can, is I want to, I've got some technology where I could get a lot of information that I really couldn't get before about the, the status of the function of your immune system. It doesn't hurt at all. It's, it, it's painless, I promise. It, it don't hurt. And, and if, if, if you want to get a little bit more information about how healthy you are and the, and the status of your immune system, I, I really think it'd be a good thing if we, we did this allergy test next week and, and, and got as much information as we could. You think that's a good idea? Yeah, Doc, I, I do think that's a good idea. I, I, I do. I like that idea. That's a good idea. All right, I'm going to have Susan schedule you next Friday, and, and we're going to figure this out. And I'm going I'm to see if there's anything wrong with you, and we're going to move forward, okay? Okay, Doc, whatever you say. That's what I'm going to do. And when they come back after that VSPI exam a week later, this is that visit. This is how you report that visit to the payor, whether the payor is the patient, Medicare, Cigna, Aetna, United, Medicaid, Scott and White, whoever, okay? It's all the same. Uh, because as of now, and it ain't really now, it, it changed last year, 
was, I'm kind of mad. I, I try to keep up with this stuff. I can't believe I can't believe I didn't see this. I can't mad. I'm oh, I swear I'm almost mad at myself. Uh, <laughs> that you see, so I'm a you know I'm gonna look at the guy or the lady when she comes back. You know, so she was there Monday. I looked at her. You know, we decided she was gonna do the test. Let's say she was taking two or three things. I, I told her to stop taking them. Okay, well, I want to see if that changed. I'm going to walk in there. You know, I'm going to at least look at her face to face. I may not slit lamp or I don't know. I, I'm going I'm to walk in the room. If I walk in the room and I looked at her, y'all know me. I just examined her. Okay, that's an exam. I just examined her. So she got examined. Uh, and then, my, then I'm going to walk out the room. I say, Susan, hey, these young ladies here, they're going to take care of you. I'll be back in 25 minutes. Okay, because <laughs> that's what I saw my friend do. Okay, that's what he did. He was in there 10 minutes out of like 30. Uh, and he walked out the room. And then the staff did it. And that's what I watched. I watched the staff do their thing. And they did their thing. It was quick. And this is how you report the service. The procedure code is 9504. Uh, the diagnosis code is going to be allergic conjunctivitis because that's the medical necessity that you did the test. As long as you got something in your record that suggests the presence of allergic conjunctivitis, then to me, you're, you're, you're you know, you're legal, you're moral, you're ethical. Now, if there's nothing wrong with them, you know, we're not even having this conversation. I'm going to my next patient and we're not even talking about this. So by definition, this is somebody who said my eyes are itching, burning, water and red, sensitive to light, foreign body sensation, da 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 This is somebody like that, okay? Uh, which is, again, to me, if you see 20 patients a day, okay, that's eight of them, nine. Jesus, I mean, it's easy. Uh, it, it's, it's low-hanging fruit. Two-inch putt. It's a gimme. This is a gimme. This is a gimme for us. And think about, so I don't even want to, this is a practice management lecture, but I know I don't got your attention now. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to get off this slide in a second. Uh, this is, I put this asterisk here. Again, I was working on this thing three hours ago. There's supposed to be a little bullet down here, right with the asterisk that says Medicare. This is my Medicare approved amount. So these are public fees. I'm not trying to tell people what to charge. I am not trying to tell people what to charge. You charge what you want. You charge $10, you charge $20, you charge $1,000. I don't care. Don't mean nothing to me. That I'm not trying to tell you what to charge. This is what I get paid by Medicare. These are public numbers. I'm using it as a reference. I will tell you, this is the lowest fee. And I have seen several uh, explanation of benefits forms from several doctors around the country. Uh, every single insurance company pays more than this uh, the highest was about 550 that I saw from like uh, Cigna. Blue Cross paid about 500. Supposedly, there's some, some carrier in Oregon that paid 700. I don't care. Uh, I mean, that's, I, you know, I don't care. That's, I don't want to get bogged down with that. But as far as a return on investment, uh, you see, ladies and gentlemen, this is a significant practice enhancement opportunity. And I use that term in a pseudo comical, derisive, uh, sarcastic, ridiculing uh, tone. Uh, as part of my research, uh, you know, I probably, I mean, again, I, hours and hours and hours. So, and, and unfortunately, a lot of this stuff's in ophthalmology journals. So I was reading this ophthalmology journal. You know, it was an allergy thing, uh, allergy article. And the guy was talking about stuff. <clears throat> and then the, it wasn't even talking about this, but it was at the very next article. So it was this bunch of ophthalmologists. They were having a round table. And it looks just like our journals. It was just like looking at review of optometry or, or optometry management. And so these guys are talking about how to make money, these bunch of ophthalmologists. And the, the way they used it, they kept saying, so we're going to discuss practice enhancement. That's the, way they, that's the way they talk about making money. They say, so, we, so we're going to, this, this course is on practice enhancement, enhancement. So they don't say growth. They don't say practice management. They don't say return on investment. When they talk about making money, it's practice enhancement if you're an ophthalmologist. Okay, so, so if you wanna talk about some practice enhancement, uh, the, the, I mean, I'm gonna enhance my practice uh, by, by turning myself into an allergist and doing some in-office allergy skin testing, and I'm gonna prescribe some sublingual immunotherapy for the patients that want it and need it, and I don't care about that because I'm not selling it and I ain't making money off that. That's not what I'm doing. Uh, I'm, I'm a doctor. I'm gonna figure out if there's something wrong with my patient. I'm not a pharmacy, so I don't care about that part. Uh, that part's cool, you know, that part's there. Uh, but I don't care about that part. I care about, <laughs> about the part I just told you. So last slide. In conclusion, in conclusion, we got this COVID-19 thing. It's, it's on everybody's mind. We all know it. Everybody's really sensitive about their health, their health status. It's almost past being sensitive. They're almost scared. I don't take advantage of scared people. 
but I do take advantage. And if something's there to be taken advantage of without me hurting anybody, I'm gonna take advantage of it. Uh, this is there for us to be taken advantage of. Uh, people are worried about their health. People are sensitive about their health status. People actually are talking about immune system, immunology. I'm looking at diagrams of, of molecules on CNN intended for people with a sixth grade education. The time is now. The opportunity is now. Okay, the, 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 all the groundwork is being laid on, on mass media, and all we got to do is jump in and, and, and dovetail it and finish it off, which is exactly what I'm telling you how to do. So what I want to do is I'm going to use this technology to, and I'm going to go at it with the, I'm going to tie it all in where I'm going to get information about the status of your immune system. If your immune system is inefficient, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to help you devise treatment strategies to improve the efficiency of your immune system. And if you are a good candidate, I'm going to recommend sublimmunotherapy, which will help modify and desensitize a patient's immune system. I'm going to modify and desensitize a patient's immune system. Man, this, this is real. This is, this is, this is a big deal. The, 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 an optometrist modifying and desensitizing a patient's entire systemic immune system. Not me immunomodulating somebody's eyeball with a drop of restasis, some, some cyclosporin. This is a whole different level. We, it's a whole different, whole different game now. I didn't kick my, I, I, I didn't step my game up. Okay, I'm, I'm stepping my game up to the COVID-19 pandemic time. This is how I'm gonna practice optometry post-pandemic. I'm gonna be more sensitive to this. I'm gonna educate my patients. What it, I'm gonna help them to better health by obtaining more information about them and sharing more information with them. Man, that's almost like a tagline on a card. More information about them and I'm gonna share more with them. I'm good enough to where I can convince my patients that this is in their best interest, because it is. Whatever's in their best interest is in my best interest, and it's going to be good for me, and it's going to be good for them. I got this kid on Friday. I can't wait till I fire this bad boy up. I'm going to be doing three or four or five of these things a day. I'm going to be making decisions with the information. It's going to be good for my patients. I'm going to enhance my optometric practice, uh, which might need some enhancing uh, in this post-pandemic time frame. Uh, and I'm going to practice the best optometry I can in 2020. And I strongly recommend you guys join me and take advantage of this opportunity. Use this time wisely. Get up on the internet like I did and read some articles. If you want to turn yourself into an allergist, we got the opportunity now. The, the, the patients need this. Uh, the, you know, it's, it's there for the taking. I'm getting ready to take it. Uh, and I'm going to help my patients navigate this stuff. I promise you they're going to like it. I already know they're going to like it because I'm good at it. They're going to they're gonna, they're gonna want information about their immune system from their eye doctor. And they're going to tell their friends. And I'm going to be so busy I won't know what to do. That's what's happening, y'all. So I think we are done. I am prepared uh, for this aspect of my, my post-pandemic optometry practice. Uh, I think it's going to be really cool, and, and I can't wait. I am really actually looking forward to it. Uh, I think we have some time. Uh, there's probably a few questions. I'm going to stop talking uh, and, and see if anybody wants to jump in, and, and we'll, we'll finish off. Thank you so much. Super educational, but also super motivational. Uh, to go back to work and um, get back to our patients and start making some money and uh, compensate for all the losses we had. So you're super motivational in that end and super educational because we never knew that we could do these allergy stuff. And there were a couple of questions about that, uh, Craig, that um, a doctor asked that a couple of years ago, he tried to purchase this kit from Bosch and Long, but he wasn't able to do it. Uh, are we able to do it now? Well, that... I know that I can't speak for Bash and Loam. Uh, I would say yes, because uh, I saw an article in Modern Optometry that referenced a doctor using the Bash and Loam kit. And as I said, I purchased my Aloe Focus kit and it was delivered this past Friday. So they sold me one. And I was not going to buy it until I saw proof that I could get paid. Uh, I saw the letter from Medicare 
and I saw EOBs from doctors that I know and trust that, that practice in Texas. So I've seen EOBs from, from Novitas that pay this. Uh, I've seen the letter from Medicare that says they will pay optometrists. So the fact that we could buy it, then obviously we could do the skin um, prick test that, uh, that you're doing. Well, you had to have a, an optometry board ruling too, which was the third leg. So, so you had optometry board ruling that, that gave it approval too. Oh, okay. So I, I don't know if it was in our scope of practice then, which is, that's what, that's what I think. I mean, I'm not 100% sure, uh, but I know we couldn't do this a couple of years ago and now we can. Okay. So to me, it would be board ruling, insurance rules. So those, both of those changed. And the slit, S-L-I-T, um, how do you prescribe it and write an Rx for it? Is that the treatment or is that the actual test? That the slit is the treatment. Tr treatment. Okay. So, so, so slit stands for sublingual immunotherapy. Okay. okay? So it's the drops. Uh, the, again, I'm speaking from book learning because I haven't done it yet. But from what I could see and from talking with the Allofocus representatives, uh, you know, you would do the test, <clears throat> record the results, make your analysis, determine what, what uh, uh, the, the patient is allergic to. And then based on the test results, the company uh, gives that finding to the compounding pharmacy and the compounding pharmacy makes up the drops specific or customized for that person, depending on their individual allergy test results. So everybody's medicine is kind of different. You know, it's not one drop for 20 people. It's like, you know, 18 drops for 20 people, 18 different ones. So they, they compound them individually. So you would, so the, the, the way I understand it again, cause I haven't done it yet. Uh, uh, I will shortly uh, is you have two options where, if you wanted to somehow supply the product, just like we supply vitamins and fish oil and stuff, you could stock, not stock it, I guess, but you could, you could have the patient get it through you. Uh, or you can, or the patient would order it directly through a patient portal uh, on, the, on the company's website. Like, for example, I have patients that, that have uh, uh, testosterone eye drops for severe dry eye. So I have a compounding pharmacy that makes testosterone eye drops down in Houston. And they can get them from me or they can call the pharmacy direct and just order them. So this is the same kind of thing. Okay. Uh, doctor wants to know if you could go back to the slide uh, that had the two tests on there. Uh, there was a slide that had the two uh, procedures. I guess she wanted to take some information off of that. And while you're doing that, uh, Dr. Ed Mackler says, thank you, Craig. I think you brought many ODs out of some minor depression. Ah, he. <laughs> <Made us laugh. laughs> That's cool. And, <laughs> Thanks, Ed. Uh, when you were mentioning about all the crazy treatments online, uh, you know, to treat out. Oh, God, it was incredible, man. Yeah. It was like, it's like juju beads. And I mean, it was, it was insane. It was, if, you, if you were a patient, you would just be overwhelmed. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 it's almost like when I tell my patients, when I'm talking about blepharitis, I say, okay, the last thing I say, whatever you do, don't go home and get on the internet. <laughs> whatever you do. <laughs> Funny enough, I had a patient who was giving her daughter, three-year-old daughter, donkey milk uh, for her, the, the kid's allergies. And each ounce cost hundreds of dollars. And she had it frozen in her fridge, giving it to her daughter for several years. And she was going to Oklahoma to this farm that they raised donkeys to get this milk. And, and that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about there's 38 pages of that stuff. <laughs> they want to boost their boost it, boost it up, boost it up. No, what you want to do is make it more efficient. So again, to me, what I'm going to do, I'm going to this whole, I'm, you know, I'm not, we're already there, but I'm going to just kick it up a notch going into the wellness thing. You know, that's, that's the way to go. Uh, you know, just get, just, more of a wellness thing with the, with the vibe, you know, make you a little bit of money doing this test. Uh, I, you know, the, the profit on the, the drops was minimal. I don't even want to mess with stuff like that. Uh, you know, I'm as many things as I am, I'm not a pharmacy. Uh, that, you know, I, I do lots of stuff. I don't, I try not to sell stuff like that, that people can get other places and the 10 or $20 that I make from it, I just, it just doesn't matter to me. Uh, I'd rather do four of these tests 
uh, a week instead of three of them and make an extra three or $400 like that. And just not even worry about the other stuff, <laughs> you know? And again, I think I've got enough patients that complain of ocular itching, ocular irritation, dry eye symptoms, my bony gland dysfunction. Uh, again, I, I know, I know it because I've been up there in, in guy's office and I know in that part of town, allergy and asthma is a big deal. And it, you know, just, it's a big deal. It's a common problem. I just think this is something that's going to be easy for a lot of us to do if you want to do it, you know, low cost to get in, spend 10, 15, 20 hours doing some independent study, get your knowledge base up and you could go right at it. There's another question. Uh, I know before the webinar, me and you, we spoke about this testing and the treatment. Um, doctor wants to know um, how much the test kit costs, if you could really, you know, uh, let us know about that. And also how much the treatment costs for that slit drops. Well, I, again, I could just tell you what I paid and, you know, it's, you don't really talk, talk about the money too much. Uh, you know, I, I, it's about $4,000 to, to buy a kit. <clears throat> That's what I paid that. You know, she jacks it up to six thousand. I'm in trouble. Okay, <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, uh, but I, I paid about four thousand uh, dollars, uh, and there's enough set supplies in there to do between forty and fifty people. Uh, it averages out to about eighty dollars per test, as far as my disposable cost. You know, the, the the stuff I keep in the fridge and everything. So, with this one kit that I spent four thousand dollars on. I can do, you know, let's just say 45 people, okay? Uh, you know, let's, let's go by the Medicare number. Let's say the Medicare, uh, Medicaid pays for this test, and they only pay like 150 or something. Uh, you know, I say only 150. I mean, it's 150. Uh, uh, you know, like I said, Medicare is about 350, and then everybody else is higher. But just use Medicare as a base. So, I mean, if, 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 if Medicare was paying 350, you know, you would only need to do – you know, you know, 80 people. Uh, so you'd get, and you'd make a lot of money. Again, I don't want to talk about the money too part uh, too much, but you know, 350 times 50, $17,000. So I can produce $17,000 in gross income with a $4,000 to $5,000 cost. That's pretty good return on investment nowadays, you know, uh, and, uh, and and again, you know, the care is so much better. Uh, you know, the, I've said it many times. I'm a doctor. I like to doctor on people. The more doctoring I do, the more money I make. They go together. As long as it's ethical and moral and, and legal, there's nothing wrong with me being a doctor and doctoring on people a lot. I like to doctor on people. Uh, I try to find people that have stuff wrong with them. So I got something to do. Uh, fortunately, half the people I see got stuff wrong with them. <laughs> okay, you know that it's all good for me. So, uh, you know, return on investment-wise, <clears throat> you know, I mean, I I don't want to diminish it, but this is a component. I mean, that's part of what I'm saying. You know, we're not in the clinical part now. I mean, we got to make a living. Uh, I think it's going to be a little tiny bit harder to make a living for a few months, and this might ease some of that pain. You know, if I could do one or two or three of these a day ended up with a thousand dollars extra at night hey, that might go a long way toward easing this pain <laughs> and dr thomas just real quick this is the last question uh, do you have any idea how much it costs for the slit drops that's the last question i have yeah the the patient from what i saw because again i haven't done any yet uh but the stuff that came with the kit uh patient cost for a three-month supply is about 180 190 dollars something like that okay so and say 60 dollars a month one last question yeah. just came through. How do you determine how many units to build? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, the, um, you build the max. You always build the max. So, uh, so here, so you're testing for 80 different allergens. And the way this is reported, it's a, a one allergen is a unit and one unit for this procedure code has a value of $4.39 or something like that. So it's $4.39 times 80, okay? And <clears throat> from what I saw and from what I've read in all the instruction manuals, you know, there's 30 seconds of difference between doing 60 tests and doing 80 tests. I mean, it's, it's, you know, you might as well do 80. <clears throat> you know, it's like everything. You might as well do as much as you can to get as much information as possible. Uh, 
I did think, I'm not sure, because again, I don't have any personal experience yet. This is also brand new. But one thing I did see, and I, I tried to confirm that on the website, and I don't want to be you know, besmirching anything or, or biasing anybody by, by any means at all. Again, I don't work for anybody. I'm not a consultant for nobody. I'm trying to share information. That's all I'm trying to do. I thought this was cool information. It was brand new, and I just wanted to get it out. But when I looked at the, the one on the Bastion Loan, and again, I've accessed the website two or three times to make sure, they do 60 panel units. And so if you had the Bastion Loan test, if I'm understanding it right, the most units you could ever build would be 60. Uh, you know, to me, that's 25% less than 80. Uh, since I'm not doing the work, I think might as well just build for the 80 and get as much as you can. I don't, now what I don't know, and again, a good question, if I give this lecture again, I'll have to find out, is, is the disposable cost with the Bausch & Lomb product lower than the disposable cost with the Aller Focus product? I do not know that. Uh, so that's a good question. Uh, but, there, but to me, if everything I've seen so far is consistent and is actually accurate, I do think there's fairly significant advantage in billing 80 units as opposed to billing 60 units because you're going to get 25% more dollars for the same work, perhaps, and 25% more information. So I don't see why you wouldn't do that. So that might be a slight competitive advantage one over the other, but I'm not sure. If the disposable cost on the Bastion loan is $20 instead of $80, then it's not a big deal at all. <laughs> I'll have to find that out. That's a good question. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. We are out of time. We really do appreciate it. Thank you for doing all the research and spending over 50 hours, as you mentioned, on this. Um... Oh, man, it's good for me. I can say I, I, I'd have turned myself into an allergist now. It's on. <laughs> <laughs> um, last presentation, I was a lid hygienist. And now yeah. I'm... Oh, yeah, I forgot. I forgot the lid hygienist. I'm going oh. to oh, work yeah. on oh, that yeah. first. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to put that in. That's all, all right, man. I'll see y'all next time. <laughs> Thank you so much. Appreciate it. All uh, right. Bye-bye. All the attendees, um, just real quick, I apologize for all the confusion uh, at the beginning of the meeting. This is our first Zoom meeting, so we weren't sure if you were able to um, have you see your name or not, but so my mistake on that, and I apologize. We do have all your registered information along with your license numbers, uh, so we do have that information that we're going to submit to the board. This meeting is recorded and we could uh, download all the chat information so we could save that and we could go through it and make sure everybody gets their credits. Um, just in case uh, uh, you did let other people use your ID and uh, sometimes we see two people on there versus one and whether it's your wife or your friend who's a doctor that wants to get credit, just let us know. You could email us at uh, nitosdallas at gmail. Um, send us a message or you can go on our website, Nitos, um, nitosdallas.com, and we could get your credit um, processed. And um, also, I apologize if you got too many evites for this meeting. And again, that was my mistake. I wasn't uh, sure if you needed to register or not to register, but next meeting, we're going to get this right. We're going to do this right. Um, so again, thank you so much. We appreciate it. We're going to leave it at that. Oh, one last note. Uh, it's times like this, you really appreciate Maggiano's, you know, bringing in those appetizers and desserts. <clears throat> it's times like this that you really uh, miss uh, Maggiano's. So I, I really miss all of you guys as well um, and all the doctors and all the uh, people. So can't wait for this thing to finish up and we could get back to our routine. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. You all have You're a welcome. wonderful rest of your day. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, and we are back and welcome back everyone. I hope you enjoyed Craig Thomas's little uh, video there. He did it for us, uh, I guess it was earlier in the month as things are starting to get started again as he's trying to figure out ways to generate revenue as uh, we're all coming back uh, online. So uh, I'm not sure if uh, Paul, Gretchen or Steve are back yet, but I am here with you and thank you so much for hanging in there um, and watching with me. Um, get that off there for a minute. So we're coming up on the uh, two o'clock Pacific time uh, hour very soon. And we can take a look and see what kind of classes are going on. Maybe we could uh, show you what's coming up uh, in the next hour or so. So let's pull that on up here and we can see what's happening. Get the old schedule together. So let me give that to you for you folks can see it. Um, 
So coming up in about 20 minutes, we're going to have 10 new treatments in eye care with Dr. Berujic, uh, soup to nuts of mod modern corneal transplants with Clark Chang and Dr. Magpara. Um, uh, then Dr. Michaud is going to be showing us slowing myopia progression one child at a time. And this is all Eastern time, actually. So let me uh, move back. I guess this would happen. So 5 o'clock uh, Eastern. So this is where we are. Sorry about that. So uh, Art Epstein is going to be doing a two-hour lecture on dry eye. Um, and we're going to have uh, the beyond refraction effects of macular carotenoids on visual performance. So this is all about uh, supplementation um, and trying to improve the performance of your patients as well. It's a very scientific lecture. You'll see we had a PhD come in and give this one. So interesting one. Uh, then diagnosing glaucoma and the new technologies that people have been using. Um, and just a review of what's been going on there. And then finally, another uh, technology lecture talking about how you can use tech in the office uh, to differentiate your practice and improve outcomes. So again, more on technology. So that's coming up soon uh, at the two o'clock hour. And Steve, Gretchen, Paul, you guys around yet? I'm here. I just got on. Hey, Steve, how's it going? Yeah. Good, real good. Um, I'm, hearing, I'm, hearing, know they... I'm hearing some echo here in the background or something. <laughs> What was that? It's not me. Nope, it's gone now. Me. Okay, maybe it's just the, vo the voices in my head. Um, so yes, yeah, so how's no, it going, I, Steve? I, no, it's going fine, and like um, you uh, didn't know, and I didn't know, I checked out all the Facebook pages, and you're streaming all over the internet, so uh, I think the president's watching you now also. There we, we go. Be tweeting about it. <laughs> yeah, so it's, uh, it, it's interesting, The um, let me uh, take a look here. It's interesting that... Uh, my computers, you know, that we use to actually stream this, we're streaming to multiple locations at once. So I'm just glad I haven't started a fire down here in our basement um, because I, <laughs> I could tell it's, you know, it's getting stressed to the limit here. I'm watching how much uh, the CPU is working over the past couple of hours. So uh, I'm glad that it's working, though, and that we've had no dropouts. That's pretty cool. And what's interesting is somebody wants to watch it without uh, listening because they're doing two things at once, uh, automatically closed captions come up. I don't know if you designed that or just part of what uh, YouTube does. Hello? Yep. No, sorry, I'm hearing an echo again. I don't know who's got something running. Yeah, in I hear it too. It sounds like it's a class or something. Steve, do you have something on in the background? Oh, yes, I do. Oh, uh, Steve, it's Steve, gone. Steve. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was, um, I had my computer on a very low, right. low uh, level. I didn't hear, even hear it. Yeah, I know. Um, I've been, I've been, I did that the other day, actually. It was hilarious. We were in the middle of a webinar, and I'm like, who's feeding back? And I'm like, oh, wait, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> it had the computer right in front of me, so we all... We all do it. So okay, anyway, I just, I just put the schedule up here just to show people what's going on. We're going to have Tammy Petrosian come on and talk a little bit. Uh, we'll hear about her, her child's meltdown today, too, which I can't wait to hear all about. <laughs> Ooh, that should be interesting. I might have somebody who's uh, calling us in about afterward, too. I'm, there's somebody else who wants to talk to us, so I'm trying to slap that person in tonight rather than tomorrow. Oh, cool. Because I've thrown in some other people, and um, so we'll see. Excellent. And then tomorrow is going to be a jam-packed loaded day. Uh, you know, I've, I was looking at our schedule. Today's a little bit of a light day just to try to get back in the groove of doing all this stuff. But tomorrow we, we have a lot of people to talk to, so it'll be good. Well, and, let me ask you this, Adam. Mm -hmm. There are a couple for tomorrow with question marks. Are those confirmed or can I fill in those times? One of them is confirmed. I'm not sure about the second one. I'll let you know as soon as we get off here. So okay. let me, uh, I think. <laughs> Uh, I'm at my wit's end. There's so many people. Yeah, I think one of them is confirmed. So, um, yeah. But yeah, we have a lot of people to talk to tomorrow. It's going to be fun. And uh, I saw actually there were questions that came in. And Steve, I saw that, that you started to address them where people want handouts um, for the materials and yeah. the courses. And I know that we leave it to the discretion of the speakers to provide those. So where we can get them, we will. And I know, Steve, you just reached out and we're trying to get a PDF uh, for, for one lecture. I think it was for Dr. Hall's lecture. Um, yeah. Yeah. In my initial on instructions to them, I tell them all the things they have to do, and one of them is to please send it as a you know a MP4 file, and also send it as a PDF. That way, people could uh, download the slides. And I don't think they care. I mean, they, it's not proprietary, and it's stuff that uh, I think they'd like to disseminate anyway. People could keep on taking screenshots anyway. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, but uh, I guess uh, Kat could do it on her end, but why create more work for her to, to do 63 lectures if they could do it individually? Yeah, it's funny. When when we ask for material, people don't realize, like, you know, they think that when they hand us something in, in whatever format that it's easy for us to convert, and usually it is, but when you're dealing with, like, 50 or 60 people, it gets to be a little bit uh, burdensome. Yep. So the easier you make it, the better. Um, cool. 
So yeah, so tomorrow we're going to have a lot of fun stuff, a lot of different people coming. You know, we'll get the streams going again across multiple platforms. Hopefully this computer won't turn into a smoldering crater uh, by, <laughs> by tomorrow because, yeah, it's, it's really pushing itself. Um, and we'll go from there. So I just wanted to share with people before Tammy comes on, and maybe Paul will come back. I don't know if he's coming back or not, if he wandered away. Um, <laughs> <laughs> who knows where he went? He's probably eating. Like, I, I just don't know. But I just wanted to share with folks... Uh, put it up on the screen, and again, if you're streaming this now, it's at, over on Facebook and all those other sites, you can see this. I'll put up the slide so you can see it. Uh, as far as we know, this conference has become the, the largest in optometry, so thank you for everyone for turning up. Um, it's very surprising and humbling, and um, I'm just glad to have everyone here, and hopefully we're making the experience okay. As you can see, we're trying to you know do whatever we can to make it better, like finding handouts and so on and so forth, or if you're having problems getting credits, you know, we're always here to help out. So we've been answering uh, tech questions all day as well. So that's been kind of fun. Um, again, you can plan your day. There's a downloadable course schedule at the CEYR site. Go get it for the rest of today and for tomorrow uh, to plan, you know, what classes you're going to take because it's very rapid fire, you know, one class after another. So if you plan it out, it makes it a little bit easier. Uh, the system will record which lecture you attended, so remember you can't be in two places at once, but um, you know, so pick your courses wisely. And again, if you miss one this time around, we're doing this all over again in June with the same classes, so you'll be able to see it again. And if, if you do take a course and just somehow forget to um, do your attendance, you can go to the help menu, find the course, click on it, do the attendance then, the computer will remember that you were there at that time. You can't do it if you didn't do it, but if you attended it, we'll, uh, the software will remember it for you. So you don't, don't yeah, have to worry let me about actually, doing it at that time. That's a great point. Let me show this to people again. And I made an instructional video that I think Kat put in the room at the beginning of the day today, and maybe we'll send it out again overnight tonight. So people will just be reminded, if you forget to fill out that little form where you attest to the fact that you were there, you can always go to the Help Center, which is right on the top of the menu. You can see it right at the top of the screen in the lobby. And if you go there and you scroll down, you'll see these, quote, quizzes. Now, where it says live here, those aren't actual quizzes. They're just forms that you need to fill out where you vouch for the fact that you were there and put in your early tracker number. And all you have to do is click on one of them, and then a thing will come up that says, yeah, I was here, and, and so on and so forth. It takes a couple of seconds for it to come up, but you can see it here on the screen. All you have to do is put in your tracker number. Did you attend, yes or no? <laughs> um, and obviously, you want to put in yes if you did. It's a very high-level security system there, Adam. So here's the thing. It works uh, in two ways. There's this where you can put this in, but if you didn't actually sit through that class, it won't give you the credit for it. So it actually marks to see which one you took uh, to see that you sat there through the 45 or 50 minutes or whatever. Um, so even if you answer yes to this, if you go back and look at your certificates, if you didn't take the class, it won't actually allow you to get the credit. So, and we'll say that, Gretchen. Yeah. We'll say you have not attended the uh, full uh, class or something yeah. like that. The, the reason that we're doing it, and I know it, this seems a little bit arcane having to do this way, like click on this extra thing and say, yeah, I was here. It's all due to the fact that Cope changed the rules on us after the initial conference was done this year in February. So we can't go back easily into a working system and completely revamp it um, to make it super smooth. This is the, about as big a compromise as we had. Instead of having a real quiz, because COPE removed the quiz requirement, we just give people this thing, which is a quiz in quotes, but not really. It's just your OE tracker number and where you here. Um, so that's the substitute, because the system expects something, some sort of user feedback before it'll issue the credit. So we just thought this was the easiest thing to do. And right. again, this is and all... And when you do... Yep, okay, because COPE when changed you do the rules. Pass, it'll, uh, mm -hmm. When you do pass, it'll say that you passed the quiz don't be confused. That was your quiz, but uh, I've asked them to change the verbiage for tomorrow so it doesn't uh, even confuse you. That it'll say you passed, then you get your credit. Yeah. So again, this is a temporary thing just for this year because of the rule changes that Cope made long after our conference was already in production. Had Cope made these rule changes like in October when we were just starting to set up the software for the year, this would have been so easy for us to change and have the developers come back in and make you know streamline changes to the system. But doing it in a working system where people are already every day coming back and taking tests, and you know we have thousands of people on here, making wholesale changes is really difficult to do in a working conference. So I, I keep joking that I'm going to be really happy when June 30th rolls around, um, just because we're going to finally have some time to take off. Usually by this point, C-Wire is of course done, right? The live stuff is long gone, and so we're able to sort of relax and think about next year. But because of everything that's happened, we haven't had time to really think about next year at all. Um, you know, we've been, we've been so trapped in the present. So again, well, sorry for the little inconvenience with the way the, the system, you know, registers your quizzes. The important part, though, is that we're always here to help. So even if 
you know, you mess this up with the quiz or, or you don't see that your credit's recorded, we're always here to help you. And we know that you took the class because we can actually see the number of minutes. Uh, and we can make sure that everything gets submitted properly to Arbo so you have your credits. So I guess that's the most important thing. We're always here. There's no escape for us. You know where to find us. You have my, you have my cell phone number. <laughs> and well, to your appetite, I've been working on next year, and, and through the help of Gretchen, I have about eight new speakers that uh, I think people will be well received. Some she knows and some she doesn't know. Well, you know okay. I live to serve. And you know what? Speaking of serving, it's about nine minutes to five. So we have some classes starting in room one. Art mm -hmm. Epstein is going to take on a two-hour class talking about expert dry eye, a system for success. In room two, James Stringham will be talking about beyond refraction, effects of macular carotenoids on visual performance. In room three, we've got Murray Fingeret and Mike Shiglazian talking about new technology improving diagnostic acumen in the realm of diagnosing glaucoma. And then finally, in room four, um, Timothy Fries and Larry Wan talking about technology. Technology is expensive unless it differentiates you practice through patient outcomes. So we've got um, a two hour class and then a three one hour classes. And also too, just to a shout out to one of the six o'clock classes, we've got Benjamin Treat talking about a clinical update on COVID-19. So something very timely. Absolutely. Yep. If, if, if you can stomach it, if you really want to hear about COVID anymore, this is a good, <laughs> at least it's a scientific thing that you can listen to. You know, you don't have to, to hear all the rancor and, and how nervous everyone is. This is actual science behind the virus itself. There's something somehow comforting actually looking at the science and looking at the viral proteins and stuff in a very clinical way. So kind of an, it's an interesting he's, lecture. He's a PhD and he actually knows how they develop these vaccines and maybe it'll make you feel more comfortable if you watch Lexi Gretchen or less comfortable depending on how you view it. <laughs> <laughs> right. So yeah, that's coming up. That'll be good. Um, and what did I want to do before Tammy comes on? We have about five minutes. So we went over the rules for, for filling out to get your credits. We have sponsors, uh, We do have a lot of sponsors. So up on the screen, you'll see them all, except for one new one who we're not really talking about this time around because we don't have much to say. It's a company who's got a, a, a drug that's going to be coming out very soon. They're going to actually be sort of making a splash in June uh, with this new drug. And by then, we're going to be able to talk a little bit more about them. But just sneak preview, they're going to be coming on. Um, so these are all of our current sponsors. Let me just sort of run through them. The most important thing you can do, by the way, if you want to support our sponsors, is go to the exhibit hall. And getting to the exhibit hall is very easy, right? You've, you've all seen how it's done. You know, I can pull it up to show you. You know, you go back out to the lobby, or you can just click on exhibit hall right here. And here you go. And they all are here. And you pick the one that you want to look at, and in you go. Um, you know, super easy to do and lots of content in here about the different companies and their devices and so on and so forth. Um, and if you want to get discounts, this is the place to go. So you can come on in here. As you well. know, one, one thing you could ask, yeah, we had one person on ODR yesterday to say, you know, he loves the idea of the exhibit hall, but he really likes the idea of going live and being able to touch and feel the equipment. A valid, a valid complaint. Sure. Uh, so it may be required to, to ask the uh, vendors what provisions they've made. If, if somebody wants to try out their unit, how, how could they go about doing it? You know, right. Yeah, so. Short of going to an exhibit hall. It's hard, right? I mean, there are some things that are, some devices and so forth that are amenable to carrying with you, right? I mean, like tear care, right? It's like a hockey puck. How difficult is that? Um, but if you're looking at something like an OCT, that's a little more challenging. So it'll be, it's a good question. You know, we should ask if we get Zeiss on the phone or whoever tomorrow, you know, what kind of provisions people are making for this, if any. I mean, there might be an assumption that there will be physical conferences again, you know, soon. You know, as, as we've all seen, Academy thinks it's going to happen. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, but I, I like in what we do, it's almost like, I think these days, like when you buy a car. I mean, I feel bad a lot of the times for car dealerships, but not that bad. Um, you know, because so many people go there, you want to test drive a car, you want to feel it, you want to smell it, kick the tires, and then you'll leave. And then what do most people do, right? They go to True Car, and then they go actually try to find the best deal for it. Um, and I kind of wonder if it's the same thing here, whereas, you know, Gretchen said, you go to the Equipment Petting Zoo at Expo West, you, you kick the tires, you feel it, 
And then later you just look for the best deal. And I wonder if that's the kind of situation we have here. That's yeah. called showrooming, by the way. When you go to a bricks and mortar location to check out um, whatever product, product it is you're looking for, and then you use that handy little device in your hand to try and find a cheaper play, uh, price than from the place where you're actually checking it out. Yep. And by the way, in terms of showrooming, the one company that I've seen that's actually handled that problem probably better than just about any other on the electronics side anyway is Best Buy. Um, they know that people do this. They're not hiding from it. They don't shy away from it. When you go in there, they show you what other retailers are doing online price-wise. They'll price match. And now I've noticed they'll even sort of have special parking spots right up front where you can just order the thing online and they'll dump whatever you buy right in your car. So they are sort of taking on the internet head on, uh, competing on convenience, right? The idea that if you want something immediately, you want it immediately, you don't want to wait for Amazon. So anyway, that's just an aside. So they, they understand the showroom showrooming phenomenon and have tried to actually do something about it. Um, so if you're in, in their presence in their showroom to try to close the deal right then and there, which I find really interesting. A lot of retailers don't do that. But Paul is right. When I uh, would buy equipment um, at, let's say, a Vision Expo and I'm looking for an OCT or an Optos or a wide field camera, whatever it might be, you like to go from vendor to vendor and kick the tires, see how they work, see how they, they physically do things. And there's no way they're going to bring two or three devices into your practice. They just don't have a sales force that's big enough, these companies, to go into everybody's practice to try to resell them to you. Uh, so you're right, Paul. There is kicking the tires does work. Um, but my. Like Adam says, there's other ways of buying things. Yeah, yeah, I wonder if they could, if the companies could make some sort of guarantee. For example, Marco, uh, when they install, they'll have a trainer going out to the to the site. Uh, am I wrong, Ed? Isn't that what they for most say, for, say about? Yeah, they'll, they'll train the staff to do it. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering if they if they would do that and give a 30 day money back, like the mattress companies. That if you're not satisfied with the unit, we'll, we'll pick it up. I wonder if, if if they would be getting anxious enough to start doing that, or well, one company would do that kind of thing. I haven't heard anything like that. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it happens. Uh, it's an interesting model, uh, but I haven't haven't heard of anything like that yet. So, sure. I mean, it, realistically, though, people are just starting to you know shop again, right? For the very long time, even when we did this in April, people were a little bit gun shy, and even the vendors were a little bit gun shy about talking to people about price. Um, they didn't want to push it, and now I think we're just getting started again. So these are all really good questions. I wonder, is Timmy? Are you here? It looks like we may have had somebody else on. Oh. I'm I'm here. Oh. Yay! I thought I saw Hi, somebody. Guys. Hi, Timmy. It's I'm Gretchen. back. <laughs> it's good to hear from you guys. I, I, I was on here three hours ago because I um I confused the times because you're oh, you know, oh right yeah. specific time. Yeah, sorry about that. Um No, it was it was it, it's on me. So I was able to go out, do some grilling um with the kids while while my lectures went through and now I'm here. Nice. Yeah, so Steve was telling us a story before about a donut. Is he accurate? Yeah. But oh, first I want to make clear you didn't grill the, the kids. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the donut was was a bad situation there. So so there's my, my youngest kid is named Gregory. And um, by our house, there's a cafe called Gregory's Cafe. And he loves going there, obviously. But it's been closed. And so we went out for like a, a morning stroll the other day. And I didn't bring anything with me because everything is shut down. But, you know, lo and behold, the cafe was open. Mm. So he wanted a donut from his cafe and I didn't have any money with me. And so it just evolved into like a, a breakdown of epic proportions. And uh, what was supposed to be a 10 minute stroll turned out to be like a two and a half hour, just painful, oh, God. <laughs> painful thing. But you know, that's well, just you know, that if, with the territory. If you were a mother with, were a mother with chutzpah, you would go in there <laughs> and tell the donut person the story and get a free donut. I, 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 I guess that's, I mean, I, I didn't even actually consider that, but yeah, sure. <laughs> that's, but, but Tammy, you created quite I mean, a stir in my house. You're, you're from New York, Tammy. Yes. I, I, I know, it. It, wasn't, it wasn't very New Yorker of me, I know. <laughs> but yeah, Steve, your, your daughters, right? Your yeah, daughters both chimed in. I, they have, I have grandchildren that are about maybe a bit younger, but about that age, and they're beautiful at most times, but when 
one little thing sets them off like that, they become monsters like yours did. Yeah, and they're beautiful so, when they're asleep. <laughs> <laughs> when they're on the floor. But you, uh, when I sent them your, your thing that you wrote, uh, they, they both cracked up and said, oh, mine would have hit and killed me and were flat on the floor screaming and yelling. And so uh, we yeah. could relate. Yeah, yeah. I think most parents can. I mean, with with all everything that's going on. I mean, everyone everyone is just going their their own way of crazy. I think, right. and and the kids are. You know, I think the kids they can't really understand what's happening, so it's kind of hitting them a lot harder than, um, than all of us because we couldn't at least like intellectually comprehend what's going on. Right now, Tammy, you, you and I both have young kids, so I think we're mm -hmm. both in the same boat here, right? I mean, it's getting to the three month mark here. And I think we're just about starting to lose it. Like I know school's coming to an end and that's great, yeah. but it's like for these kids, I just, I feel for them because, you know, my son was telling me yesterday, he's like, man, I haven't seen anyone my own age in like almost mm -hmm. three months. And it's like, what do you tell yeah. him? I'm like, I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, I wish I were a little kid so I could help, but <laughs> yeah. my best. Well, do you, do you have more, do you have a, an only child or you have several kids, right? No, 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 one, one kid, he's an only child. And... One, okay, so that's, so, so I feel, so I have three of them, they're, yeah. they're, you know, constantly fighting but at least they they get social interaction i feel i feel really bad for the the single children because then like yeah you're stuck at home with adults and that that can't be fun in any way I mean, for anybody. I, I'm, I'm doing everything i'm playing all the video games playing ping pong yep. you know trying to do all the stuff but it's just not the same and i know it's not and he's playing fortnite with his friends and you know remotely yep. and everything but it's just it's just different right yep so. i've gotten very good at fortnite at roblox <laughs> at a lot of wait, a lot wait, of just wait. shooter games yeah Tammy, Tammy, yeah. what is Roblox? I just met Ro Roblox. Ro Roblox. Oh, it's like Roblox oh, that's a all thousand the rage. different things. Roblox that's is all like, the rage. yeah, it's great. It's like for, it's like uh, Minecraft, but better. <laughs> yeah, it's, okay. yeah. I just it's, met, it's like a um, first person. Uh huh. I just met little girls who live behind us. They just moved in and they said they like to play Roblox. And I felt like such an old lady because I had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> So you go it's in, you create yeah, your own avatar to like to look like whatever you want to look like. And then there are different, there's like thousands of different rooms that you can get into. And there's like a, a mission that you kind of team up with your buddies to like go rob a bank or go like kill the zombies or go just like go bounce around someplace or um, so there's just thousands of different rooms where you have a goal and you go and you either complete it on your own or you team up with people and you complete it together. Got it. Okay. It, yeah. Thank you. And, yep. and, and the, the best part is you have to go and spend Robux. And so when I'm right. with my son, I'm like, well, I'm like, buddy, this is the closest thing to gambling that I've ever seen, but because of what's going on in the world, you got it. <laughs> so, well, so I, I have reached, so absolutely. Like yeah. I told them that you can go, you can play, it's free, go for it, but I am spending zero money <laughs> and I, I have them doing chores and, and they get, they get paid for their chores. It's like measly, measly cents, but they get paid for their chores and they're not allowed to even use their chore money mm. for, for playing these video games. And so the retaliation was um, both of them so my older two they're in third and fourth grade they had to write essays about um persuasive essays and so both of them um wrote these these huge <laughs> essays about why children should be able to use their chore money for whatever they want and how i'm restricting their civil liberties and their rights <laughs> <laughs> Love it. but i just i i find it ridiculous to to allow them to spend money on a video game i just i can't I, I won't let them do it. It's it's a hard idea so, to, to wrap your mind around like a Fortnite skin, yeah. paying twenty bucks for it. It's like wow, really? But right. then again, you know, yeah. I spent my money on useless crap too when I was a little kid. So that see, yeah. that was one of their arguments because they're like, well, you're on Amazon all the time, and and you know, I and I'm like, but I'm stop, I'm buying stuff for you, so I don't, I don't yeah, know. They're, I think they're they're starting to crack me, but we'll we'll see how it goes. You know, the the three months. Uh, incarceration they may start feeling like inmates yeah and yeah. before you know it they'll go on a hunger strike <laughs> yeah for better conditions honestly i wish they would because the amount of cooking that i have to do to feed three boys is just is 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 just a, just a lot it's it's they're constantly eating to the can, point where, I, like, I'm thinking of putting a lock on the fridge. I can only. Can we handle handling um, the schoolwork for them? You're still working, I know, and cooking, etc. Uh, how do you yeah. do it all? 
I, I, I don't know. Lots of coffee, lots and lots of coffee. Yeah. So we have, so I'm, I am not going in. Um, so I'm thankfully able to do telehealth. Um, so both for vision therapy and for our primary care emergency care, I'm able to do telehealth. So I'm at home, but I have the three of them that I'm doing homeschooling with and, you know, they get a half hour of zoom with the teacher and then they get a full course load for all three of them. So I have to sit there and do, you know, three courses of, of work with them every day and plus everything else. So I, I did make sure that they participate in laundry and dishwasher and, you know, all of that. They vacuum, they mop, they do it all. They do it horribly, but they do it. Um, you know, because, and, and they complain and I'm like, well, you live here, so you need to do it. So, I mean, that's, you know, some, some good things. I mean, there's, there's a lot of bad stuff that's, that's happened with this, but there's good stuff too. You know, we play family games, we get to go out on bike rides and, and things like that. So I don't know. We, we all kind of survive. Well, good. Yeah. So it's, it sounds like you're, you're handling this pretty well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it, it's kind of like there's, there's no alternative choice. So, right. you know, yeah. Yeah. So meanwhile, yeah. back back in the world of CE, you gave a, a talk, you know, kids are your thing, which is, I guess, why you're doing so well <laughs> at home. <laughs> but um, you gave a talk about psychiatric drug therapies in children. And I saw a report that one third of all people are showing signs of clinical depression right now or anxiety. That's insane. So that's actually, that's a low number. So <sighs> we have a historic wave right now of mental health problems. So anxiety, depression, substance abuse, Unfortunately, things like child and elder abuse um, have gone up. Suicides have gone up. Um, PTSD, all of those are at historic highs. And there was a poll done by the Kaiser Family Foundation, I believe. And they said that half of Americans report um, that coronavirus, like in this past three months, has hurt their mental health. And there's been a 1,000% increase um, of of um, calls into the substance abuse and mental health services administration um, this in April versus April of last year, one thousand percent. I mean, that's crazy. Wow, yeah, that is crazy. crazy. There's also um, an online therapy company. So there's there's online everything coming out now, I guess. Um, but there's an online therapy company called Talkspace. So they said that um, there's been a sixty five percent jump in their clients since mid-February. So like in the past two months, 65% wow. jump in, in their clients. And most of those new clients are due to coronavirus related um, anxiety. So anxiety and depression are, are the big ones. So it's, it's crazy. So obviously, you know, these people are becoming more anxious, depressed and, and having um, suicidal ideations. And obviously the medication aside from you know talk therapy and medications are are on a huge rise now as well so it's it's all it's all bad yeah and even kids right so kids are starting to use these medications more as well yeah yeah definitely um because i mean it, if if you have um, you know, just like just like with telemedicine with us, you have a patient presenting, you're afraid to bring them in because, you know, and even with kids now, we used to say that coronavirus isn't affecting kids, but now we have this general um, immunity and inflammatory problem that's that's happening with kids. So it's, it, you know, especially if a kid is, is not good health wise, you're not going to want to have them coming in and doing like talk therapy. So the, the amount of prescriptions that are being, you know, anti, anti-psychotic, antidepressant prescriptions that are being, um, prescribed for, for these kids, just people in general is, has gone up a great amount. Yeah. And so what do you think the OD should look for in terms of the visual effects of, of some of these drugs? Anything that they should be on the lookout for, assuming they're actually able to see kids in their practice at this point? Yeah. So so with these, with all of these meds, no matter what the meds are for, um, whether it's uh, a mood stabilizer, an antidepressant, tranquilizer, antipsychotic, or CNS stimulants, um, the top two things that are going to happen is um, ocular motor dysfunction, so psychotic pursuit dysfunction as well as diplopia due to um, things like convergence insufficiency and maybe um, a strabismus. So just ocular
vascular motor dysfunction, um, as well as accommodative dysfunction. So mm -hmm. a lot of these medications are um, anticholinergics, and so they'll cause cycloplegia and they'll cause uh, dilation of the pupils. So those, like, no matter, pretty much no matter which medication we're talking about, um, those are the big two to, to look for. So if you have a patient, you know, case history is, is key. But if you have a patient that is um, starting a new medication or have changed the medication or increased the dose of a medication that they were previously on and now you're having, you know, they're calling you as an emergency for, for telehealth saying, hey doc, you know, I'm having double vision or I'm having, you know, my pupils are, are dilated. It's gonna be a bilateral obviously because it's a systemic medication. Um, and I can't see anything, you you definitely want to ask about any change or new medications and the, the cycloplegia and the extraocular muscle um, dysfunctions are going to be the, the big two to look out for with these meds. Right. And as you mentioned, the history is the most important thing here too, right? So I guess sometimes there's the assumption that kids aren't really on too many things because they're kids and generally they're healthy. Well, that's, <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, that's not that's not true. There was a, there was a study done... I don't want to misquote, but I think it was like a 10 year review of pediatric patients um, from um, preteens and down. And they said that one tenth of children are on, um, or even more than that, was it one? T yeah, about a tenth, one out of 10 children, not a tenth. Well, yeah, that is a tenth. Yeah. One out of 10 <laughs> children are on a chronic systemic medication. Wow. That's um, a lot. That's a lot. That's huge. That's a lot. Wow. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I so, mean, th think about that. Yeah, I mean, that's that is very an impressive number, and I wouldn't have have guessed it was that high. So, uh, I guess the case history yeah. really is a very important thing to take and, and do it accurately. Um, yeah, and and then like it's also you know some some kids are you know taking things intermittently maybe to study for an exam. So they're taking something to, you know, concentrate better or stay away to stay awake to to cram for an exam. I mean, I guess that's not as relevant now. Um, you know, benzos are on the rise because um, they're kind of they're they kind of give you this like relaxed feeling. So um, you could have, you know, a parent that's or a grandparent that's on a medication. You you now have kids that are bored right. and they're rifling through their medication cabinets. And so, you know, that all of that, you know, asking things like, are you taking something that isn't prescribed for you is a very, very important question. And maybe having mom and dad kind of out of earshot while you're asking that can mm -hmm. also be helpful in, in the honesty component of that. Right. You know, another interesting thing that's, that's happening, I don't know if you thought about it, but, you know, because since kids are, are your thing, school in the fall, I mean, is that even going to be a thing that people oh. go back to? I, I can't, I don't even know. I, I saw yesterday, I don't remember which state it was, if it was Alabama or Arkansas, it was an A state. Um, they were prepping for, for school reopening and they were putting um, plastic separators between desks so that the students would be in like their own little plastic cubicle inside of the class. Um, that's crazy. And <laughs> that's crazy. That's ridiculous. It's like the cone of silence, I mean, right, for all the kids. Yeah. yeah. It's it's just I mean like that that's really you know that's kind of like walking into a prison. It's just like why why do that? Um, I know there were there were some guidelines being sent out, um, so saying things like uh, for lunch, children will now only have lunch in their classrooms. No going to the cafeteria. You have to bring lunch with you. No after school programs. No extracurricular programs. Um, so uh, no like gym or, or active interaction programs. Everyone has to be six feet away, no sharing of materials um, and all of that. But I mean, I, I, I think a good possible way to do it is to break the kids up into two groups and maybe have group A come into the classroom in the, in the morning and have group B do like virtual um, classroom in the morning and then have them switch yep. so that that way you you kind of have it both or like do it you know alternative days or something so that you cut the kids down in half because I mean you're not going to so social distance kids it's just not going to happen they're going to pick their boogers and wipe them on each other no matter right. what you do <laughs> yeah. Tammy but um, how does it work from your end a working parent like you and your husband which many many if not most are with that sort of schedule and no busing, I, et cetera. How, I don't, how does I don't, that work? 
I don't I don't know. That's that's a, a great question. And I so I'm supposed to be going back into um, the university for for patient care in July. Um, daycare centers are not open. I know that they're saying that you um, for um, essential personnel, they're going to have certain daycares that are open, but I don't want to send my kids to a daycare, you know, so um, I know camps are all closed, camps are shut down, I can't bring them to work with me, um, I could potentially have my parents help, but I don't want my parents around because they're both older, um, nannies are not working, so a lot of the nannies are older, you know, grand grandparents um and and they're not working right. so i don't even know where to where to find someone to take care of my kids so we're like we my husband and i were discussing and we said you know we need to alternate days so he would stay home with the kids i'll go to work and then we'll alternate i i don't know yeah i mean steve i think the the parents convenience at this point is not being considered at all by the school districts it's what can they do to actually keep the infection rates down and i think tammy your idea is what our district was floating too, the idea of breaking the kids in half so that the ones that you do have there, they have enough distance between them during the day. So every, kids go every other day or just half yeah. days. So, yeah. yeah. But, but how do you do that, though? I mean, a lot of kindergartens have gone, have done away with AM and PM kindergarten because we don't have as many stay-at-home mothers as we did as when we were all kids. And in fact, mm -hmm. my mom was never a stay-at-home mom. She was a nurse. Right. Mm -hmm. And I never went, I didn't go to kindergarten. So how do you deal with, you know, if you're an AM student or a PM student? I mean, that makes sense in theory, but in execution, it's it's not possible. I mean, it's going yeah. to be alternating it. One, one day uh, AM, one day PM, it be a disaster for a working parent. Yeah, yeah. so they, they or might... Or even AM at all so they just might all a and all right they what might do do they might split it up and just do every other day where you're in class you know every other day. Yeah, yeah like tuesday thursday and then you do virtual for the rest yeah. but that's that's what they're then talking what do you about do with your kids the other days the other i mean days. so yeah. i think one thing that's that's one interesting thing that's come out of all of this is the fact that a lot of people are able to be extremely productive working from home yep. and and maybe even more productive working from home. So I know that there are a lot of companies that are now saying, even if we open back up, we're giving you the choice of continuing to work from home if you want to. So I'm assuming that what the plan is going to be is to, you know, maybe alternate the, the children day wise as opposed to AM, PM, and then have the parents alternate in terms of who stays home. And now given the fact that a lot of parents are able to be successfully functioning parts of society and, and working and being productive from home. I, I think this this whole entire situation is going to change the way we we work. Um, also, just economically in terms of like house prices, because now, like, for example, my, my husband, he's he's in in finance and he has a lot of his colleagues that went down to like Myrtle Beach or something like that. And they're they're actively working, but they're working, you know, from the beach. Right. And so they no longer they're not paying their, you know, Manhattan housing prices. They're renting out their their apartment so they don't have to pay for it. And they're you know, they're working as much as they ever did and being productive, but they're not paying their rent for their apartment. Um, we could do so much in optometry, but not 100%, that it's really hard to, um, I don't know, Lance a Shalazian or whatever remotely. I mean, there's no, the, uh, telehealth has been wonderful for, you know, the, the patient that, you know, I've had patients that got hair dye in their eye. I've had a lot of those. Um, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's been a lot of those, men and women. Um, you know, a lot of patients having uh, hordeoli because they're constantly touching their faces. I think having a mask on your face is actually making people touch their eyes a lot more because the amount of hordeoli that have been ca calling in has been a lot. It's been extremely high. Um, but everything else, like, you know, if you have a, a corneal abnormality, if you have a, I don't know, if you have a uveitis, something you need to put a steroid on, if you, you, you can't, you can't do that telehealth. You need to see the nope. patient. Yeah, absolutely. exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So there's always going to be that, that physical component of what, what you guys do. So it is going to be an interesting thing, though, to see when things do start up again in the fall, you know, how different the world will, will look for all of us. Um, yeah, 
And then there's always that second uh, hump that everyone is saying is coming. So, you know, well, until until there's a vaccine and even with the vaccine, they're fast tracking everything with the vaccine. So is it going to be safe? Is it going to be effective? That's, you know, everything is just up in the air. Right. Don't ever say that in front of Gretchen. <laughs> no, oh, why well, was that? Has, <laughs> did I stumble into something? Uh oh. No. Yeah. It's a short story. He's anti-vaccine. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, you know, Tammy, right, I got I'm a question just, for I'm you. I'm just going to gently backtrack. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. well you know, you, you you actually, you know, you have talks and you and you you obviously get out a lot. What's your comfort level? What do you think about you know in the fall? You know, all the meetings that are that are still actually on everyone's schedule. Do you think those are going to happen or not? Well, so optometry is not happening. Um, Academy, so I'm I, I'm supposed to lecture at Academy in, is it in October? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, so they actually sent out a, a, a survey thing um, to the speakers asking, are you still planning on attending the meeting? Would you, uh, are you still planning on presenting your, your presentation? Um, would you, would you be more comfortable doing it virtually? So, so I don't know what their, what their plans are, but there, there's definitely thoughts of moving it into a virtual um, conference as opposed to doing it live. I don't know what the, the end result will be, and I don't know how serious those thoughts are. But for for me personally, I don't, you know, with three kids at home, with not having any kind of, you know, there's there's no vaccine, there's no guarantee of anything. The the flights right now, my, my brother actually flew down to, to Myrtle Beach also. Um, and he, it's usually, you know, a direct flight. It's a two hour direct flight. He had to do two stops to get to where he was going because there's not a lot of flights available. Mm. Wow. Um, I, I don't know. And then all of all, you know, being in a, in a conference where you have people coming from internationally from everywhere and, and bringing God knows what with them. I, I'm not sure. Like I, so I, I told them that I would rather um, do things virtually. Hmm. So I, I don't know. I don't know what the responses were from the other speakers, but right now with, with everything going on and, and no clarity, I, I would rather, you know, hold things virtually. Yeah. yeah. And just so you know, I have, I already have a direct flight from Newark to Nashville. You can, you're in New Jersey, right? You could. Yeah. Adam has to fly halfway around the world though. <laughs> Well, that's the thing, right? You guys have the easiest time out of anybody in terms of getting to places. You know, for someone like me, yeah. when I look at Nashville, I'm like, there's no way. I'm going to end up switching planes in a place like Atlanta where I'm going to have to hold my breath the whole time. Yeah. Like, I'm just not <laughs> doing this. <laughs> no way. Well, based on what Tammy just said, most, most likely a, a high percentage of docs are going to say they'd rather do it virtually from home. And I don't think it depend on the vendors so much at uh, the Academy as Vision Expos, et cetera. So it very well might be a virtual online uh, experience. Yeah. And, you know, with 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 the, the virtual experience, um, you're reaching so many. So it, it costs a lot of money, right, to go to a conference. I mean, there there's nothing like going and, and seeing people and meeting them and chatting with them and, and seeing people in, in real life, obviously. But there's also a lot of expense that goes with with the travel and, and with everything. And a lot of people, you know, internationally are not able to to do that either because of time or because of childcare or because of, of money. So making conferences virtual um, has actually, you know, in these past three months, there's a lot of CE that's coming out um, virtually. And so many people from um, less affluent countries that might not have financially been able to pay for the CE or travel, you know, to, to the CE locations have been getting this really high quality influx of education, which has been amazing just in general for the optometric world, because we're now increasing our quality of uh, knowledge. Absolutely. It also works virtually for, um, at the Academy for various uh, events like, um, Oh, I don't know, Paul Falk is getting another honorary degree or something like that. <laughs> you can do these things virtually right. rather than um, uh, live. Uh, right. So you don't, you don't have to all be, 
it's good to be together. I just want to eat at a restaurant outside on a table, and so I'll take that now rather than having to go to Nashville. So one, yeah. of the, one of the interesting problems, though, of course, and I mentioned, and Tammy, if you weren't on the line before, I mentioned that right now CEWire has become the largest conference in optometry, right, just through sheer uh -huh. attrition, right, because uh -huh. <laughs> everybody else died. I mean, there's no other conferences that are this big going on. But the problem yeah. that we have and that everyone's going to have is by the end of June, COPE is going to revert their rules back to the way it was uh -huh. before. And mm -hmm. according to the insiders there, they're not changing their mind. They're not going to change it back. And so the question then is right. what's going to happen in the fall? You know, are they, going to, are they going to have to change it back? Will the outcry be so big where they're going to give yep. people live credits again? Or is this just a, a one-off for now? And I don't think anybody knows the answer. And nobody knows the answer. And then so, so the, the flip side of that is um, will the state boards change their requirements? So if COPE is not changing their requirements, might the state boards change their requirements for the amount of hours that you need of live versus online with quizzes? Um, or, you know, they might think about it and change the way we take quizzes because they're like open open book quizzes, right? Uh, pretty much. So maybe finding a different way to run the CE to try to maybe guarantee. So maybe, you know, doing Zoom calls and making sure everybody's cameras are on so that you could see that they're physically there and they didn't just turn their computer on and walk away. Right. We're in New Jersey both and you know how much they count on therapy by the sea and the local meetings and the regional yeah. meetings and where if all that money goes away, um, that's never going to be done virtually. It's just that it, virtual is going to be cheaper. I, I mean, if Therapy by the Sea is a big conference in Atlantic City, that, that's likely not to happen this year. Um, so I don't know what opto optometry should be down a lot of money to do the various things it's been doing over the past um, 10 years. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there's everything's everything is going to have to be rethought and changed. And, you know, if we're not getting influxes of money from these conferences, you know, we really might need to start to, you know, I know that there's a, a big drive for contributing to your um, to, to PACs and to donate donations, but there might be, you know, a, a different drive or I don't know, maybe an increase in dues. I don't I, I don't know. I have I have no clue. Yeah, I mean, I think the latter is, is the obvious increase in dues. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the difference in money doing things online versus offline is just so big. The gulf is so gigantic. Like, I, I don't know if this is accurate or not, but I believe that the expos, they take in like $20 million or something, right? And so, you know, you see that versus doing something online like CEWire where it ain't $20 million, right? It's super yeah. cheap to do. And it, it is that, if we do it for 20 million years. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, but I mean, but there, there is. I mean, you, you, there, there is a difference between, you know, like, like, say, you're shopping for a piece of equipment. There is a difference between going and and seeing it and feeling it and using it, than you know, reading reviews and talking to to people online about it. There, yeah. there is that difference. So I'm sure that there's eventually going to be a drive to reopen, you know, physical public interaction and conferencing. Um, you know, and maybe maybe organizations will might switch to doing half and half as opposed to, you know, all of their conferences are are live and all of them are are, are virtual. But yeah. I don't know. I always wondered why the manufacturers didn't group together or even a, a large distributor like Lombard or whatever and just have a showroom in a couple of the major cities. Right. Like, wouldn't it make sense for them to have a showroom in New York City where they could like you know, a car dealership? Exactly, and just have one of everything yeah. of the major devices from all the major manufacturers. Yeah. They drop one off, you make an appointment, you can go in and then have have your way with it, go play with everything. Yeah, um, that's that's a great idea. Yeah, That's I, actually a really good idea. You should pitch that. There you go. So, I mean, I just, you know, in, in a few of the major <laughs> cities, why not? <laughs> so That's not a bad idea at all. Yeah. Yep. So I always wondered why that was never done. And I guess up until now, it hasn't been necessary, right? Because you could always count on the expos coming every year. Right. Um, but maybe yeah. you can't in the future. I don't know. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. Well, all right, Tammy. Well, thank you for this today. It's always great to hear your voice. I just kind of, you know, I feel really weird. Obviously, I'm sitting here next to a stuffed animal that's supposed to be Gretchen. And it's just not the <laughs> same. I mean, I have just been trapped here alone for so many months now and it just feels really weird not being able to see everyone well is it is there a patch on the i i thought it was is it a dog or is it a panda what this, what actually this, is this that? this is a dog this is a dog named bailey uh-huh bailey okay <laughs> it's not named gretchen 
And, uh, <laughs> well, my last name is Bailey. Yeah. So. Oh. Okay. So uh, I, I think my son. Uh, my son. Was it Reed as a child, as a young child. No, so we we've had this for a while, but Reed named named this guy Bailey. I don't know if he was trying to be funny or ironic or what, but there it is. So. He's uh, Wait, did he name it Bailey before or after he knew me? Before, I think. <laughs> okay, just so, checking. So it was fate. So anyway, but it is it is weird not having you here and not, not having anybody. I mean, I've only seen Paul like, what, three times or something in the past three months? Um, it is, it, it's weird not being. Well, at least you're seeing each other. I haven't seen my parents for three. I haven't seen my parents for three months. Oh, gosh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's hard. So at least you get to see them. Yeah. yeah. So I know, the only reason I see him is because I know he doesn't go anywhere. Friends. You can turn Bailey into a, a puppet and you can like do, you know, open, cut his mouth open so you can pretend like he's talking like Gretchen. Yeah, my wife said that we should like, yeah. we should like stick one of the Alexa things right there and then just have a like bark <laughs> orders and stuff. So, <laughs> uh, Or we could do my other idea and I could just, we could set up something and I could talk through it. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh! All right, Tammy. Well, thanks for doing this again, and thanks for being right, here. Thank and, uh, you guys. And, and I'm sure we'll 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 catch up in the future. I know we're doing this again in June because it feels like Groundhog thank Day, you. and yep. this is never ending. Yep. So we'll talk yep. to you again in June. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you guys. You thanks. Bye, catch Bye, you Tammy. Have a good rest of your weekend. You too. Bye. 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 Yeah, she's a great girl. I've lectured with her. She's smart. She's vivacious. She's, she's funny. Uh, she was young optometrist of the year. So she's got it all. Yep. And thank you for her to coming on out here. So Gretchen, you said we're going to have another surprise visitor. Unfortunately not. I didn't hear back from the surprise visitor. So um, I guess not. So haven't heard back. So I guess we'll have to punt to tomorrow. And you need to tell me which of those um, slots are available. Yeah, as soon as we're off here, I will. And and so tomorrow what we're going to do is we'll we'll get this thing going again at the same time. We'll have, we'll have it running on a bunch of different platforms tomorrow morning. So Steve will coordinate and you can cross post it. Um, sure. And we can see, you know, if we get more people watching over there. And if we do that, you might even want to like stick around on those other sites to make sure if there are any questions, you know, people can, you can answer them. Um, yeah. Well, that's true. Let me actually see. I've been looking at it. They're on, I put them on 15 Facebook pages. So uh, <laughs> one thing interesting on Facebook, it's great. If you um, uh, share it to, let's say, 15 different Facebook pages and you make a change in it, it changes in all the pages. You don't have to go into each page individually and make a change, whether you made a, a gram error or a, a linking error or something like that. Oh, well, that's um, You know what? There's a lot of likes on it, which is pretty cool. Yeah, that's cool. Let me just see if. Let me go to a couple of these pages and I'll see if there's any uh, questions that have come up. Yeah, tomorrow we'll do a better job. I'll make sure to give you the links tonight and I'm going to post to this, you know, I'm going to put it on the CYR 20 to 20 page and then you can just take it and cross post it tomorrow morning right before we yep. start. Um, was, uh, Ed Bennett liked it. This girl, Mindy Rose Berger from New Jersey liked it. Uh, Jamie uh, Rose liked it also. And this is the only, this is on OD Wire. I'm going to go on OD's off Facebook, OD's on Facebook, I'm off of, but we won't <laughs> discuss that. Fine. Right. Yeah, so anyway. I'm we'll off on and on off. Yeah, and if you can find other groups to post it to, that'll be fun, and we can give it a shot. Yep. And, uh, okay. And, you know, we'll just do that there tomorrow. There is interaction. And the computer didn't blow up, so that's fine. I mean, I'm just streaming it to so many yes. places now. Um, yes, it didn't blow up yet. Don't jinx yes, it. Yes, it did not blow up yet, but, you know, maybe, maybe tomorrow um, it'll blow up. Who knows? Uh, and we'll do it on LinkedIn next time too, as soon as they approve our ability to do video there. So we will see. What's really interesting is the amount of people in each session is has stayed the same pretty much from uh, 11 o'clock this morning to now, about between 900 and 1,000. And uh, I guess the uh, East Coast drops off, and because it's Saturday night, they're going out to their den. <laughs> and so the we're going out there. And, uh, <laughs> I said to their den rather yeah. than their living room, whatever. Yeah, it's. I couldn't uh, think of anything funnier. I mean, I mean, what you're what you're seeing, of course, is that everyone wants the live credits. This is clearly what's happening here, right? So yeah, yeah, they they all want to cram in as many as they can. So I'm glad we're doing it again in June, uh, as well, so people can get more and more. So and and who knows what'll happen? I mean, if if Arbo decides to revert the rules again, like in fall, they just they discover, oh my God, Expo West has been canceled. We have to make everything live again. Conceivably, what we could do is continue with the lectures that we have, but then add on some more. So instead of just doing a brand sure. new 2021 event, just firing everything up again in, you know, in the fall with a few new lectures, maybe add 10 or 15 new credits and just throw it on top of the pile. 
and let everybody come back because we can keep using these lectures until they expire. Um, so, yeah. But Tammy did spill the beans a little bit. If um, it turns out that the academy is a virtual, it might do a very nice, large, you know, uh, hundred lecture uh, type event, and there, you know, they would do it not for profit, but for the good of mankind. The academy. Yep. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see what they do, yep. uh, and how they do it. But again, if if Arbo is not going to relent, their attendance is going to definitely be skewed. It's not going to be what they want it to be, right? Because as we have discovered, the live credits mean everything to a lot of people. Uh, because it's what mm -hmm. their states allow, it, it makes a huge difference. So, this has been an anomaly for us. You know, we never had to experience oh. this before, and I just I wonder what it'll be like if if the rules you know revert to the the old world the way it was. I guess we'll find out. Yes, we will. <sighs> All right. So otherwise, the conference looks like it's going well. People are actually still registering right now. Just FYI. Uh, so if anyone is interested in is that right? Just, oh yeah, yeah, we're getting people registering throughout the day. I keep getting notifications. So yeah. People are still signing yep. up. Uh, you know, I'm seeing a bunch of people from the West Coast now. So, Steve, your intuition is probably right. The West Coast people are just kind of yep. getting involved now. So, yeah. Um, Back in the airport, Paul, we probably had 30 or 40 sign up today from this morning, like 7 o'clock in the morning on from the East Coast people. And that's just uh, this today. So people are procrastinators. They do things last thing. Uh, yesterday and today was a, a big uh, push. Yep, and again, tomorrow morning we'll put out, we'll put the stream out in as many places as we can. Maybe people will discover us and uh, and feel motivated to come in and do it. Maybe I can show Craig Thomas's lecture. We're not going to have much time tomorrow, actually, but uh, maybe at the end of the day tomorrow I'll show Craig Thomas's lecture again about the allergy stuff, which I thought was really interesting. Um, I don't know if you guys. I thought you play Gary Gelb's uh, movie. I wish I could. <laughs> but, you know, we we don't have the rights to it. I wish we could though. That would be great. But um, so for those who don't know what Steve is talking about, there was a movie premiere for Gary Gelb's documentary. Um, you know, all about eye care and, and its importance in the healthcare system. And it was pretty good. It was a, you know, well done documentary. Um, so he's shopping it around on Netflix and Hulu and all these other services. So, yeah, we can't exactly show it again, unfortunately. Well, just so you know, Adam, I put in a break for tomorrow, um, an hour, just to make sure that we've got that time. And that's why I was asking about those question mark people. So at least we do have a break. Yeah. Okay. So I'll uh, I'll make sure I'll go double and triple check to see if anyone wants to. Uh, yeah, because I I see what you're talking about about the question marks. So, um, yeah. So I'll as soon as we're off here, I'll check it out and we'll we'll schedule everything and we'll be on our way. All right. So I guess well, unless you guys have anything else to add today, I think we'll just knock off here a little bit early and I'll keep patrolling and make sure that everyone's doing okay uh, at the conference. Are you Are you going to run the museum story again? Oh, you want me to? I mean, I can. Why not? Yeah, why not? I yeah, people, people would come on with looking for you, so you might as well. That's true, and in fact, somebody in the comments asked if they, we could keep watching the museum stuff and if they can see it again, so why not, right? I'll, I'll run it again, so okay. that was... We're going to ride that visit down like the Titanic. We things. are. I mean, who knew we'd, we were playing it so many times, but it was fun. I mean, I, I guess this was one of the last really fun things we got to do before the whole world just kind of fell apart, so... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yep. All right, so that's that's a good note to go out on. So otherwise, we'll see you guys tomorrow morning and uh, have fun at the rest of CUR tonight. So good night, everyone. All right, okay. good night, guys. Yeah. Bye, bye. bye. Pat, would so. you um, tell us how you came about this idea? What prompted you and Craig to start a collection? Well, you know, uh, like most collections, you start collecting things one at a time, and then. One day you wake up and you find uh, you've got a museum sitting in your home in closets, garages, and we found ourselves in that situation and then uh, decided that uh, we were just going to open up a contact lens museum. How long did it take you to curate the collection in here? A long time, and we, that's an ongoing endeavor. Um, you know, trying to do something of this magnitude while you're working full time and everything else, uh, got full curriculum and back there, it's, um, it's, it's been very busy, but as you can see, um, it's just such a joy. It just brings so many smiles to so many faces when you bring older practitioners through here <laughs> yeah, the, because the relic in. <laughs> yeah, it, it really it's so true Why you because, me? I mean, like a yeah that's right oh, we'll put you in the chair <laughs> there you go. that won't be creepy at all <laughs> no it won't be creepy at all 
but no, you're so right. It's just uh, so many memories then come back to all of us that were touched by contact lenses. You know, it's uh, when you think about how contact lenses have changed so many people's lives and changed their lives. All those keratoconus patients, irregular cornea patients. It's it's humbling, you know, to you know be a part of you know having this history. So we we felt that uh, you know. Those are younger patients. Where do you get your lenses? You're nine years nine old. Nine years old. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Probably one of the younger contact lenses. Where yeah, you know, they're in so many millions of people's lives have been changed so much with these. And when practitioners have anything lying around their basements or garages or the oh. back room of their practices, mm -hmm. would you be interested from in hearing from them? Yes, we'd be very interested. That's where we pick up a lot of these relics. Mm -hmm. um, every practitioner, literally everyone uh, out there, has one or two items that have been given to them by an elderly patient or uh, they took over a practice that you know, had been established back in the 30s or mm -hmm. 40s. And somewhere in their archives uh, are these treasures, you know, that they've not known what to do with them. They hold on to them because they don't take up a lot of space. But they don't know, where, they know they can't throw it out. Right, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. But they, they're looking for a place to send it. This is the place. <laughs> <laughs> this is the place to send it. So. There, it can be archived, uh, taken care of properly. Um, we've, Craig and I have spent, you know, hours and hours learning about curating um, an optical museum like this. It's, uh, there's a lot that goes into it. We had to then uh, apply for a, um, a nonprofit uh, organization, a 501c3 with the government, we uh, got that, so we're official. So not only are you accepting items to be displayed here, you're accepting financial contributions to support yeah, the museum. Yeah, very much so. This has been totally funded uh, through gifts and so on, and by Craig and myself. And oh, that's a, that's a good charity for next year. Absolutely. That is, it really is. It's a lovely charity for uh, individuals in the eye care profession that want to see, you know, the history of uh, contact lenses preserved. So uh, you can see here we uh, uh, encourage donations, and uh, so we uh, yeah, we love it. You know, when people can uh, when they win the lottery. You know, send us uh, some of that, and uh, so we have one. But it's, um, we get the, believe it or not, our biggest support from uh, patients. So they feel this incredible emotional, you know, tie to these lenses. Sure. Now this is uh, actually just part of the collection. Uh, uh, a lot of it still is in storage right now. Uh, we need a, a bigger facility when we open this up in July. We opened it up with the knowledge that uh, we've already outgrown it. Uh, it's a good that, problem to uh, have. Good problem to have. And so we're just going to keep raising you know, funds as best we can and uh, hope to move into a bigger uh, facility as time goes on. And then this is, like I said, part of the collection. The other collection I'm going to show you is the uh, collection of antique glasses, uh, oh. spectacle lenses, um, probably one of the finest in uh, North America right now. Um, and that's across the street at the school. Um, so um, it's, this has been just a passion for Craig and I, you know, this collecting. And, um, Fortunately, we have wives that understand uh, the insanity because uh, <laughs> that's what it is. It's truly, it's insane to be doing this. Uh, um, uh, but, you know, Craig and I have been blessed so much, like you have, like we all have, 
by the eye care industry. That, Very much so. Yeah, that it's just been a humbling experience to be a part of it. So this is our payback, or this is our legacy that we'll leave. You know, so. And it's a beautiful one. It's a start. It's, yeah, uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful start. And so we're real happy, very, very happy with it all. Excellent. So many, many years ago, as you can imagine, the, um, it's really myself and Craig Norman who kind of put this all together. The story begins over here. I'll sort of walk you through. This is kind of the evolution of contact lenses. The, uh, all of these lenses here are made of glass. And so these were the earliest uh, contact lenses in Germany and Zeiss. So they were the three making glass uh, scleral lenses at the time. When did Obra come in? Obrick came in in the uh, 1940s. How do you know that name? <laughs> I used to live with him. Uh, <laughs> oh my, my! I was just uh, reading a, a book uh, this morning. Uh, his uh, the textbook from 1945 on um, contact lenses. It's really one of the earliest. Yeah, and uh, that is. What a coincidence. Oh, yeah. So all are, of are these companies related? It's it's no, Muller Sohn no, and Muller Welt? No, they were different um, families. Okay. Yeah, they had no uh, no relation. And uh, so these uh, like I said, it's the largest collection of glass uh, contact lenses in the world. Hmm. So it's um, they're hard to find, very rare. Uh, wonderful to feel because they're incredibly heavy. Can can I touch one? Yeah. As a matter of fact, you can touch the one that is yours. Uh, <laughs> we wanted Craig and I wanted you to have this. This is a glass uh, really? scleral lens. Wow. And uh, it's all the contributions you've made to the industry, you deserve that. Oh, you are so <laughs> kind. Thank you. Yeah, it's, Look at this it's thing. kind of neat to have. You can see kind of how rough the optics were. Very rough. And, uh, but, you know, they got better with time. <laughs> That's a real early one. Would you like what, to see so, uh, This would have been probably early 1900s, wow. so between 1900 and 1910. But you could feel how smooth uh, yeah. the glass. The workmanship was, was wonderful. But um, yeah, it's uh, that's definitely one we wanted you to have. That's very nice. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. This would be a real challenge to apply and to remove. Yeah, it really, it really is because of the size. Um, these were about twenty. Two to 24 millimeters in diameter, so they were pretty big. And then I see that they're fenestrated as Some well. Some of them were, and that's kind of unique, the number of them that were fenestrated. Um, you can imagine drilling a hole in glass can be a little bit challenging. And, a lot of breakage. Uh, yeah. But uh, I'm always surprised when I'm going through the lenses, the number of them that have uh, actually been fenestrated. And that would have been a challenge as well, not only drilling the hole, but making sure that the edges are smooth enough. Because oh, yes. That would have been quite painful had you applied a yeah. fenestrated lens that wasn't smooth. But then you look at these Zeiss lenses, the optics are absolutely perfect, and they're incredibly thin. And I always wonder, how many of those broke in the eye? You know, it wouldn't take much trauma. That would have been to a shatter really big those. Problem. Yeah, but that was unique of the Zeiss lenses at the time. Um, they uh, they were incredibly thin. Do you know who made this one? The one that you gave me? Uh, that one, yes, I do. That one uh, was uh, from the uh, Mueller Weld Company. Wow. Yeah. Look at these. There. 
And then so those are the molds right those there? Those are the molds. So that and is brass. Let me, and let then me take you through how, let's say it's uh, 1920 and I'm going to fit you with a contact lens. It would all begin over here. Um, May I sit in the chair? Again? Yes, please. Uh, uh, you sit in the chair again. That's where I sit. <laughs> I get comfortable in here. <laughs> and, uh, now the molding process began by just simply mixing this compound. It's called moldite. moldite yeah. And we would mix it in one of these uh, containers and then uh, it would be placed into a syringe. And this mold then would be placed onto the eye and the moldite compound injected through here and then it would take a perfect mold of the anterior segment. So the molding compound would harden in about 90 seconds. So you had to be real efficient with your time. You had to load this, inject it, and uh, be pretty efficient. So you have to do that on a board exam, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> 1950s. Yes. Jeez. And. Uh, then uh, what happened next was when you had that beautiful mold, you would mix this next compound called cast stone. And that cast stone then uh, was just like a, um, a concrete, but incredibly fine powdery concrete. And then you would let it harden and uh, then you would have this beautiful impression of the eye. Now, back in the day, in the, before World War II, a second mold would have to be made of brass. And the reason for that is that when the lens was actually turned into a contact lens, it um, was made of glass, and the glass would just simply, the heat of the glass would destroy the, the moldite, so it had to be turned into a brass mold. Then it was taken over here, and this is probably the highlight of the museum and the fact that we have the only remaining glass contact lens making apparatus in the world. This really? is it. This is the only one left. Does it work if it you works. wanted to create a lens? Oh, you yeah. Could? Yeah, we've had it fired up, and you can see we've destroyed part of the. Uh, table from the firing <laughs> it up and uh, uh, it makes a lot of pops and noises and now there was a, this vice was on the stand we don't know what its function was but uh, it must have had some function the problem with this instrument is that nowhere can we find anything written on how to manufacture the contact lens or how they were manufactured. Wow. So we're having to piece it together little by little. Now, the... Um, if oh, I push this, is something going to happen? Yeah, push oh, it. Push it? Yeah, push both of them. Uh, this one. Oh and my god! it still works. That's the amazing thing. We fired up these motors, and um, uh, they were still working. Uh, this is incredible. So, uh, they, uh, now, the way it worked was you attach the mold, the brass mold of the shape of the eye here. Top two, I think. Perfect. Now, that bottom, yeah, no, you got it. You got them both. Good. <laughs> And what would happen is you uh, had natural gas and oxygen that were mixed together. Those were, um, it wasn't propane. Propane hadn't been invented yet, so they actually used natural gas wow. back in that day. And so the gases were then mixed up here to the appropriate concentration, and these valves controlled the amount of oxygen versus the uh, amount of natural gas. It looks like it's a very non-precise process. Exactly, exactly, very non-precise. Then they had these two by two wafers of glass 
uh, that were set right here. And then this was just simply brought around once the glass had been molten and this just brought down and an impression made of the uh, contact lens. And that's the mold right there. And that's the mold. So you would of swap the, uh, that out depending upon the yeah. patient you're creating this for. And then in this little container, when I got the instrument, uh, it was just filled up to about here with asbestos. Oh, excellent. So uh, that uh, made it all complete. Uh, so then you would bring it back here, drop this mold, and because it was flaming hot from uh, being in contact with the glass, and it would fall into the asbestos where it would be cooled. And now with these little tools here, the residual glass would be broken away and then you saw over here how the edges were rounded and then the power placed on the front of the lens with, uh, with this. Now, the only thing we can think of here is that this was actually operated by hand the, to oscillate the uh, application of the power on the front side of the lens. That's all we can actually kind of surmise. We don't know how else it was driven. And, uh, but everything came with the unit. It was intact. And it's actually from, of all places, Perth, Australia. Don Ezekiel. Yeah, Don Ezekiel. And, and if anybody would have something like this, it would be him. It would be him. And uh, you'll see as you go through the museum, Many of the pieces are from Don's collection, and that was probably the largest in the world. And he gave it all to us, so we're really super fortunate to have that. And he got his basement back. I'm sorry? He got his basement back. Yes, <laughs> he had his garage. He had, uh, had it in his laboratory. But when he sold the laboratory, it went moved into his garage. So he was kind of uh, grateful, but again, sad to see it all go away. And uh, but to have the only one remaining. Uh, now this is for this. <laughs> <laughs> A mechanical tool that nothing yeah. to do with creating the contact no, lens. No, no, just strictly for changing out the gas. If you wanted to, is there gas in there? Could no. you make one? No, we uh, we keep the uh, the live ones in my garage at home, uh, <laughs> but these are uh, actually empty. And so you have uh, filled ones if you wanted oh, to. Yes. I mean, I don't know that oh, I put asbestos there, sure. but you could create oh, yeah, a glass yeah. lens? We're the only ones in the world that can make glass contact lenses if you need one. Have you tried it? Oh yeah, yeah, we've tried it and it's incredible. Just, there's a lot of experimentation getting the temperature right, getting the just the exact amount of uh, natural gas and the exact amount of oxygen but you could see that it uh, would be very easy to, uh, to accomplish. Now, when PMMA came along, things changed rather dramatically because now it was possible to just simply use the mold itself rather than turning it into a brass mold. And what was used at that time then were these PMMA wafers. That's actual PMMA? Yeah. I thought now, it was cardboard. No, it's, it's it has this protective coating on it, and you just peel this away, and then there's this beautiful piece of acrylic plastic. Wow. For scleral lenses. That's really cool. Very cool. And now, you know, it didn't take any temperature at all to melt that. You know, you, that was not like melting glass. So I think we may even have one here that might be, yeah, there we go. Oh, so that's so, it. That's it. So dare it's I ask the question, strip. when you were in school, did you ever see anything like this? 
Yes, well, with, with the way it worked in school, <laughs> our, our contact lens course was one person with keratoconus that was handed down from class to class. <laughs> and we had a, it was at Columbia University, and we had Isidore Finkelstein was the professor, a very bright guy, but that was it. And he had this one guy, and every time they had to do something to wash the lens or something, there was no sink. Fink, the Fink used to walk in to the bathroom and wash it and try it on. And this guy never succeeded, but he kept coming back from class to class. Oh. And that was the contact lens course in the 50s. Oh, my gosh. That's so interesting you mentioned that name. I read his name for the first time last night, uh, Fickelstein yeah. from Columbia University. And the reason I came across it, I was uh, doing a story, as I'll show you down here, on Dennis England, who helped invent the first corneal contact lens. But uh, I came across an article written by Hank Knoll from Bosch and Law on uh, this gentleman from, uh, from Columbia University. And it was the first time I had seen his name. And so it was really yeah, so kind that, that was the kind of neat. That was the contact lens course. Oh, my yeah. period. <laughs> End of story. Cool. And then whatever you learn happened afterwards. Yeah. It happened afterwards. But the academy required... In order to become a diplomate, you had to be able to fit a, a scleral lens and oh. using moldite. Yeah. And oh. what happened, yeah, as basically we smuggled in some anesthetic because there's no way you can put that <laughs> shit in your eye. Yeah, no kidding. And say, stay still now. Because you so, can imagine if the patient's eye was moving right. during the molding process, you know, you have a pretty bad mold. Yeah, I mean, so... <laughs> What year did you earn your uh, your diploma? In 1965, I think. And so that was being required at that yeah, time? Yeah, it was a very large class. Uh, the, the word was, you better get it now because it's going to get much tougher to do. But that particular part was separating the men from the boys because you had to learn not only to do it, but then to adjust it. And, yeah. uh, and I was always very unhandy. I figured I'd cut my hand off with the burrs yeah. that, that they used. Um, oh my! So, uh, Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so we yeah. have glass lenses. Glass lenses, and yeah. then uh, back we. Oh boy! Irv Borish and I was suffered. Oh <laughs> my! <laughs> so here we go to PMMA sclerals. PMMA sclerals, and you know it was uh, very uh, plastic. It was very slow to get involved into the, evolve into the contact lens industry. It was only after World War II that plastic really did replace glass. Yeah, as it was from the World War II. Huh. Yeah. Plastic star first started on airplanes. Mm -hmm. I see up there Ernst Abbey. Yeah, Ernst Abbey. Does that have anything to do with the Abbey value? Yep, it sure does. <laughs> that is it right there. He was the mathematician, uh, the brains behind the Carl Zeiss Corporation, and um, he was a brilliant mathematician. He developed this machine right here. This um, was it's like a, an early lensometer. It it looks like an early lensometer, but it's called a refractometer. And what it did is just measure the index of refraction of huh. the glass. Huh. And because when they were manufacturing glass at the time, they could never control the index of refraction of it. Uh, so each piece had a different index. And so what they had to do is read the index of refraction and then they knew what radius to put on the front to create the power. There was a lot of math involved. There back was then. a ton of math involved back in those days, wow. and uh, but he was the one who really kind of uh, was at the forefront of that. Now I see back here there are corneal lenses as well as scleral lenses. Yeah, it's just like um, um, CDs and. Uh, VHSs. You know, there's that time uh, in space where the two cross over, mm -hmm. and um, this was uh, really it. In the 1950s, uh, 
it was unsure which of the two modalities was going to really take over. Was it going to stay scleral or was it going to go corneal? And so you see a number of these fun sets that have actually both in them. Now here's the uh, Theo Obrick sets uh, out of New York. Uh, the one in the back was the original Theo Obrick uh, scleral lens set. And then the one in the front uh, is one of the um, later uh, sets. I like these glasses down here. The world of contact lenses. That is that really is cool. Bizarre. So um, WJ made them. Well, Newton Wesley uh, was the man responsible for kind of bringing contact lenses into the mainstream. Uh, so in the, the early 1960s, he marketed everything. Uh, to get contact lenses out to the masses. God bless him. Yep, and uh, he appeared on the Steve Allen show, <laughs> and he was just this incredible kind of showman, but yet incredibly ethical. And, um, I yeah, never, he was keratoconic. Yeah, that's correct. Do you have any stories? Well, yeah, he and he had a partner, George Jessen, mm -hmm. yeah. and George was a, a glad hander type of salesperson, and Newton was the front front guy with the research type of thing. Right. And uh, they they did everything, and they not only market glasses, but I remember they used to hand out ties. Oh, I've got one. Christmas. Oh, it says contact yeah, lenses yeah. on it. Yes, I'm so, it's so funny you should make that you're the only one I've ever known right there uh, oh, from the uh, Newton oh, Wesley yeah. Company. And, uh, but he, he was just this incredible marketer. Yes. And it was just so cool what he was able to do. That's good. Somebody needs to get the word out. Well, you know, and a uh, little known fact, it was Newton Wesley who founded Pacific University College of Optometry. Is that right? I didn't yeah, know that. Yes. He, uh, it's a rather kind of long and sometimes sad story because um, he founded it uh, but then had to give it up mm -hmm. and sell it uh, because of uh, World War II and the internment camp. So his two sons and his wife ended up in a, an internment camp uh, throughout uh, the course of World War II. And uh, it was here in Portland where the internment camp was. And um, uh, Roy Wesley, his son, is still alive. And um, he is on our board of directors of the museum because he's this incredible historian of uh, that era uh, of the internment camps and all the kind of injustices done uh, back then. So kind of a fun story to just uh, hear him talk about. Oh, and, I bet. Um, about his life growing up as a child in, in the camp. Right. So... And then um, over here, um, we have a couple other items. Uh, one is the Micon. This was the first commercially available contact lens solution that went into the back of a scleral contact lens. What is Micon? And, um, you know, it, it's, I'm not sure, but I think it's a sodium bicarbonate. Uh, uh, system. What does it say there? I looked oh, it up. Oh, two percent sodium. Go. You were yeah, right. I was. Sodium bicarbonate solution. So where did the name Micon come uh, from? No, that I don't know. It was manufactured by House of Vision in Chicago. House of Vision. <laughs> House of Vision. Yes. It sounds like a sketchy place. It does. It, it, uh, like a haunted place. <laughs> Now, uh, next to it here is another one of those Wesley Jessen things. This was a research lens, um, and uh, patients were losing their lenses um, pretty easily when they switched to corneal. So what they did is they impregnated the contact lens with little uh, graphite particles 
uh, and then you would just pick it up with a magnet or find it. Are you it. kidding me? Yeah, so it was a magnetic. A magnetic contact, contact lens. Contact lens, and that's what it's actually stuck to is the magnet right there. Oh my gosh. Did that affect vision by having no, that into the no, plastic? No, it, it's sort of like putting fenestrations in the lens. They never really affected acuity very much, and uh, just a, a clever idea. So, but they never marketed it or anything, but it's just kind of cool to have a one of their... A magnetic lens. Wow. Some magnetic. patients may like to have that option available to oh, them. Oh, gosh, I thought it was so clever, you know. But it just shows you, you know, you've got a problem, uh, you know, this is how we're going to fix it. Who was the optician that brought the, I forgot his name, that brought, made the corneal lens popular? Was, oh, Kevin Tui? Tui, yeah. Yeah. Tui lens. Kevin Tui. That was the first one. We've got some of his early uh, things over here as we evolve from. It took lids of steel to adapt to those. That's for <laughs> sure. Uh, the, then we went from the sclerals into the. Uh, oh, we have a, a Tui contact lens fitting record back there. Yes. Yes, now that's kind of interesting. That's Robert, uh, Robert uh, Ryan. Now, is that I a HIPAA violation, Pat? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a definite <laughs> HIPAA violation. Now, he was a famous actor oh, sure. uh, back in the 50s. And, um, and uh, another famous person that was Ronald Reagan. Ronald mm -hmm. Reagan. Any yep. more contact lenses? More contact lenses. So we have some pretty interesting things. Oh, so here's the little scandal, I guess, with Dennis England. His, he yes. tried to, he applied for the first U.S. patent. In 1945, I've got the original patent. Uh, Craig, um, I've got a Xerox copy, but Craig has uh, contacted the patent office, and we're going to see if we can get the original patent, uh, that patent application. And Kevin um, Tui preceded him. Yeah. Uh, oh, no, 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 he sorry. Followed, okay. uh, he followed him by uh, two years, one month. Um, was uh, two years later, Kevin Tui took out his patent, or applied for his patent. That was uh, in the 50s, I think. 50, yeah, yeah, 1950. And then Bill Feinblum also kind of well with scleral lenses. Yeah, and there's Bill's uh, diagnostic <laughs> set. Yeah, You'll notice was. those green lenses there, and uh, apparently someone told me that uh, those were actually developed for treatment of an astigmatism. Huh. No. Did it work? Uh, that I have no <laughs> idea. No. Uh, yeah, I, would, I didn't know why it would work. Again, I wish uh, Bill was still alive. And, uh, you know, there's a, a, there's a Yiddish questions. expression, it worked like a toitan bankus, like a, a leech on a dead person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so did you know Feinblum? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. We well, used to, he used to yeah, work together. He was the man. Yeah. He was, yeah. uh, Bill, uh, what happened towards the end, he, uh, he, he couldn't handle the contact lenses, so he referred to us. Hmm. But he was a tremendous promoter, and his main specialty was low vision. Yeah. Right. And he was able to get his, his, his face on, on Life magazine, yes. and he ended up having a tremendous practice on Park Ed. And again, the low vision didn't work. But <laughs> it was... It was, but people kept coming I've got in. got that Life magazine with that, his story, <laughs> the Feinblum story. It's yeah, actually yeah. one of the really earliest uh, he, he publications. Yeah. He was, well, actually, there's <laughs> a direct link with, between Bill promoting and me. <laughs> Afterwards, oh, so, so I shouldn't I shouldn't knock them. This machine, the Yeah, it's the only one I've ever seen. It um, you know, again another WJ product uh, from the 1960s, and you turn those dials, and it would bring you would build your contact lens. Each one of those dials uh, put on a different radius of curvature. Wow. So you design both the anterior and posterior surface of the lens with that little, they call it computer, but it's just roller um, device. And um, it, a very, very cool thing. But Did you ever um, use one? No, never used one. Uh, it's the only one I've ever seen. And, uh, 
Those tinted lenses are also very interesting. Yeah, those are from change England. Your, yeah. Change your eye color. Yeah, <laughs> Caprice PMMA we, we lenses. Had, what the, oh, God. Somebody needed his eye color changed. Yeah. I forgot his name already. Well, I recognize something George, down George there. Oh, the actor, yeah, so he came Siegel. in, you know, he, was, he, he was young and he had to play an Arab, he had blue eyes, so he had to play an Arab in some sort of film he was in, so Columbia Pictures sent him in, he, he was in New York in those days, so we had to give him one of those lenses, so I gave him the lenses and I gave him a bottle of anesthetic, we <laughs> <laughs> shooting, because he, yes. he suffered with them, they were thick and they were terrible, oh, so he had to have dark eyes for the shoot. So. Did you see the movie? Afterward? Uh, no. No. Maybe it didn't even come out. I don't know. <laughs> yes, it could be. <laughs> Who knows, many, yeah, many maybe don't it. make it. I see a bottle of Playa Gel down there. I haven't yes. heard of oh it in a long yes. time. Yes. Uh, Playa Gel and, and the ones behind it, the yellow ones, are called LC65. Um, they were uh, big items back in the 60s for PMMA. And what happened in the 50s and low 60s, early 60s? These lenses were very thick, and somebody came up with the idea of what if we fenestrate them? And they put four little holes in, and they called it the vent air contact lens. Yeah. So vent air, and then became, became a marketer for the, for the thing. They did a tremendous amount of advertising, and they ended up with offices all over the country. Wow. They were, vent air was one of them. There was one other company from Chicago. But also yeah, um, there was a Spiro vent. Spiro vent had and, one. Uh, you just happen to have some of it right here. <laughs> yes, yes. Some of the, here's an original Tui uh, brochure. And uh, let's see, I don't know if I have my vent there out there. See, no, I then, guess I after don't. After that, the lenses were so thick that the people were terribly uncomfortable, and that's when I went into practice. Mm. And Ted, my partner, worked for Ventair down the street. Oh boy! And he sent people over to yeah. me, and then we came up with the bright idea. Says, "Hey, if they're so uncomfortable with thick, why don't we make a thinner lens?" Oh boy! So we formed a company called Micro Thin Contact Lenses, and we got one Orthodox Jew. To work in Brooklyn in a lab, uh -huh. and he was the micro thin maven. He oh, was the one that that did it, and we had a thinner lens. And because we had a thinner lens, we were able to succeed where my, where Ventair failed. So we built up a very large PMMA practice in those years. How did Ventair feel about Ted? They didn't know <laughs> he worked for us, <laughs> and then after that. After that. <laughs> He left there because the practice got big enough that right. we were able to. Now, to over observe. on in this cabinet is the uh, early evolution of soft lenses. Mm -hmm. uh, soft lenses were developed by that gentleman there, Otto Wichterly in Prague, Czechoslovakia. He started working on uh, the material in the early 1960s. He actually started producing contact lenses in 1966, and those were the first soft lenses. They were called SPOFA, S-P-O-F-A, SPOFA lenses. Right there, right in front of you, is the first soft contact lens brochure ever <laughs> produced. That was in 1965. Um, and... Um, these uh, lenses here uh, really do represent the first team out for first soft contact lenses. I've got one hydrated there. The rest are stored dry. Wow. Um, the um, very kind of neat to have those as part of the collection. These were the original Spofa cases from 1966. And um, about the same time, a uh, company in upstate New York and Toronto uh, started this uh, Bionite company, you know, which was the Griffin Lens. Well, I've never um, heard of that. Yeah, that um, was the um, uh, high water content lens. It had about 55% uh, water, but you see it um, goes back to that same time frame as the Otto Wichterly uh, lenses. 
Oh, and there it says they were purchased by AO. Yep. And, and then and became Softcon. Yep, and then became Softcon, exactly. And, and then BB and L marketed them very differently. They had uh, salespeople, and the first sales manager insisted that all their salespeople come in with dark suits. Uh -huh. So they were very, very formal, Very unique. Very, yeah. very <laughs> business-like <laughs> yeah. with, uh, with their Bausch and Lomb lens. Oh, and now we're into the salt tablets and heat units. Salt tablets and then heat units. Uh, oh, yeah, this the is the, uh, the scepter unit. range of the scepter units. The first one you see right here was the original Bosch and Lohm one, uh, 1971. The FDA had no idea on how to disinfect these soft contact lenses, so this is what Bosch and Lohm came up with. If um, you look kind of closely, that heater unit there was uh, actually a baby bottle warmer. <laughs> uh, they purchased them from uh, Gerber Baby Food Company and, and then modified the top lid to hold a contact lens case. So you filled that up. You remember this is still water oh, that you put in there and, uh, and uh, push a button. And actually, it was a marvelous way to sterilize lenses because yeah, after that, people, the cold sterilization came in, but unfortunately, they put thimerosal mm -hmm. into the solution. And that and was this one right here. This was the first. And the red eyes started. The red eyes started uh, big time. So you'll love these names here, Paul. The uh, normal, flexol, and oh, preflex. Yeah, that will resonate very, very with very you. Nice. Those are just so cool. Alcon Swirl the, Clean. Uh, yes. That sounds like toilet clean. <laughs> well, it does sound like <laughs> Sorry, Alcon. The acceptor unit was something that the patients had individually. However, the office had very large units. Right. So you can right down here. So there they are. Oh. I remember and, and those that, glass vials. Cut and my that fingers particular on them. one ended up with a short circuit over a weekend, and our office burned down. Oh no! <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> so yeah. Got to turn it off before they they, uh, they lost so many an office fire. with that unit. Wow. And that was, uh, that was when you met me at the door. And said, Dad, you can sleep late tomorrow. And I came back from the winter. You know, this was, um, uh, you'll notice that a lot of different cleaning systems were developed because at the time, we had to make soft lenses last a year. Right. Uh, they were replaced on a yearly basis, so a lot of heroic uh, things were developed to try to well, extend the length of time. The, uh, matter of fact, we had one, one scheme. We met the developer, a woman who developed the contraceptive sponge. You remember this Seinfeld sponge worthy? Right. It was a contraceptive sponge. I remember that. And it was FDA approved, and it had the ability that if you would rub a contact lens on it, you could clean it. And we say, this is what we're going to do. So how did somebody come up with that concept that this is a contraceptive sponge, I'm going to put my contact lens on there? I mean, where did that come from? Say what? <laughs> I mean, who would think of that? So, yeah. <laughs> and the chemicals, because it was a spermicide, yeah. right? So, but, I mean, but, wonder what the chemicals yeah, would so, do to so the lens. We, we started dealing with this crazy woman uh, who, who had some company in, in Europe and Germany, and it cost us at least six figures by the time we figured out it's not going to work, and then she conned us. <laughs> and so that, another scheme Okay, so I'm glad to hear that you that talk was... talk about waste, my West Indian land, that was even worse. But So that actually, nobody ever really did that, so she no, no, took we, you we for just, a ride. Okay, I'm yeah, glad to absolutely, hear that. Absolutely. I mean, not that you were taken for a no, ride, no, I'm not I, glad, I, but I, that nobody I was cleaning their lenses on a contraceptive That was only, that was only, yeah. <laughs> that was only one of the many rides. <laughs> I see CSI lenses back there, and yes. now I, what else did I see? Um, yeah. Lens Plus. Now we're getting into things that I remember. Yeah. Those terrible vials that you cut your hand on. Yeah. Yep. And do you have a, there it is. The crimper. The, yeah, the crimper. crimper. I remember <laughs> those things. And those oh, very yes. light, uh, the caps. Caps. Uh, they, they were, were light and then you put it on and then yeah. when you try to pull it off. Yep. There goes your finger. Yep. And uh, 
So it, it's just so much fun. Then lenses, I never made it. Uh, the hmm. 3M lens uh, called the Advent lens. Uh, lasted in the marketplace just a few months, and it was a pure fluorocarbon contact lens. Uh, very oxygen permeable. They teamed up with Allergan to promote that lens, but it never made it. Uh, the Epicon uh, was another one that never quite made it in the marketplace. And then the Nike Max site down I remember here. That. Do you have any Still Soft in there? Still Soft is right here. Yeah. Yep. Another one that worked beautifully. 100% oxygen permeable, but yeah. way too thick. So yeah. you, it was terribly and uncomfortable. And so hard to remove, yes. too. It was a rubbery yeah. thing. It was Dow, Dow Corning owned it. Yep, and Dow gave Corning, it. way to go. Man, this has got to be weird for you. Know, <laughs> yeah. All these things coming back. And <laughs> yep. just, uh, you, you wonder where all that garbage is being stored. You know, I, I always ask myself, where well, is Well, are you kidding? Stored? I mean, I, I've got these Gilbert and Sullivan operettas up here. That, <laughs> oh, you know, my. You know, oh. So, that's yeah, but I can't remember what happened to them yesterday. Yeah, me either. Me either. That's uh, the truth. Oh, you've got a DMV in there. Yeah, we do, and and it looks like you have a designer case. Yeah, we do. There was a short period where Revlon bought out one of these companies. I, I uh, Hydrocurve. Bought uh, out Hydrocurve. Or Barnes Hyde. They got themselves a really serious PR firm in New York. And they sent me around the country to talk about uh, their their particular product. They were interested in uh, in, in tinted lenses in those days and changing eye color. And uh, but they they got me on morning shows all over the place by using a great PR firm. And that's when you did Phil Donahue. Yeah, you know, Phil Donahue came through that as well. Oh, these you'll remember. Now these were called medical alert bracelets, and uh, and they were developed for PMMA lens wearers who had been involved in auto accidents and maybe in a coma, because what was happening is people were wearing PMMA contact lenses. They'd be in a two-week coma. They'd finally look at their eyes and find a huge ulcer sitting there. So uh, these medical alert bracelets uh, made everyone aware of the fact that they were wearing contact lenses. And then uh, these old Shiatz tonometers, you'll remember those. Uh, oh, yes. Both you and I were yes. trained on those back sure. in the day. And, wow. Um, really beautiful instruments. and. Um, Obviously replaced by applanation tonometry, and uh, wow. so you know what you need. Oh, you do have it over there. I see. Uh, you need. A, I was looking at this uh, trial lens that you need oh, a yeah. lens cabinet. Oh yes. I have a friend uh, at one of the practices where I worked, and she had one of those old. It was a big piece of furniture oh, with the lens. It was beautiful. Oh, I wanted oh, it. Oh no, I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Those are, you know, they sell for a lot of money now, as yeah. you can imagine, because they are just beautiful. And uh, read this uh, Barbie doll. I thing. saw that. Ooh. Does it? Why do you? Why does it say "Looking for Ken"? Uh, yeah, I, I just put that in there. <laughs> it's a little sexist, <laughs> yeah, Patrick. Yeah, a little, little bit, but. Uh, uh, oh, wait, on loan from the Craig Norman Barbie doll collection? <laughs> yeah. That's totally awesome. Uh, yeah. We need to find out what other Barbie dolls Craig yeah. has in his collection. Yeah, yeah we, we really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got Eclipse glasses in yeah, there. Yeah, you know, it's part of our history. Um, 19, or 2017. <coughs> that, was, um, that was really interesting that we had done a story about how to protect your eyes during an eclipse. That's and there cool. were a lot, there was so much interest drawn during that very short window of time of people talking about that yeah. and, and vision and blindness and looking at oh. the sun. So it was a great, a great news hook yeah, and great PR sure for all of eye care. It was, it was a, um, a wonderful opportunity for eye care to uh, tell the story. 
And then we have a collection of eye cups mm -hmm. there, and this was kind of the original treatment for blepharitis. And I don't know why it went out of vogue because it's still perhaps one of the better treatments for cleaning the lids and lashes. And very popular in the 30s and 40s. As you can see, a lot of different styles came out. And well, maybe it will come back into vogue because neti pots are coming back into yeah, vogue. Yeah, you Similar know. concept. Yep, yep, exactly. I mean, that looks like patent medicine, though. What is that, McElroy's? Lotion? What is that? Some of these were mixtures that you would put into the eye cup, and uh, not sure what some of these uh, actually had within them, but you'll see in the forefront the uh, bicarbonate of soda uh, tablets. That's what was usually used. Baking soda? Um, yeah, yeah. Hmm. And uh, huh. this is really cool. And I no. see some uh, instrumentation up there, no, too. It starts over Placido here. Discs. Uh, these are all from the early 1900s. These are all keratometers, ophthalmometers. They look like satellite dishes of today. Oh, yes. they there were do. still some in my, in my school. Yeah. yeah. Those, Just those, like that. In, yeah, the uh, where we took yeah. position. Yeah. How to get the axis on? Yep, and they they rotate, and I swear that they could still be used today. You know, they're uh, the electronics would just have to be redone, but uh, other than that, um, they're uh, fully uh, functional. Yeah, there's the old slit lamps too. Yeah, the old slit lamps and. Um, you know, you really realize that very little has changed in, in the optics of eye care. Um, optics are just such a fundamental thing. So this is circa unknown for this clock, and I'm guessing 60s. Wow. Yeah, you know, some of this stuff I'm still trying to track down, you know. Um, I need to get out to Bosch and Lohm. So much of the history of optics in of this course. country originated there, and um, I've um, been in contact with their curator there, and a lovely person, lovely woman. American and, Optical still do. Uh, you know, that's the other one. American Optical in Massachusetts are they still around? That I am not sure of. And uh, if they're still around, AO was a big, big company. And um, then uh, back here, we have uh, um, some interesting things. One, this is our uh, uh, little humble um, uh, library. What we're trying to do is uh, also get all of the books ever written on contact lenses and um, any articles, um, brochures, anything related to contact lenses, uh, we're trying to archive and, and save as well. Does the AOA library have? You know, I'm surprised the AOA does not have a very um, complete collection. Uh, they're, um, uh, I've always been kind of a little taken back by the fact that they haven't taken their kind of the history of optometry a bit more serious. In, and in um, Indiana, also, they have the, the, history, the historical society. Oh, yeah. They should have. Yes, and uh, so we need to get involved with all of those folks. Now this, uh, here's a company you'll remember, um, uh, Milton Roy uh, company. Here's a, it's an American Optical, and uh, this was the original um, inventory system for fitting contact lenses. <laughs> And uh, they came in two diameters, 8.2 and 8.7 diameter lenses, all PMMA. 
and uh, yeah, then uh, but still a fairly complete set. So yeah, not many mother, of those. Your mother wore them. Really? She wore them for a lot of years. Hmm. And then, uh, of course, this is a bathroom, but of course we had to deck it out with all of this antique uh, <laughs> stuff. And uh, so this is is really quite fun, and um, so really anything historical related to eye care, we uh, we jump on uh, Craig and I. This is uh, something you might remember too: the old uh, Wesley Jesson uh, photo periscope, oh, yeah. PEK is what it was called. And uh, again, that was uh, another WJ product. And these are the projectors I used for many, many years. I know. <laughs> I know. Sure. See, the thing is, is that back in those days, that equipment never wore out. No. It, it's like these old, uh, all these old greens refractors. Yes. Um, you know, they still are 100% functional today. Uh, the the workmanship that went into the, all of these instruments was just unbelievable. And then the other thing that was always amazing to me is how heavy all of this stuff, because it was all made with cast iron, uh, especially this chair. Yep. Uh, this is pure <laughs> cast iron and um, from the 1950s. And an old BNL keratometer. Who do you think that? Do you think he could still work it? Uh, I bet you he <laughs> could. <laughs> it would this, come this, back to you. Yeah. This is a slip lamp. It's not. Yeah. It's, it's not a just the. Um, and there's the Burton lamp. Yeah, the used Burton to put lamp. With black light. Yep. People used to use this one. This one I light. thought was very unique. It was on the. Uh, mobile stand and uh, you would oh, wheel it around so this is the Foropter? Look at how tiny it is. Yeah, that was one of the real early oh, Foropters. Really now here's one of the original Foropters, the Zang Foropters, and what you did here is you use your loose lenses mm. and you would put them in here and then your uh, auxiliary lenses, the uh, prism, would full move into position, Maddox rods, all of these things. So this was the earliest of them. And then uh, they evolved into that one there. Wow. This so, hard. this had a joystick already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is a newer, yeah. newer model. That's a, that's a newer 1950 um, Zeiss. <laughs> newer. So you have newer. As a matter of fact, most of the time I didn't use one. Mm -hmm. I remember yes. when I was in the uh, in the 60s, I joined the. Uh, they put me on the committee, the contact lens committee. There were very few people limited to practice, so even though I was very young. They put me on there, and basically there was a problem because opticians in those days were the were the leaders in contact lens fit, fitting, you know, and delivery. But the optometrist said, "No, no, no. They they didn't like that idea." I said, "Well, you know, what one thing you could do is make it the state of the art that everyone has to have a slit lamp examination when they have when they wear contact lenses." Then the AOA in their wisdom says we can't do that because some of our, m many of our members don't have a slit lamp and yeah. it will estrange them. Yeah. So not only didn't they have sinks in their exam rooms to wash their hands, they didn't have a slit lamp to examine their eyes. <laughs> but people survived. Yeah, they needed somehow. <laughs> Goes back. Hey, hi. hi. How are you? Hi. See you tomorrow. You betcha. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. I love it. These. So is this yours or is this the school's? No, this is mine. Mine and Craig's. Wow. Completely. And, uh, now the story here, 
begins actually in all of all places, China. Uh, China was the first uh, country to produce uh, spectacle lenses. And these are some of those early spectacles. Uh, many of them are made of tortoise shell, and um, some made of brass. Uh, they found their way to Europe, and they think through the uh, adventures of Marco Polo that he actually then kind of brought back the concept. So they were introduced in the late. Um, uh, 1200s. So Marco uh, Polo brought the concept of eyeglasses, spectacles, in addition to mm -hmm. spaghetti. To spaghetti, there <laughs> you go. <laughs> and both have had a big impact. <laughs> and then um, here are some of the earliest glasses made uh, in this country in the early 1700s. These were made by blacksmiths at the time. And so they're made of iron, but they were shaped, and uh, then uh, uh, this, these are all from the mid-1700s. So what, these... what are wig eyeglasses? Wig eyeglasses had these little extenders on them. Uh, you'll notice the little bars, the oh, second bar. to stick in the wig, to, to stay on. To stick in the wig. Uh, Interesting. So they were just referred to as wig glasses. And uh, then uh, in the late 1700s uh, were these models that uh, were available. So we're moving away from the entire round shape. We've got uh, some rectangular shape. Yep, oval. we sure do. Interesting. So even then we're getting into different lens shapes. Yep. But still, the jewelers didn't get involved. And you can tell as soon as the jewelers got involved because the frames got incredibly elaborate. They're rimless. Yeah, Is that they rimless? were rimless, but wow. they, were, they were glass. They were all glass. Plastic hadn't come about until the 1920s. Mm. So, very, very slow on the uptake. Oh, and there's. Franklin's bifocals. Yeah, that's an original 1700 uh, Franklin bifocal. Where did you find that? Uh, again, been collecting my entire life. And, um, that's incredible. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. The only thing that I miss about these glasses, and same thing with the context, you just wish they could talk. Oh, and of course. just tell us your history and tell us where you've been. Uh, it would be just so. Absolutely fascinating. And then what happened oh, then? Uh, Pinchnez and then the Oxford frames, uh, very similar. Uh, the Oxford frame used a little spring to hold the, uh, the glasses on the eyes. And then it was in the 1920s that plastic first got introduced. Tortoise. And Horn tortoise rim. and beautiful, beautiful. You know, you look at some of these from the 20s and you go, I would wear those. Uh -huh. I mean, those are very cool. I mean, they're just incredibly cool glasses. Wow. And then we have the 30s. And uh, then these were glasses that were called inventory glasses made by American Optical. The doctor would um, buy them in these uh, boxes like this, and then he would put, he or she would put them together. The frames are right there. And you can see the different bridge sizes. Mm -hmm. And then the bows that went around the ear were what are called gold-filled um, material. Um, what they were... More expensive. Um, yeah, and you could see these uh, are all gold-filled as well. And, um, and you don't so, have these cases locked? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to edit that part. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> when, did, when, did male, when did male female glasses start? Hmm. You know, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. You know, the um, it uh, that's a good question. 
because they were the same um, for many, many years. These are just old ads and uh, then um, a fake spectacle lenses, you remember those. Uh, you know, Remember you're... the old a fake spectacle lenses? Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, how thick, heavy, and... People just couldn't, uh, you know, couldn't get around. Oh. So here are some of the old optics books 